9. Patriotism is not enough, but neither is anything else. Science is not enough. Religion is not enough. Art is not enough. Politics and economics are not enough, nor is love, nor is duty, nor is action, however disinterested, nor, however sublime, is contemplation. Nothing short of everything will really do. Attention, shouted a faraway bird. Will looked at his watch. Five to twelve. He closed his notes on what's what, and picking up the bamboo alpenstock, which had once belonged to Dugald MacPhail, he set out to keep his appointment with Vijaya and Dr. Robert. By the short cut, the main building of the experimental station was less than a quarter of a mile from Dr. Robert's bungalow, but the day was oppressively hot, and there were two flights of steps to be negotiated. For a convalescent with his right leg in a splint, it was a considerable journey. Slowly, painfully, Will made his way along the winding path and up the steps. At the top of the second flight, he halted to take breath and mop his forehead. Then, keeping close to the wall, where there was still a narrow strip of shade, he moved on towards a signboard marked Laboratory. The door beneath the board was ajar. He pushed it open and found himself on the threshold of a long, high-ceilinged room. There were the usual sinks and work tables, the usual glass-fronted cabinets full of bottles and equipment, the usual smells of chemicals and caged mice. For the first moment, Will was under the impression that the room was untenanted, but no, almost hidden from view by a bookcase that projected at right angles from the wall, young Murugan was seated at a table intently reading. As quietly as he could, for it was always amusing to take people by surprise, Will advanced into the room. The whirring of an electric fan covered the sound of his approach, and it was not until he was within a few feet of the bookcase that Murugan became aware of his presence. The boy started guiltily, shoved his book with panic haste into a leather briefcase, and reached for another, smaller volume that lay open on the table beside the briefcase, drew it within reading range. Only then did he turn to face the intruder. Will gave him a reassuring smile. It's only me. The look of angry defiance gave place on the boy's face to one of relief. I thought it was, he broke off, leaving the sentence unfinished. You thought it was someone who would bore you out for not doing what you're supposed to do, is that it? Murugan grinned and nodded his curly head. Where's everyone else? Will asked. They're out in the fields, pruning or pollinating or something. His tone was contemptuous. And, so the cats being away, the mouse duly played. What were you studying so passionately? With innocent disingenuousness, Murugan held up the book he was now pretending to read. It's called Elementary Ecology, he said. So I see, said Will. But what I asked you was what were you reading? Oh, that, Murugan shrugged his shoulders. You wouldn't be interested... I'm interested in everything that anyone tries to hide, Will assured him. Was it pornography? Murgan dropped his play-acting and looked genuinely offended. Who do you take me for? Will was on the point of saying that he took him for an average boy, but checked himself. To Colonel Deeper's pretty young friend, average boy might sound like an insult or an innuendo. Instead, he bowed with mock politeness. I beg your majesty's pardon he said. But I'm still curious, he added in another tone. May I? He laid a hand on the bulging briefcase. Murugan hesitated for a moment, then forced a laugh. Go ahead. What a tome! Will pulled the ponderous volume out of the bag and laid it on the table. Sears, Roebuck and Company, he read aloud. Spring and Summer Catalogue. It's last year's, said Murugan apologetically. But I don't suppose there's been much change since then. Well, there, Will assured him, you're mistaken. If the styles weren't completely changed every year, there'd be no reason for buying new things before the old ones are worn out. You don't understand the first principles of modern consumerism. He opened at random. Soft platform wedges in wide widths. Opened at another place and found the description and image of a whisper pink bra in Dacron and Pima cotton. Turned the page, and here, memento mori, was what the bra buyer would be wearing twenty years later. A strap-controlled front cut to support pendulous abdomen. 
it doesn't get really interesting, said Morrigan, until near the end of the book. It has 1,358 pages, he added parenthetically. Imagine, 1,358. We'll skip the next 750 pages. Ah, this is more like it, he said. Our famous point two two revolvers and automatics. And here, a little further on, were the fiberglass boats. Here were the high-thrust inboard engines. Here were the 12-horsepower outboard for only $234.95. And the fuel tank was included. That's extraordinarily generous. But Murugan, it was evident, was no sailor. Taking the book, he leafed impatiently through a score of additional pages. Look at this Italian-style motor scooter. And while Will looked, Murugan read aloud. This sleek speedster gives up to 110 miles per gallon of fuel. Just imagine. His normally sulky face was glowing with enthusiasm. And you can get up to 60 miles per gallon even on this 14.5 horsepower motorcycle. And it's guaranteed to do 75 miles an hour. Guaranteed. Remarkable, said Will. Then, curiously, did somebody in America send you this glorious book? he asked. Murgan shook his head. Colonel Deeper gave it to me. Colonel Deeper? What an odd kind of present from Hadrian to Antinous. He looked again at the picture of the motorbike, then back at Murgan's glowing face. Light dawned. The colonel's purpose revealed itself. The serpent tempted me and I did eat. The tree in the midst of the garden was called the tree of consumer goods, and to the inhabitants of every underdeveloped Eden the tiniest taste of its fruit, and even the sight of its 1,358 leaves, had power to bring the shameful knowledge that, industrially speaking, they were stark naked. The future Raja of Pala was being made to realise that he was no more than the untrousered ruler of a tribe of savages. "'You ought,' Will said aloud, "'to import a million of these catalogues and distribute them, "'gratis, of course, like contraceptives, to all your subjects. "'What for? "'To whet their appetite for possessions. "'Then they'll start clamouring for progress, "'oil wells, armaments, joaldehyde, Soviet technicians.' "'Murgan frowned and shook his head. "'It wouldn't work. "'You mean they wouldn't be tempted?' not even by sleek speedsters and whisper-pink bras? But that's incredible. It may be incredible, said Murugan bitterly, but it's a fact. They're just not interested. Not even the young ones? I'd say especially the young ones. Will Farnaby pricked up his ears. This lack of interest was profoundly interesting. Can you guess why? he asked. I don't guess, the boy answered. I know and as though he had suddenly decided to stage a parody of his mother, he began to speak in a tone of righteous indignation that was absurdly out of keeping with his age and appearance. To begin with, they're much too busy with... He hesitated, then the abhorred word was hissed out with a disgustful emphasis. With sex! But everybody's busy with sex, which doesn't keep them from whoring after sleek speedsters. Sex is different here, Morgan insisted. "'Because of the yoga of love?' Will asked, remembering the little nurse's rapturous face. The boy nodded. "'They've got something that makes them think they're perfectly happy, and they don't want anything else.' "'What a blessed state. "'There's nothing blessed about it,' Murugan snapped. "'It's just stupid and disgusting. "'No progress, only sex, sex, sex. "'And, of course, that beastly dope they're all given.' "'Dope?' Will repeated in some astonishment. Dope in a place where Susila had said there were no addicts? What kind of dope? It's made out of toadstools. Toadstools, he spoke in a comical caricature of the Rani's vibrant tone of outraged spirituality. Those lovely red toadstools that gnomes used to sit on? No, these are yellow. People used to go out and collect them in the mountains. Nowadays the things are grown in special fungus beds at the High Altitude Experimental Station, "'Scientifically cultivated dope. "'Pretty, isn't it?' "'A door slammed and there was a sound of voices, "'of footsteps approaching along a corridor. "'Abruptly the indignant spirit of the Rani took flight "'and Murgan was once again the conscience-stricken schoolboy "'furtively trying to cover up his delinquencies. "'In a trice, elementary ecology had taken the place of Sears, Roebuck, "'and the suspiciously bulging briefcase was under the table. "'A moment later... 
stripped to the waist and shining like oiled bronze with the sweat of labour in the noonday sun, Vijaya came striding into the room. Behind him came Dr. Robert, with the air of a model student interrupted in the midst of his reading by trespasses from the frivolous outside world, Murugan looked up from his book. Amused, Will threw himself at once wholeheartedly into the part that had been assigned to him. It was I who got here too early, he said, in response to Vijaya's apologies for their being so late, with the result that our young friend here hasn't been able to get on with his lessons. We've been talking our heads off. What about? Dr. Robert asked. Everything. Cabbages, kings, motor scooters, pendulous abdomens. And when you came in, we'd just embarked on toadstools. Murugan was telling me about the fungi that are used here as a source of dope. What's in a name? said Dr. Robert, with a laugh. Answer practically everything. Having had the misfortune to be brought up in Europe, Murugan calls it dope, and feels about it all the disapproval that, by conditioned reflex, the dirty word evokes. We, on the contrary, give the stuff good names. The Moksha Medicine, the Reality Revealer, the Truth and Beauty Pill. And we know, by direct experience, that the good names are deserved. Whereas our young friend here has no first-hand knowledge of the stuff, and can't be persuaded even to give it a try. For him it's dope, and dope is something that, by definition, no decent person ever indulges in. What does his highness say to that? Will asked. Morgan shook his head. All it gives you is a lot of illusions, he muttered. Why should I go out of my way to be made a fool of? Why, indeed, said Vijaya, with good-humoured irony, seeing that, in your normal condition, you alone of the human race are never made a fool of and never have illusions about anything. I never said that, Morgan protested. All I mean is that I don't want any of your false samadhi. How do you know it's false? Dr. Robert inquired. Because the real thing only comes to people after years and years of meditation and tapas and, well, you know, not going with women. Murugan, Vijaya explained to Will, is one of the Puritans. He's outraged by the fact that with 400 milligrams of moksha medicine in their bloodstreams, even beginners, yes, and even boys and girls who make love together, can catch a glimpse of the world as it looks to someone who has been liberated from his bondage to the ego. But it isn't real. Murugan insisted. Not real, Dr. Robert repeated. You might as well say that the experience of feeling well isn't real. You're begging the question, Will objected. An experience can be real in relation to something going on inside your skull, but completely irrelevant to anything outside. Of course, Dr. Robert agreed. Do you know what goes on inside your skull, when you've taken a dose of the mushroom? We know a little, and we're trying all the time to find out more, Vijaya added. For example, said Dr. Robert, we found that the people whose EEG doesn't show any alpha wave activity when they're relaxed aren't likely to respond significantly to the moksha medicine. That means that, for about 15% of the population, we have to find other approaches to liberation. Another thing we're just beginning to understand, said Vijaya, is the neurological correlate of these experiences. What's happening in the brain when you're having a vision? and what's happening when you pass from a pre-mystical to a genuinely mystical state of mind. Do you know? Will asked. No is a big word. Let's say we're in a position to make some plausible guesses. Angels and New Jerusalems and Madonnas and future Buddhas, they're all related to some kind of unusual stimulation of the brain areas of primary projection. The visual cortex, for example. Just how the moksha medicine produces those unusual stimuli, we haven't yet found out. The important fact is that somehow or other it does produce them. And somehow or other it also does something unusual to the silent areas of the brain, the areas not specifically concerned with perceiving or moving or feeling. And how do the silent areas respond? Will inquired. Let's start with what they don't respond with. They don't respond with visions or auditions. They don't respond with telepathy or clairvoyance or any other kind of parapsychological performance. None of that amusing pre-mystical stuff. Their response is the full-blown mystical experience. You know, one in all and all in one. The basic experience with its corollaries, boundless compassion, fathomless mystery and meaning. Not to mention joy, said Dr. Robert. Inexpressible joy. And the whole caboodle is inside your skull, said Will. Strictly private. No reference to any external fact, except a toadstool. Not real, 
Morgan chimed in. That's exactly what I was trying to say. You're assuming, said Dr. Robert, that the brain produces consciousness. I'm assuming that it transmits consciousness, and my explanation is no more far-fetched than yours. How on earth can a set of events belonging to one order be experienced as a set of events belonging to an entirely different and incommensurable order? Nobody has the faintest idea. All one can do is to accept the facts and concoct hypotheses. And one hypothesis is just about as good, philosophically speaking, as another. You say that the moksha medicine does something to the silent areas of the brain which causes them to produce a set of subjective events to which people have given the name mystical experience. I say that the moksha medicine does something to the silent areas of the brain which opens some kind of neurological sluice and so allows a larger volume of mind, with a large M, to flow into your mind with a small M. You can't demonstrate the truth of your hypothesis, and I can't demonstrate the truth of mine. And even if you could prove that I'm wrong, would it make any practical difference? I'd have thought it would make all the difference, said Will. Do you like music? Dr. Robert asked. More than most things. And what, may I ask, does Mozart's G minor quintet refer to? Does it refer to Allah? Or Tao? Or the second person of the Trinity? Or the Atman Brahman? Will laughed. Let's hope not. But that doesn't make the experience of the G minor quintet any less rewarding. Well, it's the same with the kind of experience that you get with a moksha medicine, or through prayer and fasting and spiritual exercises. Even if it doesn't refer to anything outside itself, it's still the most important thing that ever happened to you. Like music, only incomparably more so. And if you give the experience a chance, if you're prepared to go along with it, the results are incomparably more therapeutic and transforming. So maybe the whole thing does happen inside one's skull. Maybe it is private and there's no unitive knowledge of anything but one's own physiology. Who cares? The fact remains that the experience can open one's eyes and make one blessed and transform one's whole life. There was a long silence. Let me tell you something, he resumed, turning to Murugan. Something I hadn't intended to talk about to anybody. But now I feel that perhaps I have a duty, a duty to the throne, a duty to Pala and all its people, an obligation to tell you about this very private experience. Perhaps the telling may help you to be a little more understanding about your country and its ways. He was silent for a moment, then in a quietly matter-of-fact tone, I suppose you know about my wife, he went on. His face still averted, Murgan nodded. I was sorry, he mumbled, to hear she was so ill. It's a matter of a few days now, said Dr. Robert. Four or five at the most. But she's still perfectly lucid, perfectly conscious of what's happening to her. Yesterday she asked me if we could take the moksha medicine together. We'd taken it together, he added parenthetically, once or twice each year for the last thirty-seven years, ever since we decided to get married. And now once more, for the last time. The last, last time. There was a risk involved because of the damage to the liver, but we decided it was a risk worth taking. And as it turned out, we were right. The moksha medicine, the dope, as you prefer to call it, hardly upset her at all. All that happened to her was the mental transformation. He was silent, and Will suddenly became aware of the squeak and scrabble of caged rats, and through the open window, the babble of tropical life and the call of a distant minor bird. Here and now, boys. Here and now. You're like that miner, said Dr. Robert at last, trained to repeat words you don't understand or know the reason for. It isn't real. It isn't real. But if you'd experienced what Lakshmi and I went through yesterday, you'd know better. You'd know it was much more real than what you call reality. More real than what you're thinking and feeling at this moment. More real than the world before your eyes. But not real is what you've been taught to say. Not real, not real. Dr. Robert laid a hand affectionately on the boy's shoulder. You've been told that we're just a set of self-indulgent dope-takers, wallowing in illusions and false samadhis. Listen, Murugan, forget all the bad language that's been pumped into you. Forget it at least to the point of making a single experiment. Take 400 milligrams of moksha medicine and find out for yourself what it does, what it can tell you about your own nature, about this strange world you've got to live in. Learning, suffering, and finally dying. Yes, even you will have to die one day, maybe fifty years from now, maybe tomorrow, who knows. 
but it's going to happen, and one's a fool if one doesn't prepare for it. He turned to Will. Would you like to come along while we take our shower and get into some clothes? Without waiting for an answer, he walked out through the door that led into that central corridor of the long building. Will picked up his bamboo staff and, accompanied by Vijaya, followed him out of the room. Do you suppose that made any impression on Murugan? he asked Vijaya when the door had closed behind them. Vijaya shrugged his shoulders. I doubt it. What with his mother, said Will, and his passion for internal combustion engines, he's probably impervious to anything you people can say. You should have heard him on the subject of motor scooters. We have heard him, said Dr. Robert, who had halted in front of a blue door and was waiting for them to come up with him. Frequently. When he comes of age, scooters are going to become a major political issue. Vijaya laughed. To scoot or not to scoot, that is the question. And it isn't only in parlour that it's the question, Dr. Robert added. It's the question that every underdeveloped country has to answer one way or the other. And the answer, said Will, is always the same. Wherever I've been, and I've been almost everywhere, they've opted wholeheartedly for scooting. All of them. Without exception, Vijaya agreed. Scooting for scooting's sake, and to hell with all considerations of fulfilment, self-knowledge, liberation. Not to mention common or garden health or happiness. Whereas we, said Dr. Robert, have always chosen to adapt our economy and technology to human beings, not our human beings to somebody else's economy and technology. We import what we can't make, but we make and import only what we can afford. And what we can afford is limited not merely by our supply of pounds and marks and dollars, but also primarily, primarily, he insisted, by our wish to be happy, our ambition to become fully human. Scooters, we've decided after carefully looking into the matter, are among the things, the very numerous things, we simply can't afford. Which is something poor little Murrigan will have to learn the hard way, seeing that he hasn't learned and doesn't want to learn the easy way. Which is the easy way? Will asked. Education and reality revealers. Murgan has had neither. Or rather, he's had the opposite of both. He's had miseducation in Europe, Swiss governesses, English tutors, American movies, everybody's advertisements, and he's had reality eclipsed for him by his mother's brand of spirituality. So it's no wonder he pines for scooters. But his subjects, I gather, do not. Why should they? They've been taught from infancy to be fully aware of the world and to enjoy their awareness. And on top of that, they've been shown the world and themselves and other people as these are illumined and transfigured by reality revealers, which helps them, of course, to have an intenser awareness and a more understanding enjoyment, so that the most ordinary things, the most trivial events, are seen as jewels and miracles. Jewels and miracles, he repeated emphatically. So why should we resort to scooters or whiskey or television or Billy Graham or any other of your distractions and compensations? Nothing short of everything will really do, Will quoted. I see now what the old Raja was talking about. You can't be a good economist unless you're also a good psychologist or a good engineer without being the right kind of metaphysician. And don't forget all the other sciences, said Dr. Robert. Pharmacology, sociology, physiology not to mention pure and applied autology, neurotheology, metachemistry, mycomysticism, and the ultimate science, he said, looking away so as to be more alone with his thoughts of Lakshmi in the hospital, the science that sooner or later we shall all have to be examined in thanatology. He was silent for a moment. Then, in another tone, well, let's go and get washed up, he said, and opening the blue door led the way into a long changing room with a row of showers and wash basins at one end, and on the opposite wall, tiers of lockers and a large hanging cupboard. Will took a seat, and while his companions lathered themselves at the basins, went on with their conversations. Would it be possible, he asked, for a miseducated alien to try a truth and beauty pill? The answer was another question. Is your liver in good order? Dr. Robert inquired. Excellent. And you don't seem to be more than mildly schizophrenic? So I can't see any counterindication. Then I can make the experiment? Whenever you like. He stepped into the nearest shower stall and turned on the water. Vijaya followed suit. Aren't you supposed to be intellectuals? Will asked when the two men had emerged again and were drying themselves. We do intellectual work, Vijaya answered. 
then why all this horrible, honest toil? For a very simple reason. This morning I had some spare time. So did I, said Dr. Robert. So you went out into the fields and did a Tolstoy act. Vijaya laughed. You seem to imagine we do it for ethical reasons. Don't you? Certainly not. I do muscular work because I have muscles, and if I don't use my muscles I shall become a bad-tempered sitting addict. With nothing between the cortex and the buttocks, said Dr. Robert, or rather with everything, but in a condition of complete unconsciousness and toxic stagnation. Western intellectuals are all sitting addicts. That's why most of you are so repulsively unwholesome. In the past, even a duke had to do a lot of walking, even a money-lender, even a metaphysician. And when they weren't using their legs, they were jogging about on horses. Whereas now, from the tycoon to his typist, from the logical positivist to the positive thinker, you spend nine-tenths of your time on foam rubber, spongy seats for spongy bottoms, at home, in the office, in cars and bars, in planes and trains and buses, no moving of legs, no struggles with distance and gravity, just lifts and planes and cars, just foam rubber and an eternity of sitting. The life force that used to find an outlet through striped muscle gets turned back on the viscera and the nervous system and slowly destroys them. So you take to digging and delving as a form of therapy? As prevention, to make therapy unnecessary. In parlour, even a professor, even a government official, generally puts in two hours of digging and delving each day. As part of his duties, and as part of his pleasure. Will made a grimace. It wouldn't be part of my pleasure. That's because you weren't taught to use your mind-body in the right way, Vijaya explained. If you'd been shown how to do things with the minimum of strain and the maximum of awareness, you'd enjoy even honest toil. I take it that your children will get this kind of training. From the first moment they start doing for themselves. For example, what's the proper way of handling yourself while you're buttoning your clothes? And suiting action to words, Vijaya started to button the shirt he had just slipped into. We answer the question by actually putting their heads and bodies into the physiologically best position, and we encourage them at the same time to notice how it feels to be in the physiologically best position, to be aware of what the process of doing up buttons consists of in terms of touches and pressures and muscular sensations. By the time they're fourteen, they've learned how to get the most and the best, objectively and subjectively, out of any activity they may undertake. And that's when we start them working. Ninety minutes a day at some kind of manual job. Back to good old child labour. Or rather, said Dr. Robert, forward from bad new child idleness. You don't allow your teenagers to work, so they have to blow off steam in delinquency or else throttle down steam till they're ready to become domesticated sitting addicts. And now, he added, it's time to be going. I'll lead the way. In the laboratory, when they entered, Murgan was in the act of locking his briefcase against all prying eyes. I'm ready, he said, and tucking the 1,358 pages of the newest testament under his arm, he followed them out into the sunshine. A few minutes later, crammed into an ancient jeep, the four of them were rolling along the road that led past the paddock of the white bull, past the lotus pool and the huge stone Buddha, out through the gate of the station compound to the highway. I'm sorry we can't provide more comfortable transportation, said Vijaya, as they bumped and rattled along. Will patted Murugan's knee. This is the man you should be apologising to, he said. The one whose soul yearns for jaguars and thunderbirds. It's a yearning, I'm afraid, said Dr. Robert from the back seat, that will have to remain unsatisfied. Murugan made no comment, but smiled the secret, contemptuous smile of one who knows better. We can't import toys, Dr. Robert went on, only essentials. Such as? You'll see in a moment. They rounded a curve, and there beneath them were the thatched roofs and tree-shaded gardens of a considerable village. Vijaya pulled up at the side of the road and turned off the motor. You're looking at New Rothamstead, he said, alias Medallia. Rice, vegetables, poultry, fruit. Not to mention two potteries and a furniture factory, hence those wires. He waved his hand in the direction of the long row of pylons that climbed up the terraced slope behind the village, dipped out of sight over the ridge, and reappeared far away, marching up from the floor of the next valley towards the green belt of mountain jungle and the cloudy peaks beyond and above. That's one of the indispensable imports, electrical equipment. 
and when the waterfalls have been harnessed and you've strung up the transmission lines, here's something else with a high priority. He directed a pointing finger at a windowless block of cement that rose incongruously from among the wooden houses near the upper entrance to the village. What is it? Will asked. Some kind of electric oven? No, the kilns are over on the other side of the village. This is the communal freezer. In the old days, Dr. Robert explained, we used to lose about half of all the perishables we produced. Now we lose practically nothing. Whatever we grow is for us, not for the circumambient bacteria. So now you have enough to eat. More than enough. We eat better than any other country in Asia. And there's a surplus for export. Lenin used to say that electricity plus socialism equals communism. Our equations are rather different. Electricity minus heavy industry plus birth control equals democracy and plenty. Electricity plus heavy industry minus birth control equals misery, totalitarianism and war. Incidentally, Will asked, who owns all this? Are you capitalists or state socialists? Neither. Most of the time we're co-operators. Palinese agriculture has always been an affair of terracing and irrigation, but terracing and irrigation call for pooled efforts and friendly agreements. Cutthroat competition isn't compatible with rice growing in a mountainous country. Our people found it quite easy to pass from mutual aid in the village community to streamlined cooperative techniques for buying and selling and profit-sharing and financing. Even cooperative financing? Dr. Robert nodded. None of those blood-sucking usurers that you find all over the Indian countryside, and no commercial banks in your Western style. Our borrowing and lending system was modelled on those credit unions that Wilhelm Reifeisen set up more than a century ago in Germany. Dr. Andrew persuaded the Raja to invite one of Reifeisen's young men to come here and organise a cooperative banking system. It's still going strong. And what do you use for money? Will asked. Dr. Robert dipped into his trouser pocket and pulled out a handful of silver, gold and copper. In a modest way, he explained, Parler's a gold-producing country. We mine enough to give our paper a solid metallic backing, and the gold supplements our exports. We can pay spot cash for expensive equipment like those transmission lines and the generators at the other end. You seem to have solved your economic problems pretty successfully. Solving them wasn't difficult. To begin with, we never allowed ourselves to produce more children than we could feed, clothe, house and educate into something like full humanity. Not being overpopulated, we have plenty. But although we have plenty, we've managed to resist the temptation that the West has now succumbed to, the temptation to overconsume. We don't give ourselves coronaries by guzzling six times as much saturated fat as we need. We don't hypnotise ourselves into believing that two television sets will make us twice as happy as one television set. And finally, we don't spend a quarter of the gross national product preparing for World War Three or even World War's baby brother, Local War 3333. Armaments, universal debt and planned obsolescence. Those are the three pillars of Western prosperity. If war, waste and money lenders were abolished, you'd collapse. And while you people are over-consuming, the rest of the world sinks more and more deeply into chronic disaster, ignorance, militarism and breeding. These three, and the greatest of these is breeding. No hope, not the slightest possibility of solving the economic problem until that's under control. As population rushes up, prosperity goes down. He traced the descending curve with an outstretched finger. And as prosperity goes down, discontent and rebellion. The forefinger moved up again. Political ruthlessness and one-party rule, nationalism and bellicosity begin to rise, Another ten or fifteen years of uninhibited breeding in the whole world, from China to Peru via Africa and the Middle East, will be fairly crawling with great leaders, all dedicated to the suppression of freedom, all armed to the teeth by Russia or America, or better still by both at once, all waving flags, all screaming for Lebensraum. What about Parler? Will asked. Will you be blessed with a great leader ten years from now? Not if we can help it, Dr. Robert answered. We've always done everything possible to make it very difficult for a great leader to arise. Out of the corner of his eye, Will saw that Murgan was making a face of indignant and contemptuous disgust. In his fancy, Antonos evidently saw himself as a Carlylean hero. Will turned back to Dr. Robert. Tell me how you do it, he said. Well, to begin with, we don't fight wars or prepare for them. 
Consequently, we have no need for conscription or military hierarchies or a unified command. And there's our economic system. It doesn't permit anybody to become more than four or five times as rich as the average. That means that we don't have any captains of industry or omnipotent financiers. Better still, we have no omnipotent politicians or bureaucrats. Paul is a federation of self-governing units, geographical units, professional units, economic units, so there's plenty of scope for small-scale initiative and democratic leaders, but no place for any kind of dictator at the head of a centralised government. Another point, we have no established church, and our religion stresses immediate experience and deplores belief in unverifiable dogmas and the emotions which that belief inspires. So we're preserved from the plagues of popery on the one hand, and fundamentalist revivalism on the other. And along with transcendental experience, we systematically cultivate scepticism, discouraging children from taking words too seriously, teaching them to analyse whatever they hear or read. This is an integral part of the school curriculum. Result, the eloquent rabble-rouser like Hitler, or our neighbour across the strait, Colonel Deeper, just doesn't have a chance here in Parla. This was too much for Murugan. Unable to contain himself... But look at the energy Colonel Deeper generates in his people, he burst out. Look at all the devotion and self-sacrifice. We don't have anything like that here. Thank God, said Dr. Robert devoutly. Thank God, Vijaya echoed. But these things are good, the boy protested. I admire them. I admire them too, said Dr. Robert. Admire them in the same way as I admire a typhoon. Unfortunately, that kind of energy and devotion and self-sacrifice happens to be incompatible with liberty, not to mention reason and human decency. But decency, reason and liberty are what Pala has been working for, ever since the time of your namesake, Murugan the Reformer. From under his seat, Vijaya pulled out a tin box, and lifting the lid, distributed a first round of cheese and avocado sandwiches. We'll have to eat as we go. He started the motor, and with one hand, the other being busy with his sandwich, swung the little car onto the road. Tomorrow, he said to Will, I'd show you the sights of the village and the still more remarkable sight of my family eating their lunch. Today we have an appointment in the mountains. Near the entrance to the village, he turned the jeep into a side road that went winding steeply up between terraced fields of rice and vegetables, interspersed with orchards and here and there plantations of young trees, destined, Dr. Robert explained, to supply the pulp mills of Shivapuram with their raw material. How many papers does Pala support? Will inquired, and was surprised to learn that there was only one. Who enjoys the monopoly? The government? The party in power? The local Joe Alderhyde? Nobody enjoys a monopoly, Dr. Robert assured him. There's a panel of editors representing half a dozen different parties and interests, each of them gets his allotted space for comment and criticism. The reader's in a position to compare their arguments and make up his own mind. I remember how shocked I was the first time I read one of your big circulation newspapers. The bias of the headlines, the systematic one-sidedness of the reporting and the commentaries, the catchwords and slogans instead of argument. No serious appeal to reason. Instead, a systematic effort to install conditioned reflexes in the minds of the voters, and, for the rest, crime, divorce, anecdotes, twaddle, anything to keep them distracted, anything to prevent them from thinking. The car climbed on, and now they were on a ridge between two headlong descents, with a tree-fringed lake down at the bottom of a gorge to their left, and to the right a broader valley where, between two tree-shaded villages, like an incongruous piece of pure geometry, sprawled a huge factory. Cement? Will questioned. Dr. Robert nodded. One of the indispensable industries. We produce all we need and a surplus for export. And those villages supply the manpower? In the intervals of agriculture and work in the forest and the sawmills? Does that kind of part-time system work well? It depends what you mean by well. It doesn't result in maximum efficiency. But then in Pala, maximum efficiency isn't the categorical imperative that it is with you. You think first of getting the biggest possible output in the shortest possible time. We think first of human beings and their satisfactions. Changing jobs doesn't make for the biggest output in the fewest days. But most people like it better than doing one kind of job all their lives. If it's a choice between mechanical efficiency and human satisfaction, we choose satisfaction. When I was twenty... Vijaya now volunteered. I put in four months at that cement plant. 
and after that ten weeks making superphosphates, and then six months in the jungle as a lumberjack. All this ghastly honest toil. Twenty years earlier, said Dr. Robert, I did a stint at the copper smelters, after which I had a taste of the sea on a fishing boat, sampling all kinds of work. It's part of everybody's education. One learns an enormous amount that way, about things and skills and organisations, about all kinds of people and their ways of thinking. Will shook his head. I'd still rather get it out of a book. But what you can get out of a book is never it. At bottom, Dr. Robert added, all of you are still Platonists. You worship the word and abhor matter. Tell that to the clergymen, said Will. They're always reproaching us with being crass materialists. Crass, Dr. Robert agreed, but crass precisely because you're such inadequate materialists. Abstract materialism, that's what you profess, whereas we make a point of being materialists concretely, materialistic on the wordless levels of seeing and touching and smelling, of tensed muscles and dirty hands. Abstract materialism is as bad as abstract idealism. It makes immediate spiritual experience almost impossible. Sampling different kinds of work in concrete materialism is the first indispensable step in our education for concrete spirituality. But even the most concrete materialism, Vijaya qualified, won't get you very far unless you're fully conscious of what you're doing and experiencing. You've got to be completely aware of the bits of matter you're handling, the skills you're practicing, the people you work with. Quite right, said Dr. Robert. I ought to have made it clear that concrete materialism is only the raw stuff of a fully human life. It's through awareness, complete and constant awareness, that we transform it into concrete spirituality. Be fully aware of what you're doing and work becomes the yoga of work. Play becomes the yoga of play. Everyday living becomes the yoga of everyday living. Will thought of Ranga and the little nurse. And what about love? Dr. Robert nodded. That, too. Awareness transfigures it, turns love-making into the yoga of love-making. Murugan gave an imitation of his mother looking shocked. Psychophysical means to a transcendental end, said Vijaya, raising his voice against the grinding screech of the low gear into which he had just shifted. That primarily is what all these yogas are. But they're also something else. They're also devices for dealing with the problems of power. He shifted back to a quieter gear and lowered his voice to its normal tone. The problems of power, he repeated, and they confront you on every level of organisation, every level, from national governments down to nurseries and honeymooning couples. For it isn't merely a question of making things hard for the great leaders. There are all the millions of small-scale tyrants and persecutors, all the mute, inglorious Hitlers, the village Napoleons, the Calvins and Torquemadas of the family not to mention all the brigands and bullies stupid enough to get themselves labelled as criminals. How does one harness the enormous power these people generate and set it to work in some useful way, or at least prevent it from doing harm? That's what I want you to tell me, said Will. Where do you start? We start everywhere at once, Vijaya answered, but since one can't say more than one thing at a time, let's begin by talking about the anatomy and physiology of power. Tell him about your biochemical approach to the subject, Dr. Robert. It started, said Dr. Robert, nearly forty years ago, while I was studying in London. Started with prison visiting on weekends and reading history whenever I had a free evening. History and prisons, he repeated. I discovered that they were closely related. The record of the crimes, follies and misfortunes of mankind. That's Gibbon, isn't it? And the place where unsuccessful crimes and follies are visited with a special kind of misfortune. Reading my books and talking to my jailbirds, I found myself asking questions. What kind of people became dangerous delinquents? The grand delinquents of the history books? The little ones of Pentonville and Wormwood Scrubs? What kinds of people are moved by the lust for power, the passion to bully and domineer? and the ruthless ones, the men and women who know what they want and have no qualms about hurting and killing in order to get it, the monsters who hurt and kill not for profit, but gratuitously because hurting and killing are such fun. Who are they? I used to discuss these questions with the experts, doctors, psychologists, social scientists, teachers. Montegazza and Galton had gone out of fashion, and most of my experts assured me that the only valid answers to these questions were answers in terms of culture, economics, and the family. It was all a matter of mothers and toilet training, 
of early conditioning and traumatic environments. I was only half convinced. Mothers and toilet training and the circumambient nonsense, these were obviously important, but were they all important? In the course of my prison visiting, I'd begun to see evidence of some kind of a built-in pattern, or rather, two kinds of built-in patterns, for dangerous delinquents and power-loving troublemakers don't belong to a single species. Most of them, as I was beginning to realise even then, belong to one or other of two distinct and dissimilar species, the Muscle People and the Peter Pans. I've specialised in the treatment of Peter Pans. The boys who never grow up? Will queried. Never is the wrong word. In real life, Peter Pan always ends by growing up. He merely grows up too late, grows up physiologically more slowly than he grows up in terms of birthdays. What about girl Peter Pans? They're very rare, but the boys are as common as blackberries. You can expect one Peter Pan among every five or six male children. And among problem children, among the boys who can't read, won't learn, don't get on with anyone, and finally turn to the more violent forms of delinquency, seven out of ten turn out, if you take an X-ray of the bones of the wrist, to be Peter Pan. The rest are mostly muscle people of one sort or another. I'm trying to think, said Will, of a good historical example of a delinquent Peter Pan. You don't have to go far afield. The most recent, as well as the best and biggest, was Adolf Hitler. Hitler? Murugan's tone was one of shocked astonishment. Hitler was evidently one of his heroes. Read the Führer's biography, said Dr. Robert. A Peter Pan, if ever there was one. Hopeless at school, incapable either of competing or cooperating, envying all the normally successful boys, and because he envied, hating them, and, to make himself feel better, despising them as inferior beings. Then came the time for puberty, but Adolf was sexually backward. Other boys made advances to girls, and the girls responded. Adolf was too shy, too uncertain of his manhood, and all the time incapable of steady work, at home only in the compensatory other world of his fancy. There, at the very least, he was Michelangelo. Here, unfortunately, he couldn't draw. His only gifts were hatred, low cunning, a set of indefatigable vocal cords, and a talent for non-stop talking at the top of his voice from the depths of his Peter Panic paranoia. Thirty or forty million deaths, and heaven knows how many billions of dollars, that was the price the world had to pay for little Adolf's retarded maturation. Fortunately, most of the boys who grow up too slowly never get a chance of being more than minor delinquents, but even minor delinquents, if there are enough of them, can exact a pretty stiff price. That's why we try to nip them in the bud, or, or rather, since we're dealing with Peter Pans, that's why we try to make their nipped buds open out and grow. And do you succeed? Dr. Robert nodded. It isn't hard, particularly if you start early enough. Between four and a half and five, all our children get a thorough examination. Blood tests, psychological tests, somatotyping. Then we x-ray their wrists and give them an EEG. All the cute little Peter Pans are spotted without fail, and appropriate treatment is started immediately. Within a year, practically all of them are perfectly normal. A crop of potential failures and criminals, potential tyrants and sadists, potential misanthropes and revolutionaries for revolution's sake, has been transformed into a crop of useful citizens who can be governed ad andena asatena, without punishment and without a sword. In your part of the world, delinquency is still left to clergymen, social workers and the police. Non-stop sermons and supportive therapy, prison sentences galore. With what results? The delinquency rate goes steadily up and up. No wonder. Words about sibling rivalry and hell and the personality of Jesus are no substitutes for biochemistry. A year in jail won't cure a Peter Pan of his endocrine disbalance, or help the ex-Peter Pan to get rid of his psychological consequences. For Peter Panic delinquency, what you need is early diagnosis and three pink capsules a day before meals. Given a tolerable environment, the result will be sweet reasonableness and a modicum of the cardinal virtues within 18 months, not to mention a fair chance, where before there hadn't been the faintest possibility, of eventual prajna paramita and karuna, eventual wisdom and compassion. I now get Vijaya to tell you about the muscle people. As you may perhaps have observed, he's one of them. Leaning forward, Dr. Robert thumped the giant's broad back. Solid beef! And he added, How lucky for us, poor shrimps, that the animal isn't savage. 
Vijaya took one hand off the wheel, beat his chest, and uttered a loud, ferocious roar. Don't tease the gorilla, he said and laughed good-humouredly. Then, think of the other great dictator, he said to Will. Think of Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin. Hitler's the supreme example of the delinquent Peter Pan. Stalin's the supreme example of the delinquent muscle man, predestined by his shape to be an extrovert. Not one of your soft, round, spill-the-beans extroverts who pine for indiscriminate togetherness. No, the trampling, driving extrovert, the one who always feels impelled to do something, and is never inhibited by doubts or qualms, by sympathy or sensibility. In his will, Lenin advised his successors to get rid of Stalin. The man was too fond of power, and too apt to abuse it. But the advice came too late. Stalin was already so firmly entrenched that he couldn't be ousted. Ten years later his power was absolute. Trotsky had been scotched, all his old friends had been bumped off. Now, like God among the choiring angels, he was alone in a cosy little heaven peopled only by flatterers and yes-men, and all the time he was ruthlessly busy liquidating kulaks, organising collectives, building an armament industry, shifting reluctant millions from farm to factory working with a tenacity, a lucid efficiency of which the German Peter Pan, with his apocalyptic fantasies and his fluctuating moods, was utterly incapable. And in the last phase of the war, compare Stalin's strategy with Hitler's. Cool calculation pitted against compensatory daydreams, clear-eyed realism against the rhetorical nonsense that Hitler had finally talked himself into believing. Two monsters, equal in delinquency, but profoundly dissimilar in temperament, in unconscious motivation, and finally inefficiency. Peter Pan's are wonderfully good at starting wars and revolutions, but it takes muscle men to carry them through to a successful conclusion. Here's the jungle, Vijaya added in another tone, waving a hand in the direction of a great cliff of trees that seemed to block their further ascent. A moment later they had left the glare of the open hillside and had plunged into a narrow tunnel of green twilight that zigzagged up between walls of tropical foliage. Creepers dangled from the overarching branches and between the trunks of huge trees grew ferns and dark-leaved rhododendrons with a dense profusion of shrubs and bushes that for Will, as he looked about him, were namelessly unfamiliar. The air was stiflingly damp and there was a hot, acrid smell of luxuriant green growth and of that other kind of life which is decay. Muffled by the thick foliage, Will heard the ringing of distant axes, the rhythmic screech of a saw. The road turned yet once more, and suddenly the green darkness of the tunnel gave place to sunshine. They had entered a clearing in the forest. Tall and broad-shouldered, half a dozen almost naked woodcutters were engaged in lopping the branches from a newly felled tree. In the sunshine, hundreds of blue and amethyst butterflies chased one another, fluttering and soaring in an endless random dance. Over a fire at the further side of the clearing, an old man was slowly stirring the contents of an iron cauldron. Nearby, a small tame deer, fine-limbed and elegantly dappled, was quietly grazing. "'Old friends!' said Vijaya, and shouted something in Polynese. The woodcutters shouted back and waved their hands. Then the road swung sharply to the left, and they were climbing again up the green tunnel between the trees. "'Talk of muscle, men,' said Will as they left the clearing. "'Those were really splendid specimens.' "'That kind of physique,' said Vijaya, "'is a standing temptation. And yet among all these men, and I've worked with scores of them, I've never met a single bully, a single potentially dangerous power-lover.' "'Which is just another way.' Murugan broke in contemptuously, of saying that nobody here has any ambition. What's the explanation? Will asked. Very simple, so far as the Peter Pans are concerned. They're never given a chance to work up an appetite for power. We cure them of their delinquency before it's had time to develop. But the muscle men are different. They're just as muscular here, just as tramplingly extroverted as they are with you. So why don't they turn into Stalins, or Deepers, or at the least into domestic tyrants? First of all, our social arrangements offer them very few opportunities for bullying their families, and our political arrangements make it practically impossible for them to domineer on any larger scale. Second, we train the muscle men to be aware and sensitive. We teach them to enjoy the commonplaces of everyday existence. This means that they always have an alternative. 
innumerable alternatives to the pleasure of being the boss. And finally, we work directly on the love of power and domination that goes with this kind of physique in almost all its variations. We canalize this love of power and we deflect it, turn it away from people and onto things. We give them all kinds of difficult tasks to perform, strenuous and violent tasks that exercise their muscles and satisfy their craving for domination, but satisfied at nobody's expense and in ways that are either harmless or positively useful. So these splendid creatures fell trees instead of felling people. Is that it? Precisely. And when they've had enough of the woods, they can go to sea, or try their hands at mining, or take it easy, relatively speaking, on the rice paddies. Will Farnaby suddenly laughed. What's the joke? I was thinking of my father. A little wood chopping might have been the making of him, not to mention the salvation of his wretched family. Unfortunately, he was an English gentleman. Wood chopping was out of the question. Didn't he have any physical outlet for his energies? Will shook his head. Besides being a gentleman, he explained, my father thought he was an intellectual. But an intellectual doesn't hunt or shoot or play golf. He just thinks and drinks. Apart from brandy, my father's only amusements were bullying, auction bridge and the theory of politics. He fancied himself as a 20th century version of Lord Acton, the last lonely philosopher of liberalism. You should have heard him on the iniquities of the modern omnipotent state. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Absolutely! After which he'd down another brandy and go back with renewed gusto to his favourite pastime, trampling on his wife and children. And if Acton himself didn't behave in that way, said Dr. Robert, it was merely because he happened to be virtuous and intelligent. There was nothing in his theories to restrain a delinquent muscle man or an untreated Peter Pan from trampling on anyone he could get his feet on. That was Acton's fatal weakness. As a political theorist, he was altogether admirable. As a practical psychologist, he was almost non-existent. He seems to have thought that the power problem could be solved by good social arrangements, supplemented, of course, by sound morality and a spot of unrevealed religion. But the power problem has its roots in anatomy and biochemistry and temperament. Power has to be curbed on the legal and political levels, that's obvious. But it's also obvious that there must be prevention on the individual level, on the level of instinct and emotion, on the level of the glands and the viscera, the muscles and the blood. If I can ever find the time, I'd like to write a little book on human physiology in relation to ethics, religion, politics and law. Law, Will echoed. I was just going to ask you about law. Are you absolutely swordless and punishmentless? Or do you still need judges and policemen? We still need them, said Dr. Robert, but we don't need nearly so many of them as you do. In the first place, thanks to preventive medicine and preventive education, we don't commit many crimes. And in the second place, most of the few crimes that are committed are dealt with by the criminal's MAC. Group therapy within a community that has assumed group responsibility for the delinquent. And in difficult cases, the group therapy is supplemented by medical treatment and a course of moksha medicine experiences, directed by somebody with an exceptional degree of insight. So where do the judges come in? The judge listens to the evidence, decides whether the accused person is innocent or guilty, and if he's guilty, remands him to his MAC and, where it seems advisable, to the local panel of medical and myco-mystical experts. At stated intervals, the experts and the MAC report back to the judge. When the reports are satisfactory, the case is closed. And if they're never satisfactory? In the long run, said Dr. Robert, they always are. There was a silence. Did you ever do any rock climbing? Vijaya suddenly asked. Will laughed. How do you think I came by my game leg? That was forced climbing. Did you ever climb for fun? Enough, said Will, to convince me that I wasn't much good at it. Vijaya glanced at Murugan. What about you, while you were in Switzerland? The boy blushed deeply and shook his head. You can't do any of those things, he muttered, if you have a tendency to TB. What a pity! said Vijaya. It would have been so good for you. Will asked, Do people do a lot of climbing in these mountains? Climbing's an integral part of the school curriculum. For everybody? A little for everybody. With more advanced rock work for the full-blown muscle people, that's about one in twelve of the boys and one in twenty-seven of the girls. 
we shall soon be seeing some youngsters tackling their first post-elementary climb. The green tunnel widened, brightened, and suddenly they were out of the dripping forest on a wide shelf of almost level ground, walled in on three sides by red rocks that towered up two thousand feet and more into a succession of jagged crests and isolated pinnacles. There was a freshness in the air, and as they passed from sunshine into the shadow of a floating island of cumulus, it was almost cool. Dr. Robert leaned forward and pointed through the windshield at a group of white buildings on a little knoll near the centre of the plateau. "'That's the high-altitude station,' he said. Seven thousand feet up, with more than five thousand acres of good flat land where we can grow practically anything that grows in southern Europe. Wheat and barley, green peas and cabbages, lettuce and tomatoes. The fruit won't set where night temperatures are over sixty-eight. Gooseberries, strawberries, walnuts, green gauges, peaches, apricots, plus all the valuable plants that are native to high mountains at this latitude, including the mushrooms that our young friend here so violently disapproves of. "'Is this the place we're bound for?' Will asked. "'No, we're going higher.' Dr. Robert pointed to the last outpost of the range, a ridge of dark red rock from which the land sloped down on one side to the jungle and on the other mounted precipitously towards an unseen summit lost in the clouds. "'Up to the old Shiva temple, where the pilgrims used to come every spring and autumn equinox. It's one of my favourite places in the whole island. When the children were small... We used to go up there for picnics, Lakshmi and I, almost every week. How many years ago? A note of sadness had come into his voice. He sighed and, leaning back in his seat, closed his eyes. They turned off the road that led to the high-altitude station and began to climb again. Entering the last worst lap, said Vijaya, seven hairpin turns and half a mile of unventilated tunnel. He shifted into first gear and conversation became impossible. Ten minutes later, they had arrived. 10. Cautiously manoeuvring his immobilised leg, Will climbed out of the car and looked about him. Between the red, soaring crags to the south and the headlong descents in every other direction, the crest of the ridge had been levelled, and at the midpoint of this long, narrow terrace stood the temple, a great red tower of the same substance as the mountains, Massive, four-sided, vertically ribbed. A thing of symmetry in contrast with the rocks, but regular, not as Euclidean abstractions are regular, regular with the pragmatic geometry of a living thing. Yes, of a living thing. For all the temple's richly textured surfaces, all its bounding contours against the sky curved organically inwards, narrowing as they mounted towards a ring of marble, above which the red stone swelled out again, like the seed capsule of a flowering plant, into a flattened, many-ribbed dome that crowned the whole. "'Built about fifty years before the Norman Conquest,' said Dr. Robert. "'And looks,' Will commented, as though it hadn't been built by anybody, as though it had grown out of the rock, grown like the bud of an agave, on the point of rocketing up, into a twelve-foot stalk and an explosion of flowers. Vijaya touched his arm. Look, he said, a party of elementaries coming down. Will turned towards the mountain and saw a young man in nailed boots and climbing clothes working his way down a chimney in the face of the precipice. At a place where the chimney offered a convenient resting place, he halted and, throwing back his head, gave utterance to a loud alpine yodel. Fifty feet above him, a boy came out from behind a buttress of rock, lowered himself from the ledge on which he was standing, and started down the chimney. "'Does it tempt you?' Vijaya asked, turning to Murugan. Heavily overacting the part of the bored, sophisticated adult who has something better to do than watch the children at play, Murugan shrugged his shoulders. "'Not in the slightest,' he moved away, and— Sitting down on the weather-worn carving of a lion, pulled a gaudily bound American magazine out of his pocket and started to read. "'What's the literature?' Vijaya asked. "'Science fiction.' There was a ring of defiance in Murugan's voice. Dr. Robert laughed. "'Anything to escape from fact?' Pretending not to have heard him, Murugan turned a page and went on reading. "'He's pretty good.' said Vijaya, who had been watching the young climber's progress. They have an experienced man at each end of the rope, he added. You can't see the number one man. He's behind that buttress in a parallel chimney thirty or forty feet higher up. 
There's a permanent iron spike up there where you can belay the rope. The whole party could fall and they'd be perfectly safe. Spread eagled between footholds in either wall of the narrow chimney, the leader kept shouting up instructions and encouragement. Then, as the boy approached, he yielded his place, climbed down another twenty feet and, halting, yodeled again. Booted and trousered, a tall girl with her hair in pigtails appeared from behind the buttress and lowered herself into the chimney. Excellent, said Vijaya, approvingly as he watched her. Meanwhile, from a low building at the foot of the cliff, the tropical version evidently of an alpine hut, a group of young people had come out to see what was happening. They belonged, Will was told, to three other parties of climbers who had taken their post-elementary test earlier in the day. Does the best team win a prize? Will asked. Nobody wins anything, Vijaya answered. This isn't a competition. It's more like an ordeal. An ordeal, Dr. Robert explained, which is the first stage of their initiation out of childhood into adolescence. An ordeal that helps them to understand the world they'll have to live in, helps them to realise the omnipresence of death, the essential precariousness of all existence. But after the ordeal comes the revelation. In a few minutes these boys and girls will be given their first experience of the moksha medicine. They'll all take it together and there'll be a religious ceremony in the temple. Something like the confirmation service? Except that this is more than just a piece of theological rigmarole. Thanks to the moksha medicine, it includes an actual experience of the real thing. The real thing? Will shook his head. Is there such a thing? I wish I could believe it. You're not being asked to believe it, said Dr. Robert. The real thing isn't a proposition. It's a state of being. We don't teach our children creeds or get them worked up over emotionally charged symbols. When it's time for them to learn the deepest truths of religion, we set them to climb a precipice and then give them 400 milligrams of revelation. Two first-hand experiences of reality, from which any reasonably intelligent boy or girl can derive a very good idea of what's what. And don't forget the dear old power problem, said Vijaya. Rock climbing's a branch of applied ethics. It's another preventive substitute for bullying. So my father ought to have been an alpinist as well as a woodchopper. One may laugh, said Vijaya, duly laughing, but the fact remains that it works. It works. First and last, I've climbed my way out of literally scores of the ugliest temptations to throw my weight around, and my weight being considerable, he added, incitements were correspondingly strong. There seems to be only one catch, said Will. In the process of climbing your way out of temptation, you might fall, and... Suddenly remembering what had happened to Dugald MacPhail, he broke off. It was Dr. Robert who finished the sentence. Might fall, he said slowly, and kill yourself. Dugald was climbing alone, he went on after a little pause. Nobody knows what happened. The body wasn't found till the next day. And there was a long silence. Do you still think this is a good idea? Will asked, pointing with his bamboo staff at the tiny figures crawling so laboriously on the face of that headlong wilderness of naked rock. I still think it's a good idea, said Dr. Robert. But poor Susila. Yes, poor Susila, Dr. Robert repeated, and poor children. Poor Lakshmi, poor me. But if Dougald hadn't made a habit of risking his life, it might have been poor everybody for other reasons. Better caught the danger of killing yourself than caught the danger of killing other people, or at the very least making them miserable. Hurting them because you're naturally aggressive and too prudent, or too ignorant to work off your aggression on a precipice. And now, he continued in another tone, I want to show you the view. And I'll go and talk to those boys and girls. Vijaya walked away towards the group at the foot of the Red Crags. Leaving Murugan to his science fiction, Will followed Dr. Robert through a pillared gateway and across the wide stone platform that surrounded the temple. At one corner of this platform stood a small, domed pavilion. They entered and, crossing to the wide, unglazed window, looked out. Rising to the line of the horizon, like a solid wall of jade and lapis, was the sea. Below them, after a sheer fall of a thousand feet, lay the green of the jungle. Beyond the jungle, folded vertically into comb and buttress, terraced horizontally into a huge man-made staircase of innumerable fields, the lower slopes went steeply down into a wide plain, 
at whose furthest verge between the market gardens and the palm-fringed beach stretched a considerable city. Seen from this high vantage point in its shining completeness, it looked like the tiny, meticulous painting of a city in a medieval book of ours. "'There's Shivapuram,' said Dr. Robert, "'and that complex of buildings on the hill beyond the river, that's the great Buddhist temple. A little earlier than Boro Budur, and the sculpture is as fine as anything in further India.' And there was a silence. "'This little summer-house,' he resumed, "'is where we used to eat our picnics when it was raining. "'I shall never forget the time when Dugald, "'it must have been about ten, "'amused himself by climbing up here on the window-ledge "'and standing on one leg in the attitude of the dancing Shiva. "'Poor Lakshmi! "'She was scared out of her wits. "'But Dugald was a born steeplejack, "'which only makes the accident even more incomprehensible.' "'He shook his head. "'Then, after another silence, the last time we all came up here, he said, was eight or nine months ago. Dugald was still alive, and Lakshmi wasn't yet too weak for a day's outing with her grandchildren. He did that Shiva stunt again for the benefit of Tom Krishna and Mary Sarjini. On one leg, and he kept his arms moving so fast that one could have sworn there were four of them. Dr. Robert broke off. Picking up a flake of mortar from the floor, he tossed it out of the window. Down, down, down. Empty space. Pascal ave son gouffre. How strange that this should be at once the most powerful symbol of death and the most powerful symbol of the fullest, intensest life. Suddenly his face lighted up. Do you see that hawk? A hawk? Dr. Robert pointed to where, halfway between their airy and the dark roof of the forest, a small brown incarnation of speed and rapine lazily wheeled on unmoving wings. It reminds me of a poem that the old Raja once wrote about this place. Dr. Robert was silent for a moment, then started to recite. Up here, you ask me, up here aloft where Shiva dances above the world, what the devil do I think I'm doing? No answer, friend, except that hawk below us turning, those black and arrowy swifts trailing long silver wires across the air, the shrillness of their crime. How far, you say, from the hot plains? How far, reproachfully, from all my people? And yet how close? For here, between the cloudy sky and the sea below, suddenly visible, I read their luminous secret, and my own. And the secret, I take it, is this empty space. Or rather, what this empty space is the symbol of, the Buddha nature in all our perpetual perishing, which reminds me, he looked at his watch. What's next on the programme? Will asked as they stepped out into the glare. The service in the temple, Dr. Robert answered. The young climbers will offer their accomplishment to Shiva. In other words, to their own suchness, visualised as God. After which they'll go on to the second part of their initiation, the experience of being liberated from themselves. By means of the moksha medicine? Dr. Robert nodded. Their leaders give it them before they leave the climbing association's hut. Then they come over to the temple. The stuff starts working during the service. Incidentally, he added, the service is in Sanskrit, so you won't understand a word of it. Vijaya's address will be in English. He speaks in his capacity as president of the climbing association. So will mine. And of course the young people will mostly talk in English. Inside the temple there was a cool, cavernous darkness, tempered only by the faint daylight filtering in through a pair of small, latticed windows, and by the seven lamps that hung, like a halo of yellow quivering stars, above the head of the image on the altar. It was a copper statue, no taller than a child, of Shiva, surrounded by flame-fringed glory, his forearms gesturing, his braided hair wildly flying, his right foot treading down a dwarfish figure of the most hideous malignity, his left foot gracefully lifted, the gods stood there, frozen in mid-ecstasy. No longer in their climbing dress, but sandaled, bare-breasted, and in shorts or brightly coloured skirts, a score of boys and girls, together with the six young men who had acted as their leaders and instructors, were sitting cross-legged on the floor. Above them, on the highest of the altar steps, an old priest, shaven and yellow-robed, was intoning something sonorous and incomprehensible. Leaving Will installed on a convenient ledge, Dr. Robert tiptoed over to where Vijaya and Murugan were sitting and squatted down beside them. 
The splendid rumble of Sanskrit gave place to a high nasal chant, and the chanting in due course was succeeded by a litany, priestly utterance alternating with congregational response. And now incense was burned in a brass theorable. The old priest held up his two hands for silence, and through a long, pregnant time of the most perfect stillness, the thread of grey incense smoke rose straight and unwavering before the god. Then, as it met the draught from the windows, broke and was lost to view in an invisible cloud that filled the whole dim space with the mysterious fragrance of another world. Will opened his eyes and saw that, alone of all the congregation, Murugan was restlessly fidgeting. And not merely fidgeting, making faces of impatient disapproval. He himself had never climbed, therefore climbing was merely silly. He himself had always refused to try the moksha medicine, therefore those who used it were beyond the pale. His mother believed in the ascended masters, and chatted regularly with Kut Humi, therefore the image of Shiva was a vulgar idol. What an eloquent pantomime, Will thought, as he watched the boy. But alas for poor little Murugan, nobody was paying the slightest attention to his antics. Shiva Yanama, said the old priest, breaking the long silence. And again, Shiva Yanama, he made a beckoning gesture. Rising from her place, the tall girl whom Will had seen working her way down the precipice mounted the altar steps. Standing on tiptoe, her oiled body gleaming like a second copper statue in the light of the lamps, she hung a garland of pale yellow flowers on the uppermost of Shiva's two left arms. Then, laying palm to palm, she looked up into the god's serenely smiling face and in a voice that faltered at first but gradually grew steadier, began to speak. O oh, you the creator, you the destroyer, you who sustain and make an end, who in the sunlight dance among the birds and the children at their play, who at midnight dance among corpses in the burning grounds, you Shiva, you dark and terrible Bhairava, you suchness and illusion, the void and all things, you are the lord of life, and therefore I have brought you flowers. You are the lord of death, and therefore I have brought you my heart, this heart that is now your burning ground. Ignorance there and self shall be consumed with fire, that you may dance, Bhairava, among the ashes, that you may dance, Lord Shiva, in a place of flowers, and I dance with you. Raising her arms, the girl made a gesture that hinted at the ecstatic devotion of a hundred generations of dancing worshippers, then turned away and walked back into the twilight. Shiva Yanama, somebody cried out. Murugan snorted contemptuously as the refrain was taken up by other young voices. Shiva Yanama! Shiva Yanama! The old priest started to intone another passage from the scripture. Halfway through his recitation, a small grey bird with a crimson head flew in through one of the latticed windows, fluttered wildly around the altar lamps, then, chattering in loud, indignant terror, darted out again. The chanting continued, swelled to a climax, and ended in the whispered prayer for peace. Shanti, shanti, shanti. The old priest now turned towards the altar, picked up a long taper and, borrowing flame from one of the lamps above Shiva's head, proceeded to light several other lamps that hung within a deep niche beneath the slab on which the dancer stood. Glinting on polished convexities of metal, their light revealed another statue, this time of Shiva and Parvati, of the arch-yogin, seated and, while two of his four hands held aloft the symbolic drum and fire, caressing with a second pair the amorous goddess, with her twining legs and arms by whom in this eternal embrace of bronze he was best ridden. The old priest waved his hand. This time it was a boy, dark-skinned and powerfully muscled, who stepped into the light. Bending down, he hung the garland he was carrying about Parvati's neck, then, twisting the long flower chain, dropped a second loop of white orchids over Shiva's head. Each is both, he said. Each is both, the chorus of young voices repeated. Murugan violently shook his head. Oh, you who are gone, said the dark-skinned boy, who are gone, who are gone to the other shore, who have landed on the other shore. O oh, you enlightenment and you other enlightenment, you liberation made one with liberation, you compassion in the arms of infinite compassion. Shivayanama. He went back to his place. There was a long silence. Then Vijaya rose to his feet and began to speak. Danger, 
he said. And again, Danger! Danger deliberately and yet lightly accepted. Danger shared with a friend, a group of friends. Shared consciously, shared to the limits of awareness so that the sharing and the danger become a yoga. Two friends roped together on a rock face. Sometimes three friends, or four. Each totally aware of his own straining muscles, his own skill, his own fear, and his own spirit transcending the fear. And each, of course, aware at the same time of all the others, concerned for them, doing the right things to make sure that they'll be safe. Life at its highest pitch of bodily and mental tension, life more abundant, more inestimably precious because of the ever-present threat of death. But after the yoga of danger, there's the yoga of the summit, the yoga of rest and letting go, the yoga of complete and total receptiveness, the yoga that consists in consciously accepting what is given as it is given, without censorship by your busy moralistic mind, without any additions from your stock of second-hand ideals, your even larger stock of wishful fantasies. You just sit there with muscles relaxed and a mind open to the sunlight and the clouds, open to distance and the horizon, open in the end to that formless, wordless, not thought, which the stillness of the summit permits you to divine, profound and enduring, within the twittering flux of your everyday thinking. And now it's time for the descent, time for a second bout of the yoga of danger, time for a renewal of tension and the awareness of life in its glowing plenitude as you hang precariously on the brink of destruction. Then at the foot of the precipice you unrope, you go striding down the rocky path toward the first trees, and suddenly you're in the forest, and another kind of yoga is called for, the yoga of the jungle, the yoga that consists of being totally aware of life at the near point, jungle life in all its exuberance and its rotting, crawling squalor, all its melodramatic ambivalence of orchids and centipedes, of leeches and sunbirds, of the drinkers of nectar and the drinkers of blood. Life bringing order out of chaos and ugliness. Life performing its miracles of birth and growth, but performing them, it seems, for no other purpose than to destroy itself. Beauty and horror. Beauty, he repeated, and horror. And then suddenly, as you come down from one of your expeditions in the mountains, suddenly you know that there's a reconciliation. And not merely a reconciliation, a fusion, an identity. Beauty made one with horror in the yoga of the jungle. Life reconciled with the perpetual imminence of death in the yoga of danger. Emptiness identified with selfhood in the Sabbath yoga of the summit. There was silence. Murugan yawned ostentatiously. The old priest lighted another stick of incense and, muttering, waved it before the dancer, waved it again around the cosmic love-making of Shiva and the goddess. Breathe deeply, said Vijaya. And as you breathe, pay attention to this smell of incense. Pay your whole attention to it. Know it for what it is, an ineffable fact beyond words, beyond reason and explanation. Know it in the raw. Know it as a mystery. Perfume, women and prayer. Those were the three things that Mohammed loved above all others. The inexplicable data of breathed incense, touched skin, felt love. And beyond them, the mystery of mysteries, the one in plurality the emptiness that is all, the suchness totally present in every appearance at every point and instant. So breathe, he repeated, breathe. And in a final whisper as he sat down, breathe. Shiva Yanama, murmured the old priest ecstatically. Dr. Robert rose and started towards the altar, then halted, turned back, and beckoned to Will Farnaby. Come and sit with me he whispered, when Will had caught up with him. I'd like you to see their faces. Shan't I be in the way? Dr. Robert shook his head, and together they moved forward, climbed, and three quarters of the way up the altar stair, sat down side by side in the penumbra between darkness and the light of the lamps. Very quietly, Dr. Robert began to talk about Shiva Nataraja, the lord of the dance. Look at his image, he said. Look at it with his new eyes that the moksha medicine has given you. See how it breathes and pulses? See how it grows out of brightness into brightness ever more intense? Dancing through time and out of time, dancing everlastingly and in the eternal now. 
dancing and dancing in all the worlds at once. Look at him. Scanning those upturned faces, Will noted, now in one, now in the other, the dawning illuminations of delight, recognition, understanding, the signs of worshipping wonder that quivered on the brinks of ecstasy or terror. Look closely, Dr. Robert insisted. Look still more closely. Then after a long minute of silence, Dancing in all the worlds at once, he repeated, in all the worlds, and first of all, in the world of matter. Look at the great round halo, fringed with the symbols of fire, within which the god is dancing. It stands for nature, for the world of mass and energy. Within it, Shiva Nataraja dances the dance of endless becoming and passing away. It's his Leela, his cosmic play, playing for the sake of playing like a child. For this child is the order of things. His toys are galaxies, his playground is infinite space, and between finger and finger every interval is a thousand million light years. Look at him there on the altar. The image is man-made, a little contraption of copper only four feet high. But Shiva Nataraja fills the universe, is the universe. Shut your eyes and see him towering into the night. Follow the boundless stretch of those arms and the wild hair infinitely flying. Nataraja at play among the stars and in the atoms, but also, he added, also at play within every living thing, every sentient creature, every child and man and woman. Play for play's sake. But now the playground is conscious. The dance floor is capable of suffering. To us this play without purpose seems a kind of insult. What we would really like is a god who never destroys what he has created. Or if there must be pain and death, let them be meted out by a god of righteousness, who will punish the wicked and reward the good with everlasting happiness. But in fact, the good get hurt. The innocent suffer. Then let there be a god who sympathizes and brings comfort. But Nataraja only dances. His play is a play impartially of death and of life, of all evils as well as of all goods. In the uppermost of his right hands he holds the drum that summons being out of non-being. Rubber dub dub the creation tattoo, the cosmic revali. But now look at the uppermost of his left hands. It brandishes the fire by which all that has been created is forthwith destroyed. He dances this way. What happiness? Dances that way, and oh, the pain, the hideous fear, the desolation. Then hop, skip, and jump. Hop into perfect health. Skip into cancer and senility. Jump out of the fullness of life into nothingness. Out of nothingness again into life. For Nataraja it's all play, and the play is an end in itself, everlastingly purposeless. He dances because he dances, and the dancing is his Mahasuka, his infinite and eternal bliss, eternal bliss. Dr. Robert repeated and again, but questioningly, eternal bliss? He shook his head. For us there's no bliss, only the oscillation between happiness and terror and a sense of outrage at the thought that our pains are as integral a part of Nataraja's dance as our pleasures, our dying as our living. Let's quietly think about that for a little while. The seconds passed. The silence deepened. Suddenly, startlingly, one of the girls began to sob. Vijaya left his place and, kneeling down beside her, laid a hand on her shoulder. The sobbing died down. Suffering and sickness, Dr. Robert resumed at last. Old age, decrepitude, death. I show you sorrow. But that wasn't the only thing the Buddha showed us. He also showed us the ending of sorrow. Shiva Yanama, the old priest cried triumphantly. Open your eyes again and look at Nararaja up there on the altar. Look closely. In his upper right hand, as you've already seen, he holds the drum that calls the world into existence, and in his upper left hand he carries the destroying fire. Life and death, order and disintegration, impartially. 
But now look at Shiva's other pair of hands. The lower right hand is raised and the palm is turned outwards. What does that gesture signify? It signifies, don't be afraid, it's all right. But how can anyone in his senses fail to be afraid? How can anyone pretend that evil and suffering are all right when it's so obvious that they're all wrong? Nataraja has the answer. Look now at his lower left hand. He's using it to point down at his feet. And what are his feet doing? Look closely and you'll see that the right foot is planted squarely on a horrible little subhuman creature, the demon Muyalaka, a dwarf, but immensely powerful in his malignity. Muyalaka is the embodiment of ignorance, the manifestation of greedy, possessive selfhood. Stamp on him. Break his back. And that's precisely what Nataraja is doing, trampling the little monster down under his right foot. But notice that it isn't at this trampling right foot that he points his finger. It's at the left foot, the foot that as he dances, he's in the act of raising from the ground. And why does he point at it? Why? That lifted foot, that dancing defiance of the force of gravity, it's the symbol of release, of moksha, of liberation. Nataraja dances in all the worlds at once, in the world of physics and chemistry, in the world of ordinary, all-too-human experience, in the world, finally, of suchness, of mind, of the clear light. And now, Dr. Robert went on after a moment of silence, I want you to look at the other statue the image of Shiva and the goddess. Look at them there in their little cave of light, and now shut your eyes and see them again, shining, alive, glorified. How beautiful! And in their tenderness, what depths of meaning, what wisdom beyond all spoken wisdoms in that sensual experience of spiritual fusion and atonement, eternity in love with time, the one joined in marriage to the many, the relative made absolute by its union with the one, nirvana identified with samsara, the manifestation in time and flesh and feeling of the Buddha nature. Shivaya Nama! The old priest lighted another stick of incense and softly, in a succession of long-drawn melismata, began to chant something in Sanskrit. On the young faces before him Will could read the marks of a listening serenity, the hardly perceptible, ecstatic smile that welcomes a sudden insight, a revelation of truth or of beauty. In the background, meanwhile, Murugan sat wearily slumped against a pillar, picking his exquisitely Grecian nose. Liberation, Dr. Robert began again, the ending of sorrow, ceasing to be what you ignorantly think you are and becoming what you are in fact. For a little while, thanks to the moksha medicine, you will know what it's like to be what in fact you are, what in fact you always have been. What a timeless bliss. But, like everything else, this timelessness is transient. Like everything else, it will pass. And when it has passed, what will you do with this experience? What will you do with all the other similar experiences that the moksha medicine will bring you in the years to come? Will you merely enjoy them as you would enjoy an evening at the puppet show, and then go back to business as usual, back to behaving like the silly delinquents you imagine yourselves to be? Or having glimpsed, will you devote your lives to the business, not at all as usual, of being what you are in fact? All that we older people can do with our teachings, all that Pala can do for you with its social arrangements, is to provide you with techniques and opportunities, and all that moksha medicine can do is to give you a succession of beatific glimpses, an hour or two, every now and then, of enlightening and liberating grace. It remains for you to decide whether you'll cooperate with the grace and take those opportunities. But that's for the future. Here and now, all you have to do is to follow the minor bird's advice. Attention. Pay attention and you'll find yourselves gradually or suddenly becoming aware of the great primordial facts behind these symbols on the altar. Shivaya Nama, the old priest waved his stick of incense. At the foot of the altar steps the boys and girls sat motionless as statues. A door creaked. There was a sound of footsteps. Will turned his head and saw a short, thick-set man picking his way between the young contemplatives. He mounted the steps and... Bending down, 
murmured something in Dr. Robert's ear, then turned and walked back towards the door. Dr. Robert laid a hand on Will's knee. It's a royal command, he whispered, with a smile and a shrug of the shoulders. That was the man in charge of the Alpine hut. The Rani has just telephoned to say that she has to see Murugan as soon as possible. It's urgent. Laughing noiselessly, he rose and helped Will to his feet. 11. Will Farnaby had made his own breakfast, and when Dr. Robert returned from his early morning visit to the hospital, was drinking his second cup of Palinese tea and eating toasted breadfruit with pumelo marmalade. Not too much pain in the night, was Dr. Robert's response to his inquiries. Lakshmi had four or five hours of good sleep. From this morning she was able to take some broth. They could look forward, he continued, to another day of respite. And so, since it tired the patient to have him there all the time, and since life, after all, had to go on and be made the best of, he had decided to drive up to the high-altitude station and put in a few hours' work on the research team in the pharmaceutical laboratory. Work on the moksha medicine? Dr. Robert shook his head. That's just a matter of repeating a standard operation. Something for technicians, not for researchers. They're busy with something new. And he began to talk about the indoles recently isolated from the ololiqui seeds that had been brought in from Mexico last year, and were now being grown in the station's botanic garden. At least three different indoles, of which one seemed to be extremely potent. Animal experiments indicated that it affected the reticular system. Left to himself, Will sat down under the overhead fan and went on with his reading of the notes on what's what. We cannot reason ourselves out of our basic irrationality. All we can do is to learn the art of being irrational in a reasonable way. In parlour, after three generations of reform, there are no sheep-like flocks and no ecclesiastical good shepherds to shear and castrate. There are no bovine or swinish herds and no licensed drovers, royal or military, capitalistic or revolutionary, to brand, confine and butcher. There are only voluntary associations of men and women on the road to full humanity. Tunes or pebbles? Processes or substantial things? Tunes answer Buddhism and modern science. Pebbles say the classical philosophers of the West. Buddhism and modern science think of the world in terms of music. The image that comes to mind when one reads the philosophers of the West is a figure in a Byzantine mosaic, rigid, symmetrical, made up of millions of little squares of some stony material and firmly cemented to the walls of a windowless basilica. The dancer's grace and, forty years on, her arthritis, both are functions of the skeleton. It is thanks to an inflexible framework of bones that the girl is able to do her pirouettes, thanks to the same bones, grown a little rusty, that the grandmother is condemned to a wheelchair. Analogously, the firm support of a culture is the prime condition of all individual originality and creativeness. It is also their principal enemy. The thing in whose absence we cannot possibly grow into a complete human being is, all too often, the thing that prevents us from growing. A century of research on the moksha medicine has clearly shown that quite ordinary people are perfectly capable of having visionary or even fully liberating experiences. In this respect, the men and women who make and enjoy high culture are no better off than the lowbrows. High experience is perfectly compatible with low symbolic expression. The expressive symbols created by Polynesian artists are no better than the expressive symbols created by artists everywhere. Being the products of happiness and a sense of fulfilment, they are probably less moving, perhaps less satisfying aesthetically, than the tragic or compensatory symbols created by victims of frustration and ignorance, of tyranny, war, and guilt-fostering, crime-inciting superstitions. Polynes' superiority does not lie in symbolic expression, but in an art which, though higher and far more valuable than all the rest, can yet be practised by everyone. The art of adequately experiencing, the art of becoming more intimately acquainted with all the worlds that, as human beings, we find ourselves inhabiting. Polynes culture is not to be judged as, for lack of any better criterion, we judge other cultures. It is not to be judged by the accomplishments of a few gifted manipulators of artistic or philosophical symbols. 
No, it is to be judged by what all the members of the community, the ordinary as well as the extraordinary, can and do experience in every contingency and at each successive intersection of time and eternity. The telephone bell had started to ring. Should he let it ring, or would it be better to answer and let the caller know that Dr. Robert was out for the day? Deciding on the second course, Will lifted the receiver. Dr. MacPhail's bungalow, he said in a parody of secretarial efficiency, but the doctor is out for the day. Tant mieux, said the rich royal voice at the other end of the wire. How are you, mon cher Farnaby? Taken aback, Will stammered out his thanks for Her Highness's gracious inquiry. So they took you, said the Rani, to see one of their so-called initiations yesterday afternoon. Will had recovered sufficiently from his surprise to respond with a neutral word and in the most non-committal of tones. It was most remarkable, he said. Remarkable, said the Rani, dwelling emphatically on the spoken equivalents of pejorative and laudatory capital letters but only as the blasphemous caricature of true initiation. They've never learned to make the elementary distinction between the natural order and the supernatural. Quite, Will murmured. Quite. What did you say? The voice at the other end of the line demanded. Quite, Will repeated more loudly. I'm glad you agree, but I didn't call you the Rani went on, to discuss the difference between the natural and the supernatural. Supremely important, as that difference is. No, I called you about a more urgent matter. Oil? Oil, she confirmed. I've just received a very disquieting communication from my personal representative in Rendang. Very highly placed, she added parenthetically, and invariably well informed. Will found himself wondering which of all those sleek and much bemedalled guests at the Foreign Office cocktail party had double-crossed his fellow double-crossers, himself, of course, included. Within the last few days, the Rani went on, representatives of no less than the three major oil companies, European and American, have flown into Rendang Lobo. My informant tells me that they're already working on the four or five key figures in the administration who might at some future date be influential in deciding who is to get the concession for parlour. Will clicked his tongue disapprovingly. Considerable sums, she hinted, had been, if not directly offered, at least named and temptingly dangled. Nefarious, he commented. Nefarious, the Rani agreed, was the word. And that was why something must be done about it, and done immediately. From Bahu she had learned that Will had already written to Lord Aldehyde, and within a few days a reply would doubtless be forthcoming. But a few days were too long. Time was of the essence, not only because of what those rival companies were up to, but also, and Rani lowered her voice mysteriously, for other reasons. Now, now, her little voice kept exhorting, now without delay. Lord Alderhyde must be informed by cable of what was happening. The faithful Bahu, she added parenthetically, had offered to transmit the message in code by way of the Rendang legation in London. And along with the information must go an urgent request that he empower his special correspondent to take such steps. At this stage the appropriate steps would be predominantly of a financial nature, as might be necessary to secure the triumph of their common cause. So, with your permission, the voice concluded, I'll tell Bahu to send the cable immediately. In our joint names, Mr. Farnaby, yours and mine. I hope, mon cher, that this will be agreeable to you. It wasn't at all agreeable, but there seemed to be no excuse, seeing that he had already written that letter to Joe Alderhyde for demurring. And so, yes, of course, he cried, with a show of enthusiasm, belied by his long, dubious pause, before the words were uttered, in search of an alternative answer. We ought to get the reply sometime tomorrow, he added. We shall get it tonight, the Rani assured him. Is that possible? With God, con espressione, all things are possible. Quite, he said. Quite, but still, I go by what my little voice tells me. Tonight, it's saying, and he will give Mr. Farnaby carte blanche. Carte blanche, she repeated with gusto. 
and Farnaby will be completely successful. I wonder, he said doubtfully, you must be successful. Must be? Must be, she insisted. Why? Because it was God who inspired me to launch the crusade of the spirit. I don't quite get the connection. Perhaps I oughtn't to tell you, she said. Then, after a moment of silence, but after all, why not? If our cause triumphs, Lord Alderhyde has promised to back the crusade with all his resources. And since God wants the crusade to succeed, our cause cannot fail to triumph. QED, he wanted to shout, but restrained himself. It wouldn't be polite. And anyhow, this was no joking matter. Well, I must call Bahu, said the Rani. Abianto, my dear Farnaby. And she rang off. Shrugging his shoulders, Will turned back to the notes on what's what. What else was there to do? Dualism. Without it, there can hardly be good literature. With it, there most certainly can be no good life. I affirms a separate and abiding me substance. Am denies the fact that all existence is relationship and change. I am. Two tiny words, but what an enormity of untruth. The religiously-minded dualist calls homemade spirits from the vasty deep. The non-dualist calls the vasty deep into his spirit, or, to be more accurate, he finds that the vasty deep is already there. There was the noise of an approaching car, then silence as the motor was turned off, then the slamming of a door and the sound of footsteps on gravel, on the steps of the veranda. "'Are you ready?' called Vijaya's deep voice. Will put down the notes on what's what, picked up his bamboo staff, and hoisting himself to his feet, walked to the front door. "'Ready and champing at the bit,' he said as he stepped out onto the veranda. "'Then let's go,' Vijaya took his arm. "'Careful of these steps,' he recommended. Dressed all in pink and with corals round her neck and in her ears, a plump, round-faced woman in her middle forties was standing beside the jeep. "'This is Leela Rao,' said Vijaya. "'Our librarian, secretary, treasurer, and general keeper in order. Without her we'd be lost.' She looked, Will thought as he shook hands with her, like a browner version of one of those gentle but inexhaustibly energetic English ladies who— when their children are grown, go in for good works or organised culture. Not too intelligent, poor dears, but how selfless, how devoted and genuinely good, and, alas, how boring. I was hearing of you, Mrs. Rao volunteered as they rattled along past the lotus pond and out onto the highway, from my young friends Radha and Ranga. I hope, said Will, that they approved of me as heartily as I approved of them. Mrs. Rao's face brightened with pleasure. I am so glad you like them. Ranga's exceptionally bright, Vijaya put in. And so delicately balanced, Mrs. Rao elaborated, between introversion and the outside world. Always tempted, and how strongly, to escape from the Arhat's nirvana or the scientist's beautifully tidy little paradise of pure abstraction, always tempted but often resisting temptation, for Ranga, the Arhat scientist, was also another kind of Ranga, a Ranga capable of compassion, ready, if one knew how to make the right kind of appeal, to lay himself open to the concrete realities of life, to be aware, concerned, and actively helpful. How fortunate for him, and for everyone else, that he had found a girl like little Radha, a girl so intelligently simple, so humorous and tender, so richly endowed for love and happiness. Radha and Ranga, Mrs. Rao confided, had been among her favourite pupils. Pupils, Will patronisingly assumed, in some kind of Buddhist Sunday school. But in fact, as he was now flabbergasted to learn, it was in the yoga of love that this devoted settlement worker had been for the past six years, and in the intervals of librarianship, instructing the young. By the kinds of methods, Will supposed, that Murugan had shrunk from, and the Rani in all her incestuous possessiveness had found so outrageous. He opened his mouth to question her, but his reflexes had been conditioned in higher latitude and by settlement workers of another species. The questions simply refused to pass his lips. And now it was too late to ask them. Mrs. Rao had begun to talk about her other avocation, if you knew, she was saying, what trouble we have with books in this climate. 
the paper rots, the glue liquefies, the bindings disintegrate, the insects devour. Literature and the tropics are really incompatible. And if one's to believe your old Roger, said Will, literature is incompatible with a lot of other local features besides your climate. Incompatibility with human integrity. Incompatible with philosophical truth. Incompatible with individual sanity and a decent social system. Incompatible with everything except dualism, criminal lunacy, impossible aspiration, and unnecessary guilt. But never mind, he grinned ferociously. Colonel Deeper will put everything right. After Pala has been invaded and made safe for war and oil and heavy industry, you'll undoubtedly have a golden age of literature and theology. I'd like to laugh, said Vijaya. The only trouble is that you're probably right. I have an uncomfortable feeling that my children will grow up to see your prophecy come true. They left their jeep, parked between an ox cart and a brand new Japanese lorry, at the entrance to the village, and proceeded on foot. Between thatched houses, set in gardens shaded by palms and papayas and breadfruit trees, the narrow street led to a central marketplace. Will halted and, leaning on his bamboo staff, looked around him. On one side of the square stood a charming piece of oriental rococo, with a pink stucco facade and gazebos at the four corners, evidently the town hall. Facing it, on the opposite side of the square, rose a small temple of reddish stone with a central tower on which, tier after tier, a host of sculptured figures recounted the legends of the Buddha's progress from spoiled child to Tathagata. Between these two monuments, more than half of the open space was covered by a huge banyan tree. Along its winding and shadowy aisles were ranged the stalls of a score of merchants and market women. Slanting down through chinks in the green vaulting overhead, the long probes of sunlight picked out here a row of black and yellow water jars, there a silver bracelet, a painted wooden toy, a bolt of cotton print. Here a pile of fruits and a girl's gaily flowered bodice, there the flash of laughing teeth and eyes, the ruddy gold of a naked torso. Everybody looks so healthy, Will commented, as they made their way between the stalls under the great tree. They look healthy because they are healthy, said Mrs. Rao. And happy, for a change. He was thinking of the faces he had seen in Calcutta, in Manila, in Rendang Lobo, the faces, for that matter, one saw every day in Fleet Street and the Strand. Even the women, he noted, glancing from face to face, even the women look happy. They don't have ten children, Mrs. Rao explained. They don't have ten children where I come from, said Will, in spite of which, marks of weakness, marks of woe. He halted for a moment to watch a middle-aged market woman weighing out slices of sun-dried breadfruit for a very young mother with a baby in a carrying bag on her back. There's a kind of radiance, he concluded. Thanks to my tuna, said Mrs. Rao, triumphantly. Thanks to the yoga of love. Her face shone with a mixture of religious fervor and professional pride. They walked out from under the shade of the banyan, across a stretch of fierce sunlight, up a flight of worn steps, and into the gloom of the temple. A golden bodhisattva loomed gigantic out of the darkness. There was a smell of incense and fading flowers, and from somewhere behind the statue the voice of an unseen worshipper was muttering an endless litany. Noiselessly, on bare feet, a little girl came hurrying in from a side door. Paying no attention to the grown-ups, she climbed with the agility of a cat onto the altar and laid a spray of white orchids on the statue's upturned palm. Then, looking up into the huge golden face, she murmured a few words, shut her eyes for a moment, murmured again, then turned, scrambled down, and softly, singing to herself, went out by the door through which she had entered. Charming, said Will, as he watched her go. Couldn't be prettier. But precisely what does a child like that think she's doing? What kind of religion is she supposed to be practising? She's practising, Vijaya explained, the local brand of Mahayana Buddhism, with a bit of Shivaism probably on the side. And do you highbrows encourage this kind of thing? We neither encourage nor discourage. We accept it. Accept it as we accept that spider web up there on the cornice. Given the nature of spiders, webs are inevitable, and given the nature of human beings, so are religions. Spiders can't help making fly traps, and men can't help making symbols. That's what the human brain is there for to turn the chaos of given experience into a set of manageable symbols. 
Sometimes the symbols correspond fairly closely to some of the aspects of the external reality behind our experience, then you have science and common sense. Sometimes, on the contrary, the symbols have almost no connection with external reality. Then you have paranoia and delirium. More often there's a mixture, part realistic and part fantastic. That's religion. Good religion or bad religion, it depends on the blending of the cocktail. For example, in the kind of Calvinism that Dr. Andrew was brought up in, you're given only the tiniest jigger of realism to a whole jug full of malignant fancy. In other cases, the mixture is more wholesome, 50-50, or even 60-40, even 70-30 in favour of truth and decency. Our local old-fashioned contains a remarkably small admixture of poison. Will nodded. Offerings of white orchids to an image of compassion and enlightenment. It certainly seems harmless enough. And after what I saw yesterday, I'd be prepared to put in a good word for cosmic dancing and divine copulation. And remember, said Vijaya, this sort of thing isn't compulsory. Everybody's given a chance to go further. You asked what that child thinks she's doing. I'll tell you. With one part of her mind, she thinks she's talking to a person, an enormous, divine person who can be conjoled with orchids into giving her what she wants. But she's already old enough to have been told about the profounder symbols behind Amitabha's statue and about the experiences that give birth to those profounder symbols. Consequently, with another part of her mind, she knows perfectly well that Amitabha isn't a person. She even knows, because it's been explained to her, that if prayers are sometimes answered, it's because, in this very odd, psychophysical world of ours, ideas have a tendency, if you concentrate your mind on them, to get themselves realised. She knows, too, that this temple isn't what she still likes to think it is, the house of Buddha. She knows it's just a diagram of her own unconscious mind, a dark little cubbyhole with lizards crawling upside down on the ceiling and cockroaches in all the crevices. But at the heart of the verminous darkness sits enlightenment. And that's another thing the child is doing. She's unconsciously learning a lesson about herself. She's being told that if she'd only stop giving herself suggestions to the contrary, she might discover that her own busy little mind is also mind with a large M. And how soon will the lesson be learned? When will she stop giving herself those suggestions? She may never learn. A lot of people don't. On the other hand, a lot of people do. He took Will's arm and led him into the deeper darkness, behind the image of enlightenment. The chanting grew more distinct, and there, hardly visible in the shadows, sat the chanter, a very old man, naked to the waist, and, except for his moving lips, as rigidly still as Amitabha's golden statue. "'What's he intoning?' Will asked. "'Something in Sanskrit.' Seven incomprehensible syllables, again and again. Good old vain repetition. Not necessarily vain, Mrs. Rao objected. Sometimes it really gets you somewhere. It gets you somewhere, Vijaya elaborated, not because of what the words mean or suggest, but simply because they're being repeated. You could repeat Hey Diddle Diddle, and it would work just as well as Om, or Kyrie Eleison, or La Illa Illa La. It works because when you're busy with the repetition of Hey Diddle Diddle, or the name of God, you can't be entirely preoccupied with yourself. The only trouble is that you can hey diddle diddle yourself downwards as well as upwards, down into the not thought of idiocy as well as up into the not thought of pure awareness. So I take it you wouldn't recommend this kind of thing, said Will, to our little friend with the orchids. Not unless she were unusually jittery or anxious, which she isn't. I know her very well. She plays with my children. Then what would you do in her case? Among other things, said Vijaya, I'd take her, in another year or so, to the place we're going to now. What place? The meditation room. Will followed him through an archway and along a short corridor. Heavy curtains were parted and they stepped into a large whitewashed room with a long window to their left that opened onto a little garden planted with banana and breadfruit trees. There was no furniture, only a scattering on the floor of small square cushions. On the wall opposite the window hung a large oil painting. Will gave it a glance, then approached to look into it more closely. My word, he said at last. Who is it by? Gobind Singh. And who is Gobind Singh? The best landscape painter parlor ever produced. He died in 48. 
Why haven't we ever seen anything by him? Because we like his work too well to export any of it. Good for you, said Will, but bad for us. He looked again at the picture. Did this man ever go to China? No, but he studied with a Cantonese painter who was living in Pala, and of course he'd seen plenty of reproductions of song landscapes. A song master, said Will, who chose to paint in oils, and was interested in chiaroscuro. Only after he went to Paris, that was in 1910, he struck up a friendship with Fouillard. Will nodded. One might have guessed as much from this extraordinary richness of texture. He went on looking at the picture in silence. Why do you hang it in the meditation room? He asked at last. Why do you suppose? Vijaya countered. Is it because this thing is what you call a diagram of the mind? The temple was a diagram. This is something much better. It's an actual manifestation. A manifestation of mind with a large M in an individual mind in relation to a landscape, to canvas and to the experience of painting. It's a picture, incidentally, of the next valley to the west, painted from the place where the power lines disappear over the ridge. What clouds, said Will, and the light. The light, Vijaya elaborated, of the last hour before dusk. It's just stopped raining and the sun has come out again brighter than ever, bright with the preternatural brightness of slanting light under a ceiling of cloud, the last doomed afternoon brightness that stipples every surface it touches and deepens every shadow. Deepens every shadow, Will repeated to himself as he looked into the picture. The shadow of that huge high continent of cloud, darkening whole mountain ranges almost to blackness, and in the middle distance the shadows of island clouds, and between dark and dark was the blaze of young rice or the red heat of ploughed earth, the incandescence of naked limestone, the sumptuous darks and diamond glitter of evergreen foliage. And here, at the centre of the valley, stood a group of thatched houses, remote and tiny, but how clearly seen, how perfect and articulate, how profoundly significant. Yes, significant. But when you asked yourself, of what, you found no answer. We'll put the question into words. What do they mean? Vijaya repeated. They mean precisely what they are, and so do the mountains, so do the clouds, so do the lights and darks, and that's why this is a genuinely religious image. Pseudo-religious pictures always refer to something else, something beyond the things they represent, some piece of metaphysical nonsense, some absurd dogma from the local theology. A genuinely religious image is always intrinsically meaningful, so that's why we hang this kind of painting in our meditation room. Always landscapes? Almost always. Landscapes can really remind people of who they are. Better than scenes from the life of a saint or saviour? Vijayan nodded. It's the difference, to begin with, between objective and subjective. A picture of Christ or Buddha is merely the record of something observed by a behaviourist and interpreted by a theologian. But when you're confronted with a landscape like this, it's psychologically impossible for you to look at it with the eyes of a J.B. Watson or the mind of a Thomas Aquinas. You're almost forced to submit to your immediate experience. You're practically compelled to perform an act of self-knowing. Self-knowing? Self-knowing, Vijaya insisted. This view of the next valley is a view at one remove of your own mind, of everybody's mind as it exists above and below the level of personal history. Mysteries of darkness, but the darkness teems with life. Apocalypses of light, and the light shines out as brightly from the flimsy little houses as from the trees, the grass, the blue spaces between the clouds. We do our best to disprove the fact, but a fact it remains. Man is as divine as nature, as infinite as the void. But that's getting perilously close to theology, and nobody was ever saved by a notion. Stick to the data, stick to the concrete facts. He pointed a finger at the picture. The fact of half a village in sunshine, and half in shadow and in secret. The fact of those indigo mountains, and of the more fantastic mountains of vapour above them. The fact of blue lakes in the sky, lakes of pale green and raw sienna on the sunlit earth. The fact of this grass in the foreground, this clump of bamboos only a few yards down the slope, and the fact, at the same time, of those faraway peaks and the absurd little houses two thousand feet below in the valley. 
Distance, he added parenthetically, their ability to express the fact of distance. That's yet another reason why landscapes are the most genuinely religious pictures. Because distance lends enchantment to the view? No, because it lends reality. Distance reminds us that there's a lot more to the universe than just people, that there's even a lot more to people than just people. It reminds us that there are mental spaces inside our skulls as enormous as the spaces out there. The experience of distance, of inner distance and outer distance, of distance in time and distance in space, it's the first and fundamental religious experience. O oh, death in life, the days that are no more. And oh, the places, the infinite number of places that are not this place. Past pleasures, past unhappinesses and insights, all so intensely alive in our memories and yet all dead, dead without hope of resurrection. And the village down there in the valley, so clearly seen even in the shadow, so real and indubitable, and yet so hopelessly out of reach, incommunicado. A picture like this is the proof of man's capacity to accept all the deaths in life, all the yawning absences surrounding every presence. To my mind, Vijaya added, the worst feature of your non-representational art is its systematic two-dimensionality, its refusal to take account of the universal experience of distance. As a coloured object, a piece of abstract expressionism can be very handsome. It can also serve as a kind of glorified Rorschach ink blot. Everybody can find in it a symbolic expression of his own fears, lusts, hatreds and daydreams. But can one ever find in it those more than human, or should one say those other than all too human facts, that one discovers in oneself when the mind is confronted by the outer distances of nature, or by the simultaneously inner and outer distances of a painted landscape like this one we're looking at? All I know is that in your abstractions I don't find the realities that reveal themselves here and I doubt if anyone else can. Which is why this fashionable, abstract, non-objective expressionism of yours is so fundamentally irreligious. And also, I may add, why even the best of it is so profoundly boring, so bottomlessly trivial. Do you come here often? Will asked after a silence. Whenever I feel like meditating in a group rather than alone. How often is that? Once every week or so. But of course some people like to do it oftener, and some much more rarely, or even never. It depends on one's temperament. Take our friend Susila, for example. She needs big doses of solitude, so she hardly ever comes to the meditation room, whereas Ashanta, that's my wife, likes to look in here almost every day. So do I, said Mrs. Rao. But that's only to be expected, she added with a laugh. Fat people enjoy company, even when they're meditating. And do you meditate on this picture? Will asked. Not on it, from it, if you see what I mean, or rather parallel with it. I look at it and the other people look at it, and it reminds us all of who we are and what we aren't, and how what we aren't might turn into who we are. Is there any connection, Will asked, between what you've been talking about and what I saw up there in the Shiva temple? Of course there is, she answered, the moksha medicine takes you to the same place as you get to in meditation. So why bother to meditate? You might as well ask, why bother to eat your dinner? But according to you, the moksha medicine is dinner. It's a banquet, she said emphatically, and that's precisely why there has to be meditation. You can't have banquets every day. They're too rich and they last too long. Besides, banquets are provided by a caterer. You don't have any part in the preparation of them. For your everyday diet, you have to do your own cooking. The moksha medicine comes as an occasional treat. In theological terms, said Vijaya, the moksha medicine prepares one for the reception of gratuitous graces, pre-mystical visions or the full-blown mystical experiences. Meditation is one of the ways in which one cooperates with those gratuitous graces. How? by cultivating the state of mind that makes it possible for the dazzling ecstatic insights to become permanent and habitual illuminations, by getting to know oneself to the point where one won't be compelled by one's unconscious to do all the ugly, absurd, self-stultifying things that one so often finds oneself doing. You mean it helps one to be more intelligent? Not more intelligent in relation to science or logical argument more intelligent on the deeper level of concrete experiences 
and personal relationships. "'More intelligent on that level,' said Mrs. Ra, "'even though one may be very stupid upstairs.' She patted the top of her head. "'I'm too dumb to be any good at the things that Dr. Robert and Vijaya are good at, "'genetics and biochemistry and philosophy and all the rest, "'and I'm no good at painting or poetry or acting, "'no talents and no cleverness, "'so I ought to feel horribly inferior and depressed. "'But in fact I don't, "'thanks entirely to the moksha medicine and meditation. "'No talents or cleverness, "'but when it comes to living, "'when it comes to understanding people and helping them, "'I feel myself growing more and more sensitive and skilful. "'And when it comes to what Vijaya calls gratuitous graces... "'She broke off. "'You could be the greatest genius in the world, "'but you wouldn't have anything more than what I've been given. "'Isn't that true, Vijaya?' "'Perfectly true.' "'She turned back to Will. "'So you see, Mr. Farnaby, "'parlour's the place for stupid people.' the greatest happiness of the greatest number. And we stupid ones are the greatest number. People like Dr. Robert and Vijaya and my darling Ranga. We recognise their superiority. We know very well that their kind of intelligence is enormously important. But we also know that our kind of intelligence is just as important. And we don't envy them, because we're given just as much as they are. Sometimes even more. Sometimes, Vijaya agreed, even more. For the simple reason that a talent for manipulating symbols tempts its possessors into habitual symbol manipulation, and habitual symbol manipulation is an obstacle in the way of concrete experiencing and the reception of gratuitous graces. So you see, said Mrs. Rao, you don't have to feel too sorry for us. She looked at her watch. Goodness, I shall be late for Dilip's dinner if I don't hurry. She started briskly towards the door. Time, 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 Will mocked. Time, even in this place of timeless meditation. Time for dinner, breaking incorrigibly into eternity, he laughed. Never take yes for an answer. The nature of things is always no. Mrs. Rao halted for a moment and looked back at him. But sometimes, she said with a smile, it's eternity that miraculously breaks into time. Even into dinner time. Goodbye. She waved her hand and was gone. Which is better, Will wondered aloud as he followed Vijaya through the dark temple out into the noonday glare. Which is better, to be born stupid into an intelligent society, or intelligent into an insane one? 12. Here we are, said Vijaya, when they had reached the end of the short street that led downhill from the marketplace. He opened a wicket gate and ushered his guest into a tiny garden, at the further end of which, on its low stilts, stood a small thatched house. From behind the bungalow a yellow mongrel dog rushed out and greeted them with a frenzy of ecstatic yelps and jumps and tail waggings. A moment later a large green parrot, with white cheeks and a bill of polished jet, came swooping down from nowhere and landed with a squawk and a noisy fluttering of wings on Vijaya's shoulder. Parrots for you, said Will. Miners for little Mary Sargini. You people seem to be on remarkably good terms with the local fauna. Vijaya nodded. Pala is probably the only country in which an animal theologian would have no reason for believing in devils. For animals everywhere else, Satan, quite obviously, is homo sapiens. They climbed the steps to the veranda and walked through the open front door into the bungalow's main living room. Seated on a low chair near the window, a young woman in blue was nursing her baby son. She lifted a heart-shaped face that narrowed down from a broad forehead to a delicately pointed chin and gave them a welcoming smile. "'I've brought Will Farnaby,' said Vijaya, as he bent down to kiss her. Shanta held out her free hand to the stranger. "'I hope Mr. Farnaby doesn't object to nature in the raw,' she said. As though to give point to her words, the baby withdrew his mouth from the brown nipple and belched. A white bubble of milk appeared between his lips, swelled up and burst. He belched again, then resumed his sucking. Even at eight months, she added, Rama's table manners are still rather primitive. A fine specimen, said Will politely. He was not much interested in babies and had always been thankful for those repeated miscarriages which had frustrated all Molly's hopes and longings for a child. Who is he going to look like, you or Vijaya? Shanta laughed, and Vijaya joined in, enormously, an octave lower. 
He certainly won't look like Vijaya, she answered. Why not? For the sufficient reason, said Vijaya, that I'm not genetically responsible. In other words, the baby isn't Vijaya's son. Will looked from one laughing face to the other, then shrugged his shoulders. I give up. Four years ago, Shanta explained, we produced a pair of twins who are the living image of Vijaya. This time we thought it would be fun to have a complete change. We decided to enrich the family with an entirely new physique and temperament. Did you ever hear of Gobind Singh? Vijaya has just been showing me his painting in your meditation room. Well, that's the man we chose for Rama's father. But I understood he was dead. Shanta nodded. But his soul goes marching along. What do you mean? DF and AI. DF and AI? Deep freeze and artificial insemination. Oh, I see. Actually, said Vijaya, we developed the techniques of AI about twenty years before you did. But of course we couldn't do much with it until we had electric power and reliable refrigerators. We got those in the late twenties. Since then we've been using AI in a big way. So you see, Shanta chimed in, my baby might grow up to be a painter. That is, if that kind of talent is inherited. And even if it isn't, he'll be a lot more endomorphic and viscerotonic than his brothers or either of his parents, which is going to be very interesting and educative for everybody concerned. Do many people go in for this kind of thing? Will asked. More and more. In fact, I'd say that practically all the couples who decide to have a third child now go in for AI. So do quite a lot of those who mean to stop at number two. Take my family, for example. There's been some diabetes among my father's people, so they thought it best, he and my mother, to have both their children by AI. My brothers descended from three generations of dancers, and, genetically, I'm the daughter of Dr. Robert's first cousin, Malcolm Chakravarti MacPhail, who was the old Raja's private secretary. And the author, Vijaya added, of the best history of Bala. Chakravarti MacPhail was one of the ablest men of his generation. Will looked at Shanta, then back again at Vijaya. And has the ability been inherited? he asked. So much so, Vijaya answered, that I have the greatest difficulty in maintaining my position of masculine superiority. Shanta has more brains than I have, but fortunately she can't compete with my brawn. Brawn, Shanta repeated sarcastically. Brawn. I seem to remember a story about a young lady called Delilah. Incidentally, Vijaya went on, Shanta has thirty-two half-brothers and twenty-nine half-sisters, and more than a third of them are exceptionally bright. So you're improving the race? Very definitely. Give us another century and our average IQ will be up to a hundred and fifteen. Whereas ours, at the present rate of progress, will be down to about eighty-five. Better medicine, more congenital deficiencies preserved and passed on. It'll make things a lot easier for future dictators. At the thought of this cosmic joke, he laughed aloud. Then, after a silence, What about the ethical and religious aspects of AI? he asked. In the early days, said Vijaya, there were a good many conscientious objectors. But now the advantages of AI have been so clearly demonstrated. Most married couples feel that it's more moral to take a shot at having a child of superior quality than to run the risk of slavishly reproducing whatever quirks and defects may happen to run in the husband's family. Meanwhile, the theologians have got busy. AI has been justified in terms of reincarnation and the theory of karma. Pious fathers now feel happy at the thought that they're giving their wife's children a chance of creating a better destiny for themselves and their posterity. A better destiny? Because they carry the germ plasm of a better stock. And the stock is better because it's the manifestation of a better karma. We have a central bank of superior stocks— superior stocks of every variety of physique and temperament. In your kind of environment, most people's heredity never gets a fair chance. In ours, it does. And incidentally, we have excellent genealogical and anthropometric records going back as far as the 1870s. So you see, we're not working entirely in the dark. For example, we know that Gobind Singh's maternal grandmother was a gifted medium and lived to 96. So you see, said Shanta, we may even have a centenarian clairvoyant in the family. The baby belched again. She laughed. The oracle has spoken, as usual, very enigmatically. Turning to Vijaya, if you want lunch to be ready on time, she added, you'd better go and do something about it. 
Rama's going to keep me busy for at least another ten minutes. Vijaya rose, laid one hand on his wife's shoulder and with the other gently rubbed the baby's brown back. Shanta bent down and passed her cheek across the top of the child's downy head. It's father, she whispered. Good father. Good, good. Vijaya administered a final pat, then straightened himself up. You were wondering, he said to Will, how it is that we get on so well with the local fauna. I'll show you. He raised his hand. Polly? Polly? Cautiously, the big bird stepped from his shoulder to the extended forefinger. Polly's a good bird, he chanted. Polly's a very good bird. He lowered his hand to the point where a contact was made between the bird's body and the child's, then moved it slowly, feathers against brown skin, back and forth, back and forth. Polly's a good bird, he repeated. A good bird. The parrot uttered a succession of low chuckles, then leaned forward from its perch on Vijaya's finger and very gently nibbled at the child's tiny ear. Such a good bird, Shanta whispered, taking up the refrain. Such a good bird. Dr. Andrew picked up the idea, said Vijaya, while he was serving as a naturalist on the Malampus, from a tribe in northern New Guinea. Neolithic people, but like you Christians and us Buddhists, they believed in love. And unlike us and you, they'd invented some very practical ways of making their belief come true. This technique was one of their happiest discoveries. Stroke the baby while you're feeding him, it doubles his pleasure. Then while he's sucking and being caressed, introduce him to the animal or person you want him to love. Rub his body against theirs. Let there be a warm physical contact between child and love object. At the same time, repeat some word like good. At first he'll understand only your tone of voice, Later on, when he learns to speak, he'll get the full meaning. Food plus caress plus contact plus good equals love. And love equals pleasure. Love equals satisfaction. Pure Pavlov. But Pavlov purely for a good purpose. Pavlov for friendliness and trust and compassion. Whereas you prefer to use Pavlov for brainwashing. Pavlov for selling cigarettes and vodka and patriotism. Pavlov for the benefit of dictators, generals and tycoons. Refusing any longer to be left out in the cold, the yellow mongrel had joined the group and was impartially licking every piece of sentient matter within its reach. Shanta's arm, Vijaya's hand, the parrot's feet, the baby's backside. Shanta drew the dog closer and rubbed the child against its furry flank. And this is a good, good dog, she said. Dog Toby. Good, good dog Toby. Will laughed. Oughtn't I get into the act? I was going to suggest it, Shanta answered, only I was afraid you'd think it was beneath your dignity. You can take my place, said Vijaya. I must go and see about our lunch. Still carrying the parrot, he walked out through the door that led into the kitchen. Will pulled up his chair and, leaning forward, began to stroke the child's tiny body. This is another man, Shanta whispered. A good man, baby. A good man. How I wish it were true he said with a rueful little laugh. Here and now it is true, and bending down again over the child. He's a good man, she repeated, a good, good man. He looked at her blissful, secretly smiling face. He felt the smoothness and warmth of the child's tiny body against his fingertips. Good, good, good. He too might have known this goodness but only if his life had been completely different from what in fact, in senseless and disgusting fact, it was. So never take yes for an answer, even when, as now, yes is self-evident. He looked again with eyes deliberately attuned to another wavelength of value and saw the caricature of a memling altarpiece. Madonna with child, dog, Pavlov and casual acquaintance. And suddenly he could almost understand, from the inside, why Mr. Bahu so hated these people why he was so bent in the name, as usual and needless to say, of God, on their destruction. Good, Shanta was still murmuring to her baby, good, good, good. Too good. That was their crime. It simply wasn't permissible. And yet how precious it was, and how passionately he wished that he might have had a part in it. Pure sentimentality, he said to himself, and then aloud, good. Good, good, he echoed ironically. 
But what happens when the child grows a little bigger and discovers that a lot of things and people are thoroughly bad, bad, bad? Friendliness evokes friendliness, she answered. From the friendly, yes, but not from the greedy, not from the power lovers, not from the frustrated and embittered. For them, friendliness is just weakness, just an invitation to exploit, to bully, to take vengeance with impunity. But one has to run the risk. One has to make a beginning. And luckily no one's immortal. The people who've been conditioned to swindling and bullying and bitterness will all be dead in a few years, dead and replaced by men and women brought up in the new way. It happened with us. It can happen with you. It can happen, he agreed. But in the context of H-bombs and nationalism and 50 million more people every single year, it almost certainly won't. You can't tell till you try. And we shan't try as long as the world is in its present state. And of course it will remain in its present state until we do try. Try and, what's more, succeed at least as well as you've succeeded. Which brings me back to my original question. What happens when good, good, good discovers that even in parlour there's a lot of bad, bad, bad? Don't the children get some pretty unpleasant shocks? We try to inoculate them against those shocks. How? By making things unpleasant for them while they're still young? Not unpleasant. Let's say real. We teach them love and confidence, but we expose them to reality, reality in all its aspects, and then give them responsibilities. They're made to understand that Parla isn't Eden or the land of cocaine. It's a nice place, all right, but it will remain nice only if everybody works and behaves decently. And meanwhile, the facts of life are the facts of life even here. What about the facts of life in those blood-curdling snakes I met halfway up the precipice? You can say good, good, good as much as you like, but snakes will still bite. You mean they still can bite? But will they in fact make use of their ability? Why shouldn't they? Look over there, said Shanta. He turned his head and saw that what she was pointing at was a niche in the wall behind him. Within the niche was a stone Buddha, about half life-size, seated upon a curiously grooved cylindrical pedestal and surmounted by a kind of lead-shaped canopy that tapered down behind him into a broad pillar. It's a small replica, she went on, of the Buddha in the station compound. You know, the huge figure by the lotus pool. Which is a magnificent piece of sculpture, he said. And the smile really gives one an inkling of what the beatific vision must be like. But what has it got to do with snakes? Look again. He looked. I don't see anything specially significant. Look harder. The seconds passed. Then, with a shock of surprise, he noticed something strange and even disquieting. What he had taken for an oddly ornamented cylindrical pedestal had suddenly revealed itself as a huge coiled snake, and that downward tapering canopy under which the Buddha was sitting was the expanded hood with a flattened head at the centre of its leading edge of a giant cobra. My God, he said, I hadn't noticed. How unobservant can one be? Is this the first time you've seen the Buddha in this context? The first time. Is there some legend? She nodded. One of my favourites. You know about the Bodhi tree, of course? Yes, I know about the Bodhi tree. Well, that wasn't the only tree that Gautama sat under at the time of his enlightenment. After the Bodhi tree, he sat for seven days under a banyan, called the Tree of the Goat Herd and after that he moved on to the tree of Mukalinda. Who was Mukalinda? Mukalinda was the king of the snakes, and being a god he knew what was happening. So when the Buddha sat down under his tree, the snake king crawled out of his hole, yards and yards of him, to pay nature's homage to wisdom. Then a great storm blew up from the west. The divine cobra wrapped its coils round the more than divine man's body, spread its hood over his head, and for the seven days his contemplation lasted, Shelter the Tathagata from the wind and rain. So there he sits to this day, with cobra beneath him, cobra above him, conscious simultaneously of cobra and the clear light and their ultimate identity. How very different, said Will, from our view of snakes. And your view of snakes is supposed to be God's view. Remember Genesis? I will put enmity between thee and the woman, he quoted, and between her seed and thy seed. But wisdom never puts enmity anywhere. All those senseless, pointless cockfights between man and nature, between nature and God, between the flesh and the spirit. Wisdom doesn't make those insane separations. Nor does science. 
Wisdom takes science in its stride and goes a stage further. What about totemism? Will went on. What about the fertility cults? They didn't make any separations. Were they wisdom? Of course they were. Primitive wisdom, wisdom on the Neolithic level. But after a time people begin to get self-conscious, and the old dark gods come to seem disreputable. So the scene changes. Enter the gods of light, enter the prophets, enter Pythagoras and Zoroaster, enter the Jains and the early Buddhists. Between them they usher in the age of the cosmic cockfight. Ormuzd versus Ahriman, Jehovah versus Satan and the Baalim. Nirvana as opposed to Samsara. Appearance over against Plato's ideal reality. And except in the minds of few Tantrics and Mahayanists and Taoists and heretical Christians, the cockfight went on for the best part of two thousand years. After which, he questioned, after which you get the beginnings of modern biology. Will laughed. God said, let Darwin be. And there was Nietzsche, imperialism, and Adolf Hitler. All that, she agreed, but also the possibility of a new kind of wisdom for everybody. Darwin took the old totemism and raised it to the level of biology. The fertility cults reappeared as genetics and Havelock Ellis. And now it's up to us to take another half turn up the spiral. Darwinism was the old Neolithic wisdom turned into scientific concepts. The new conscious wisdom, the kind of wisdom that was prophetically glimpsed in Zen and Taoism and Tantra, is biological theory realised in living practice, is Darwinism raised to the level of compassion and spiritual insight. So you see, she concluded, there isn't any earthly reason, much less any heavenly reason, why the Buddha, or anyone else for that matter, shouldn't contemplate the clear light as manifested in a snake. Even though the snake might kill him, even though it might kill him. And even though it's the oldest and most universal of phallic symbols, Shanta laughed. Meditate under the tree of Mukalinda. That's the advice we give to every pair of lovers. And in the intervals between those loving meditations, remember what you were taught as children. Snakes are your brothers. Snakes have a right to your compassion and your respect. Snakes, in a word, are good, good, good. Snakes are also poisonous, poisonous, poisonous. But if you remember that they're just as good as they're poisonous and act accordingly, they won't use their poison. Who says so? It's an observable fact. People who aren't frightened of snakes, people who don't approach them with a fixed belief that the only good snake is a dead snake, hardly ever get bitten. Next week I'm borrowing our neighbor's pet python. For a few days I'll be giving Rama his lunch and dinner in the coils of the old serpent. From outside the house came the sound of high-pitched laughter, then a confusion of children's voices interrupting one another in English and Palinese. A moment later, looking very tall and maternal by comparison with her charges, Mary Saragini walked into the room flanked by a pair of identical four-year-olds and followed by the sturdy cherub who had been with her when Will first opened his eyes on Pala. "'We picked up Tara and Arjuna at the kindergarten,' Mary Saragini explained as the twins hurled themselves upon their mother." With the baby in one arm and the other round the two little boys, Shanta smiled her thanks. That was very kind of you. It was Tom Krishna who said, You're welcome. He stepped forward and, after a moment of hesitation, I was wondering, he began, then broke off and looked appealingly at his sister. Mary Sargini shook her head. What were you wondering? Shanta inquired. Well, as a matter of fact, we were both wondering. I mean, could we come and have dinner with you? Oh, I see. Shanta looked from Tom Krishna's face to Mary Sarajini's and back again. Well, you'd better go and ask Vijay if there's enough to eat. He's doing the cooking today. OK, said Tom Krishna without enthusiasm. With slow, reluctant steps, he crossed the room and went out through the door into the kitchen. Shanta turned to Mary Sarajini. What happened? Well, Mother's told him at least fifty times that she doesn't like his bringing lizards into the house, but this morning he did it again, so she got very cross with him. And you decided you'd better come and have dinner here? If it isn't convenient, Shanta, we could try the rouse or the Raja Jinnadasas. I'm quite sure it will be convenient, Shanta assured her. I only thought it would be good for Tom Krishna to have a little talk with Vijaya. You're perfectly right, said Mary Sarajini gravely. Then, very businesslike, Tara, Arjuna, she called, come with me to the bathroom and we'll get washed up. 
They're pretty grubby, she said to Shanta as she led them away. Will waited until they were out of earshot, then turned to Shanta. I take it that I've just been seeing a mutual adoption club in action. Fortunately, said Shanta, in very mild action, Tom Krishna and Mary Sarajini get on remarkably well with their mother. There's no personal problem there, only the problem of destiny, the enormous and terrible problem of Dugald's being dead. Will Susila marry again? he asked. I hope so, for everybody's sake. Meanwhile, it's good for the children to spend a certain amount of time with one or other of their deputy fathers, especially good for Tom Krishna. Tom Krishna's just reaching the age when little boys discover their maleness. He still cries like a baby, but the next moment he's bragging and showing off and bringing lizards into the house, just to prove he's two hundred percent a he-man. That's why I sent him to Vijaya. Vijaya is everything Tom Krishna likes to imagine he is. Three yards high, two yards wide, terrifically strong, immensely competent. And when he tells Tom Krishna how he ought to behave, Tom Krishna listens. Listens as he would never listen to me or his mother saying the same things. And Vijaya does say the same things as we would say. Because on top of being 200% male, he's almost 50% sensitive feminine. So you see, Tom Krishna is really getting the works. And now, she concluded, looking down at the sleeping child in her arms, I must put this young man to bed and get ready for lunch. 13. Washed and brushed, the twins were already in their high chairs. Mary Sarajini hung over them like a proud but anxious mother. At the stove, Vijaya was ladling rice and vegetables out of an earthenware pot. Cautiously and with an expression on his face of focused concentration, Tom Krishna carried each bowl as it was filled to the table. There, said Vijaya, when the last brimming bowl had been sent on its way. He wiped his hands, walked over to the table and took his seat. Better tell our guest about grace, he said to Shanta. Turning to Will, in Pala, she explained, we don't say grace before meals, we say it with meals. Or rather, we don't say grace, we chew it. Chew it. Grace is the first mouthful of each course, chewed and chewed until there's nothing left of it. And all the time you're chewing, you pay attention to the flavour of the food, to its consistency and temperature, to the pressures on your teeth and the feel of the muscles in your jaws. And meanwhile, I suppose, you give thanks to the Enlightened One, or Shiva, or whoever it may be. Shanta shook her head emphatically. That would distract your attention, and attention is the whole point. Attention to the experience of something given, something you haven't invented, not the memory of a form of words addressed to somebody in your imagination. She looked round the table. Shall we begin? Hurrah! The twins shouted in unison and picked up their spoons. For a long minute there was a silence, broken only by the twins who had not yet learned to eat without smacking their lips. May we swallow now? asked one of the little boys at last. Shanta nodded. Everyone swallowed. There was a clinking of spoons and a burst of talk from full mouths. Well, Shanta inquired, what did your grace taste like? It tasted, said Will, like a long succession of different things. Or rather a succession of variations on the fundamental theme of rice and turmeric and red peppers and zucchini and something leafy that I don't recognise. It's interesting how it doesn't remain the same. I'd never really noticed that before. And while you were paying attention to these things, you were momentarily delivered from daydreams, from memories, from anticipations, from silly notions, from all the symptoms of you. Isn't tasting me? Shanta looked down the length of the table to her husband. What would you say, Vijaya? I'd say it was halfway between me and not me. Tasting is not me doing something for the whole organism. And at the same time, tasting is me being conscious of what's happening. And that's the point of our chewing, Grace, to make the me more conscious of what the not me is up to. Very nice, was Will's comment. But what's the point of the point? It was Shanta who answered. The point of the point, she said, is that when you've learned to pay closer attention to more of the not you in the environment, that's the food, and more of the not you in your own organism, that's your taste sensations, you may suddenly find yourself paying attention to the not you on the further side of consciousness. 
Or perhaps it would be better, Shanto went on, to put it the other way round. The not you on the further side of consciousness will find it easier to make itself known to a you that has learned to be more aware of its not you on the side of physiology. She was interrupted by a crash, followed by a howl from one of the twins. After which, she continued as she wiped up the mess on the floor, one has to consider the problem of me and not me in relation to people less than 42 inches high. A prize of 64,000 crores of rupees will be given to anyone who comes up with a foolproof solution. She wiped the child's eyes, had him blow his nose, then gave him a kiss and went to the stove for another bowl of rice. What are your chores for this afternoon? Vijaya asked when lunch was over. We're on scarecrow duty, Tom Krishna answered importantly. In the field, just below the schoolhouse, Mary Sargini added. Then I'll take you there in the car, said Vijaya, turning to Will Farnaby. Would you like to come along? he asked. Will nodded. And if it's permissible, he said, I'd like to see the school while I'm about it. Sit in, maybe, at some of the classes. Shanto waved goodbye to them from the veranda, and a few minutes later they came in sight of the parked jeep. The school's on the other side of the village, explained Vijaya as he started the motor. We have to take the bypass. It goes down and then up again. Down through terraced fields of rice and maize and sweet potatoes, then on the level, along a contour line with a muddy little fish pond on the left and an orchard of breadfruit trees on the right, and finally up again through more fields, some green, some golden. And there was the schoolhouse, white and spacious under its towering shade trees. And down there, said Mary Sargini, are our scarecrows. Will looked in the direction she was pointing. In the nearest of the terraced fields below them, the yellow rice was almost ready to harvest. Two small boys in pink loincloths and a little girl in a blue skirt were taking turns at pulling the strings that set in motion two life-sized marionettes attached to poles at either end of the narrow field. The puppets were of wood, beautifully carved and clothed, not in rags, but in the most splendid draperies. Will looked at them in astonishment. Solomon in all his glory, he exclaimed, was not arrayed like one of these. But then Solomon, he went on to reflect, was only a king. These gorgeous scarecrows were beings of a higher order. One was a future Buddha, the other a delightfully gay East Indian version of God the Father, as one sees him in the Sistine Chapel, swooping down over the newly created Adam. With each tug of the string, the future Buddha wagged his head, uncrossed his legs from the lotus posture, danced a brief fandango in the air, then crossed them again and sat motionless for a moment until another jerk of the string once more disturbed his meditations. God the Father, meanwhile, waved his outstretched arm, wagged his forefinger in portentous warning, opened and shut his horsehair-fringed mouth, and rolled a pair of eyes which, being made of glass, flashed combinatory fire at any bird that dared to approach the rice and all the time a brisk wind was fluttering his draperies, which were bright yellow, with a bold design in brown, white and black of tigers and monkeys, while the future Buddha's magnificent robes of red and orange rayon bellied and flapped around him with the aeolian jingling of dozens of little silver bells. "'Are all your scarecrows like this?' Will asked. "'It was old Raja's idea,' Vijaya answered. "'He wanted to make the children understand that all gods are homemade.' and that it's we who pull their strings and so give them the power to pull ours. Make them dance, said Tom Krishna. Make them wiggle. He laughed delightedly. Vijaya stretched out an enormous hand and patted the child's dark, curly head. That's the spirit. And turning back to Will. Quote, gods, unquote, he said in what was evidently an imitation of the old Raja's manner. Their one great merit apart from scaring birds and... Quote, sinners, unquote, and occasionally perhaps consoling the miserable, consists in this. Being raised aloft on poles, they have to be looked up at, and when anyone looks up, even at a god, he can hardly fail to see the sky beyond. And what's the sky? Air and scattered light, but also a symbol of that boundless and, excuse the metaphor, pregnant emptiness out of which everything, the living and the inanimate, the puppet-makers and their divine marionettes emerge into the universe we know, or rather that we think we know. Mary Saragini, who'd been listening intently, nodded her head. Father used to say, she volunteered, that looking up at birds in the sky was even better. 
Birds aren't words, he used to say. Birds are real, just as real as the sky. Vijaya brought the car to a standstill. Have a good time, he said as the children jumped out. Make them dance and wiggle. Shouting, Tom Krishna and Mary Sarajini ran down to join the little group in the field below the road. And now for the more solemn aspects of education. Vijaya turned the jeep into the driveway that led up to the schoolhouse. I'll leave the car here and walk back to the station. When you've had enough, get someone to drive you home. He turned off the ignition and handed Will the key. In the school office, Mrs. Narian, the principal, was talking across her desk to a white-haired man with a long, rather doleful face, like the face of a lined and wrinkled bloodhound. Mr. Chandra Menon, Vijaya explained when the introductions had been made, is our Under-Secretary of Education. Who is paying us, said the principal, one of his periodical visits of inspection. And who thoroughly approves of what he sees? the undersecretary added with a courteous bow in Mrs. Narayan's direction. Vijaya excused himself. I have to get back to my work, he said, and moved towards the door. Are you especially interested in education? Mr. Menon inquired. Especially ignorant would be more like it, Will answered. I was merely brought up, never educated. That's why I'd like to have a look at the genuine article. Well, you've come to the right place the undersecretary assured him. New Rothamsted is one of our best schools. What's your criterion of a good school? Will asked. Success? In what? Winning scholarships, getting ready for jobs, obeying the local categorical imperatives? All that, of course, said Mr. Menon, but the fundamental question remains, what are boys and girls for? Will shrugged his shoulders. The answer depends on where you happen to be domiciled. For example, what are boys and girls for in America? Answer, from mass consumption. And the corollaries of mass consumption are mass communications, mass advertising, mass opiates in the form of television, probamate, positive thinking and cigarettes. And now that Europe has made the breakthrough into mass production, what will its boys and girls be for? For mass consumption and all the rest. Just like the boys and girls in America. Whereas in Russia there's a different answer. Boys and girls are for strengthening the national state. Hence all those engineers and science teachers, not to mention 50 divisions ready for instant combat and equipped with everything from tanks to H-bombs and long-range rockets. And in China it's the same, but a good deal more so. What are boys and girls for there? For cannon fodder, industry fodder, agriculture fodder, road-building fodder. So east is east and west is west. For the moment... But the twain may meet in one or other of two ways. West may get so frightened of East that it will give up thinking that boys and girls are for mass consumption and decide instead that they are for cannon fodder and strengthening the state. Alternatively, East may find itself under such pressure from the appliance-hungry masses who long to go Western that it will have to change its mind and say that boys and girls are really for mass consumption. But that's for the future. As for now, the current answers to your question are mutually exclusive. And both of the answers, said Mr. Menon, are different from ours. What are Balinese boys and girls for? Neither for mass consumption nor for strengthening the state. The state has to exist, of course, and there has to be enough for everybody. That goes without saying. It's only on those conditions that boys and girls can discover what in fact they are for. Only on those conditions that we can do anything about it. And what in fact are they for? for actualization, for being turned into full-blown human beings. Will nodded. Notes on what's what, he commented. Become what you really are. The old Raja, said Mr. Menon, was mainly concerned with what people really are on the level that's beyond individuality. And of course we're just as much interested in that as he was. But our first business is elementary education, and elementary education has to deal with individuals in all their diversity of shape, size, temperament, gifts, and deficiencies. Individuals in their transcendent unity are the affair of higher education. That begins in adolescence and is given concurrently with advanced elementary education. Begins, I take it, said Will, with the first experience of the Moksha medicine. So you've heard about the Moksha medicine. I've even seen it in action. Dr. Robert, the principal explained, took him yesterday to see an initiation, by which, added Will, I was profoundly impressed. When I think of my religious training, 
he left the sentence eloquently unfinished. Well, as I was saying, Mr. Menon continued, adolescents get both kinds of education concurrently. They're helped to experience their transcendental unity with all other sentient beings, and at the same time they're learning, in their psychology and physiology classes, that each one of us has his own constitutional uniqueness. Everybody's different from everybody else. When I was at school, said Will, the pedagogues did their best to iron out those differences, or at least to plaster them over with the same late Victorian ideal, the ideal of the scholarly but Anglican football-playing gentleman. But now tell me what you do about the fact that everybody is different from everybody else. We begin, said Mr. Menon, by assessing the differences, precisely who or what, anatomically, biochemically, and psychologically, is this child. In the organic hierarchy, which takes precedence, his gut, his muscles, or his nervous system? How near does he stand to the three polar extremes? How harmonious or how disharmonious is the mixture of his component elements, physical and mental? How great is his inborn wish to dominate, or to be sociable, or to retreat into his inner world? And how does he do his thinking and perceiving and remembering? Is he a visualizer or a non-visualizer? Does his mind work with images or with words, with both at once, or with neither? How close to the surface is his storytelling faculty? Does he see the world as Wordsworth and Traherne saw it when they were children? And if so, what can be done to prevent the glory and the freshness from fading into the light of common day? Or, in more general terms, how can we educate children on the conceptual level without killing their capacity for intense non-verbal experience? How can we reconcile analysis with vision? And there are dozens of other questions that must be asked and answered. For example, does this child absorb all the vitamins in his food, or is he subject to some chronic deficiency that, if it isn't recognized and treated, will lower his vitality, darken his mood, make him see ugliness, feel boredom, and think foolishness or malice? And what about his blood sugar? What about his breathing? What about his posture and the way he uses his organism when he's working, playing, studying? And there are all the questions that have to do with special gifts. Does he show signs of having a talent for music, for mathematics, for handling words, for observing accurately, and for thinking logically and imaginatively about what he has observed? And finally, how suggestible is he going to be when he grows up? All children are good hypnotic subjects, so good that four out of five of them can be talked into somnambulism. In adults, the proportion is reversed. Four out of five of them can never be talked into somnambulism. Out of any hundred children, which are the twenty who will grow up to be suggestible to the pitch of somnambulism? Can you spot them in advance? Will asked. And if so, what's the point of spotting them? We can spot them, Mr. Menon answered. And it's very important that they should be spotted, particularly important in your part of the world. Politically speaking, the 20% that can be hypnotized easily and to the limit is the most dangerous element in your societies. Dangerous? Because these people are the propagandists' predestined victims. In an old-fashioned, pre-scientific democracy, any spellbinder with a good organization behind him can turn that 20% of potential somnambulists into an army of regimented fanatics dedicated to the greater glory and power of their hypnotist. And under a dictatorship... These same potential somnambulists can be talked into implicit faith and mobilized as the hard core of the omnipotent party. So you see, it's very important for any society that values liberty to be able to spot the future somnambulists when they're young. Once they've been spotted, they can be hypnotized and systematically trained not to be hypnotizable by the enemies of liberty. And at the same time, of course, You'd be well advised to reorganize your social arrangements so as to make it difficult or impossible for the enemies of liberty to arise or have any influence. Which is the state of things, I gather, in parlour. Precisely, said Mr. Menon, and that's why our potential somnambulists don't constitute a danger. Then why do you go to the trouble of spotting them in advance? Because, if it's properly used, their gift is so valuable. For destiny control? Will questioned, remembering those therapeutic swans and all the things that Susila had said about pressing one's own buttons. The undersecretary shook his head. Destiny control doesn't call for anything more than a light trance. Practically everybody's capable of that. 
The potential somnambulists are the 20% who can go into very deep trance. And it's in very deep trance, and only in very deep trance, that a person can be taught how to distort time. Can you distort time? Will inquired. Mr. Menon shook his head. Unfortunately, I could never go deep enough. Everything I know had to be learned the long, slow way. Mrs. Narayan was more fortunate. Being one of the privileged 20%, she could take all kinds of educational shortcuts that were completely closed to the rest of us. What sort of shortcuts? Will asked, turning to the principal. Shortcuts to memorizing, she answered. Shortcuts to calculating and thinking and problem-solving. One starts by learning how to experience twenty seconds as ten minutes, a minute as half an hour. In deep trance it's really very easy. You listen to the teacher's suggestions and you sit there quietly for a long, long time. Two full hours. You'll be ready to take your oath on it. When you've been brought back, you look at your watch. Your experience of two hours was telescoped into exactly four minutes of clock time. How? Nobody knows how, said Mr. Menon. But all those anecdotes about drowning men seeing the whole of their life unfolding before them in a few seconds are substantially true. The mind and the nervous system, or rather some minds and some nervous systems, happen to be capable of this curious feat. That's all that anybody knows. We discovered the fact about sixty years ago, and since then we've been exploiting it. Exploiting it, among other things, for educational purposes. For example... Mrs. Narayan resumed. Here's a mathematical problem. In your normal state it might take you the best part of half an hour to solve, but now you distort time to the point where one minute is subjectively the equivalent of thirty minutes. Then you set to work on your problem. Thirty subjective minutes later it's solved. But thirty subjective minutes are one clock minute. Without the least sense of rush or strain, you've been working as fast as one of those extraordinary calculating boys who turn up from time to time. Future geniuses like Ampère and Gauss, or future idiots like Days, but all of them by some built-in trick of time distortion, capable of getting through an hour's hard work in a couple of minutes, sometimes in a matter of seconds. I'm only an average student, but I could go into deep trance, which meant that I could be taught how to telescope my time into a thirtieth of its normal span. Result? I was able to cover far more intellectual ground than I could possibly have covered if I'd had to do all my learning in the ordinary way. You can imagine what happens when somebody with a genius IQ is also capable of time distortion. The results are fantastic. Unfortunately, said Mr. Menon, they're not very common. In the last two generations we've had precisely two time distorters of real genius, and only five or six runners-up. But what Pala owes to those few is incalculable, so it's no wonder that we keep a sharp lookout for potential somnambulists. Well, you certainly ask plenty of searching questions about your little pupils, Will concluded after a brief silence. What do you do when you find the answers? We start educating accordingly, said Mr. Menon. For example, we ask questions about every child's physique and temperament. When we have the answers, we sort out all the shyest, tensest and most over-responsive and introverted children and assemble them in a single group. Then, little by little, the group is enlarged. First a few children with tendencies towards indiscriminate sociability are introduced, then one or two little muscle men and muscle women, children with tendencies towards aggressiveness and love of power. It's the best method we've found for getting little boys and girls at the three polar extremes to understand and tolerate one another. After a few months of carefully controlled mixing, they're ready to admit that people with a different kind of hereditary makeup have just as good a right to exist as they have. And the principle said Mrs. Narayan, is explicitly taught as well as progressively applied. In the lower forms, we do the teaching in terms of analogies with familiar animals. Cats like to be by themselves. Sheep like being together. Martins are fierce and can't be tamed. Guinea pigs are gentle and friendly. Are you a cat person or a sheep person, a guinea pig person or a martin person? Talk about it in animal parables, and even very small children can understand the fact of human diversity and the need for mutual forbearance, mutual forgiveness. And later on, said Mr. Menon, when they come to read the Gita, we tell them about the link between constitution and religion. Sheep people and guinea pig people love ritual and public ceremonies and revivalistic emotion. 
that temperamental preferences can be directed into the way of devotion. Cat people like to be alone, and their private broodings can become the way of self-knowledge. Martin people want to do things, and their problem is how to transform their driving aggressiveness into the way of disinterested action. And the way to the way of disinterested action is what I was looking at yesterday, said Will. The way that leads through wood chopping and rock climbing, is that it? Wood chopping and rock climbing, said Mr. Menon, are special cases. Let's generalize and say that the way to all the ways leads through the redirection of power. What's that? The principle is very simple. You take the power generated by fear or envy or too much noradrenaline or else by some built-in urge that happens at the moment to be out of place. You take it and instead of using it to do something unpleasant to someone else, instead of repressing it and so doing something unpleasant to yourself, you consciously direct it along a channel where it can do something useful or, if not useful, at least harmless. Here's a special case said the principal, an angry or frustrated child has worked up enough power for a burst of crying, or bad language, or a fight. If the power generated is sufficient for any of those things, it's sufficient for running or dancing, more than sufficient for five deep breaths. I'll show you some dancing later on. For the moment, let's confine ourselves to breathing. Any irritated person who takes five deep breaths releases a lot of tension, and so makes it easier for himself to behave rationally. So we teach our children all kinds of breathing games to be played whenever they're angry or upset. Some of the games are competitive. Which of two antagonists can inhale most deeply and say om on the outgoing breath for the longest time? It's a duel that ends, almost without fail, in reconciliation. But of course there are many occasions when competitive breathing is out of place. So here's a little game that an exasperated child can play on his own, a game that's based on the local folklore. Every Palinese child has been brought up on Buddhist legends, and in most of these pious fairy stories somebody has a vision of a celestial being, a bodhisattva, say, in an explosion of lights, jewels and rainbows. And along with the glorious vision there's always an equally glorious olfaction. The fireworks are accompanied by an unutterably delicious perfume. Well, we take these traditional fantasies, which are all based, needless to say, on actual visionary experiences of the kind induced by fasting, sensory deprivation or mushrooms, and we set them to work. Violent feelings, we tell the children, are like earthquakes. They shake us so hard that cracks appear in the wall that separates our private selves from the shared universal Buddha nature. You get cross, something inside of you cracks, and through the crack out comes a whiff of the heavenly smell of enlightenment, like champak, like lang lang, like gardenias, only infinitely more wonderful. So don't miss this heavenliness that you've accidentally released. It's there every time you get cross. Inhale it, breathe it in, fill your lungs with it, again and again. And they actually do it? After a few weeks of teaching, most of them do it as a matter of course. And what's more, a lot of them really smell that perfume. The old repressive thou shalt not has been translated into a new expressive and rewarding thou shalt. Potentially harmful power has been redirected into channels where it's not merely harmless, but may actually do some good. And meanwhile, of course, we've been giving the children systematic and carefully graduated training in perception and the proper use of language. They're taught to pay attention to what they see and hear, and at the same time, they're asked to notice how their feelings and desires affect what they experience of the outer world, and how their language habits affect not only their feelings and desires, but even their sensations. What my ears and my eyes record is one thing. What the words I use and the mood I'm in and the purposes I'm pursuing allow me to perceive, make sense of, and act upon is something quite different. So you see, it's all brought together into a single educational process. What we give the children is simultaneously a training in perceiving and imagining, a training in applied physiology and psychology, a training in practical ethics and practical religion, a training in the proper use of language, and a training in self-knowledge. In a word, a training of the whole mind-body in all its aspects. What's the relevance, Will asked, of all this elaborate training of the mind-body to formal education? Does it help a child to do sums or write grammatically? or understand elementary physics? It helps a lot, said Mr. Menon. 
A trained mind-body learns more quickly and more thoroughly than an untrained one. It's also more capable of relating facts to ideas, and both of them to its own ongoing life. Suddenly, and surprisingly, for that long melancholy face gave one the impression of being incompatible with any expression of mirth more emphatic than a rather weary smile, he broke into a loud, long peal of laughter. What's the joke? I was thinking of two people I met last time I was in England, at Cambridge. One of them was an atomic physicist, the other was a philosopher, both extremely eminent. But one had a mental age outside the laboratory of about eleven, and the other was a compulsive eater with a weight problem that he refused to face. Two extreme examples of what happens when you take a clever boy, give him fifteen years of the most intensive formal education, and totally neglect to do anything for the mind-body which has to do the learning and the living. And your system, I take it, doesn't produce that kind of academic monster. The undersecretary shook his head. Until I went to Europe, I'd never seen anything of the kind. They're grotesquely funny, he added. But goodness, how pathetic. And, poor things, how curiously repulsive. Being pathetically and curiously repulsive, that's the price we pay for specialization. For specialization, Mr. Menon agreed, but not in the sense you people ordinarily use the word. Specialization in that sense is necessary and inevitable. No specialization, no civilization. And if one educates the whole mind-body along with a symbol-using intellect, that kind of necessary specialization won't do much harm. But you people don't educate the mind-body. Your cure for too much scientific specialization is a few more courses in the humanities. Excellent. Every education ought to include courses in the humanities. But don't let's be fooled by the name. By themselves, the humanities don't humanize. They're simply another form of specialization on the symbolic level. Reading Plato or listening to a lecture on T.S. Eliot doesn't educate the whole human being. Like courses in physics or chemistry, it merely educates the symbol manipulator and leaves the rest of the living mind-body in its pristine state of ignorance and ineptitude. Hence all those pathetic and repulsive creatures that so astonished me on my first trip abroad. What about formal education? Will now asked. What about indispensable information and the necessary intellectual skills? Do you teach the way we do? We teach the way you're probably going to teach in another ten or fifteen years. Take mathematics, for example. Historically, mathematics began with the elaboration of useful tricks, soared up into metaphysics, and finally explained itself in terms of structure and logical transformations. In our schools, we reverse the historical process. We begin with structure and logic. Then, skipping the metaphysics, we go on from general principles to particular applications. And the children understand? Far better than they understand when one starts with utilitarian tricks. From about five onwards, practically any intelligent child can learn practically anything, provided always that you present it to him in the right way. Logic and structure in the form of games and puzzles. The children play, and, incredibly quickly, they catch the point after which you can go on to practical applications. Taught in this way, most children can learn at least three times as much, four times as thoroughly, in half the time. Or consider another field where one can use games to implant an understanding of basic principles. All scientific thinking is in terms of probability. The old eternal verities are merely a high degree of likeliness. The immutable laws of nature are just statistical averages. How does one get these profoundly unobvious notions into children's heads? By playing roulette with them, by spinning coins and drawing lots, by teaching them all kinds of games with cards and boards and dice. Evolutionary snakes and ladders. That's the most popular game with the little ones, said Mrs. Narayan. Another great favourite is Mendelian happy families. And a little later, Mr. Menon added, we introduced them to a rather complicated game played by four people with a pack of sixty specially designed cards divided into three suits. Psychological bridge, we call it. Chance deals you your hand, but the way you play it is a matter of skill, bluff, and cooperation with your partner. Psychology, Mendelism, evolution. Your education seems to be heavily biological, said Will. It is, Mr. Menon agreed. Our primary emphasis isn't on physics and chemistry. It's on the sciences of life. Is that a matter of principle? 
Not entirely. It's also a matter of convenience and economic necessity. We don't have the money for large-scale research in physics and chemistry, and we don't really have any practical need for that kind of research. No heavy industries to be made more competitive, no armaments to be made more diabolical, not the faintest desire to land on the backside of the moon, only the modest ambition to live as fully human beings in harmony with the rest of life on this island at this latitude on this planet. We can take the results of your researches in physics and chemistry and apply them, if we want to or can afford it, to our own purposes. Meanwhile, we'll concentrate on the research which promises to do us the greatest good, in the sciences of life and mind. If the politicians in the newly independent countries had any sense, he added, they'd do the same. But they want to throw their weight around. They want to have armies. They want to catch up with the motorized television addicts of America and Europe. You people have no choice, he went on. You're irretrievably committed to applied physics and chemistry with all their dismal consequences, military, political, and social. But the underdeveloped countries aren't committed. They don't have to follow your example. They're still free to take the road we've taken, the road of applied biology, the road of fertility control, and the limited production and selective industrialization which fertility control makes possible, the road that leads towards happiness from the inside out, through health, through awareness, through a change in one's attitude towards the world, not towards the mirage of happiness from the outside in, through toys and pills and non-stop distractions. They could still choose our way, but they don't want to. They want to be exactly like you, God help them. And as they can't possibly do what you've done, at any rate within the time they've set themselves, they're foredoomed to frustration and disappointment, predestined to the misery of social breakdown and anarchy, and then to the misery of enslavement by tyrants. It's a completely foreseeable tragedy, and they're walking into it with their eyes open. And we can't do anything about it, the principal added. Can't do anything, said Mr. Menon, except go on doing what we're doing now and hoping against hope that the example of a nation that has found a way of being happily human may be imitated. There's very little chance of it, but it just might happen. Unless Greater Rendang happens first. Unless Greater Rendang happens first, Mr. Menon gravely agreed. Meanwhile, we have to get on with our job, which is education. Is there anything more that you'd like to hear about, Mr. Farnaby? Lots more, said Will. For example, how early do you start your science teaching? We start it at the same time we start multiplication and division. First lessons in ecology. Ecology? Isn't that a bit complicated? That's precisely the reason why we begin with it. Never give children a chance of imagining that anything exists in isolation. Make it plain from the very first that all living is relationship. Show them relationships in the woods, in the fields, in the ponds and streams, in the village and the country around it. Rub it in. And let me add, said the principal, that we always teach the science of relationship in conjunction with the ethics of relationship. Balance, give and take, no excesses. It's the rule in nature and, translated out of fact into morality, it ought to be the rule among people. As I said before, children find it very easy to understand an idea when it's presented to them in a parable about animals. We give them an up-to-date version of Aesop's fables. Not the old anthropomorphic fictions, but true ecological fables with built-in cosmic morals. And another wonderful parable for children is the story of erosion. We don't have any good examples of erosion here, so we show them photographs of what has happened in Rendang, in India and China, in Greece and the Levant, in Africa and America, all the places where greedy, stupid people have tried to take without giving, to exploit without love or understanding. Treat nature well, and nature will treat you well. Hurt or destroy nature, and nature will soon destroy you. In a dust bowl, do as you would be done by is self-evident. Much easier for a child to recognize and understand than in an eroded family or village. Psychological wounds won't show. And anyhow, children know so little about their elders. And having no standards of comparison, they tend to take even the worst situation for granted, as though it were part of the nature of things. Whereas the difference between ten acres of meadow and ten acres of gullies and blowing sand is obvious. Sand and gullies are parables. Confronted by them, it's easy for the child to see the need for conservation and then to go on from conservation to morality. 
easy for him to go on from the golden rule in relation to plants and animals and the earth that supports them to the golden rule in relation to human beings. And here's another important point. The morality to which a child goes on from the facts of ecology and the parables of erosion is a universal ethic. There are no chosen people in nature, no holy lands, no unique historical revelations. Conservation morality gives nobody an excuse for feeling superior or claiming special privileges. Do as you would be done by applies to our dealings with all kinds of life in every part of the world. We shall be permitted to live on this planet only for as long as we treat all nature with compassion and intelligence. Elementary ecology leads straight to elementary Buddhism. A few weeks ago, said Will after a moment of silence, I was looking at Thorwald's book about what happened in eastern Germany between January and May of 1945. Have either of you read it? They shook their heads. Then don't, Will advised. I was in Dresden five months after the February bombing. Fifty or sixty thousand civilians, mostly refugees running away from the Russians, burned alive in a single night, and all because little Adolf had never learned ecology. He smiled his flayed, ferocious smile. Never been taught the first principles of conservation. One made a joke of it because it was too horrible to be talked about seriously. Mr. Menon rose and picked up his briefcase. I must be going. He shook hands with Will. It had been a pleasure and he hoped that Mr. Farnaby would enjoy his stay in parlour. Meanwhile, if he wanted to know more about Polynese education, he had only to ask Mrs. Narayan. Nobody was better qualified to act as a guide and instructor. Would you like to visit some of the classrooms? Mrs. Narayan asked when the undersecretary had left. Will rose and followed her out of the room and along a corridor. Mathematics, said the principal as she opened a door, and here is the upper fifth, under Mrs. Anand. Will bowed as he was introduced. The white-haired teacher gave a welcoming smile and whispered, We're deep, as you see, in a problem. He looked about him. At their desks, a score of boys and girls were frowning, in a concentrated, pencil-biting silence over their notebooks. The bent heads were sleek and dark. Above the white or khaki shorts, above the long gaily coloured skirts, the golden bodies glistened in the heat. Boys' bodies that showed the cage of the ribs beneath the skin, girls' bodies fuller, smoother, with the swell of small breasts, firm, high-set, elegant as the inventions of a rococo sculptor of nymphs and everyone took them completely for granted. What a comfort, Will reflected, to be in a place where the fall was an exploded doctrine. Meanwhile, Mrs. Anand was explaining, sotto voce, so as not to distract the problem solvers from their task, that she always divided her classes into two groups. The group of the visualizers who thought in geometrical terms, like the ancient Greeks, and the group of the non-visualizers who preferred algebra and imageless abstraction. Somewhat reluctantly, Will withdrew his attention from the beautiful, unfallen world of young bodies and resigned himself to taking an intelligent interest in human diversity and the teaching of mathematics. They took their leave at last. Next door, in a pale blue classroom decorated with paintings of tropical animals, bodhisattvas and their bosomy shaktis, the lower fifth were having their bi-weekly lesson in elementary applied philosophy. Breasts here were smaller, arms thinner and less muscular. These philosophers were only a year away from childhood. Symbols are public, the young man at the blackboard was saying as Will and Mrs. Narayan entered the room. He drew a row of little circles, numbered them one, two, three, four, and N. These are people, he explained. And then from each of the little circles he drew a line that connected it with a square at the left of the board. S, he wrote in the centre of the square. S is the system of symbols that the people use when they want to talk to one another. They all speak the same language. English, Polynesian, Eskimo. It depends where they happen to live. Words are public. They belong to all the speakers of a given language. They're listed in dictionaries. And now let's look at the things that happen out there. He pointed through the open window. Gaudy against a white cloud, half a dozen parrots came sailing into view, passed behind a tree and were gone. The teacher drew a second square at the opposite side of the board, labelled it E for events, and connected it by lines to the circles. What happens out there is public, or at least fairly public, he qualified, and what happens when somebody speaks or writes words, 
that's also public. But the things that go on inside these little circles are private. Private, he laid a hand on his chest. Private, he rubbed his forehead. Private, he touched his eyelids and the tip of his nose with a brown forefinger. Now let's make a simple experiment. Say the word pinch. Pinch, said the class in ragged unison. Pinch. P-I-N-C-H. Pinch. That's public. That's something you can look up in the dictionary. But now pinch yourselves. Hard. Harder. To an accompaniment of giggles, of eyes and owls, the children did as they were told. Can anybody feel what the person sitting next to him is feeling? And there was a chorus of no's. So it looks, said the young man, as though there were... Let's see, how many are we? He ran his eyes over the desks before him. It looks as though there were twenty-three distinct and separate pains. Twenty-three in this one room. Nearly three thousand million of them in the whole world. Plus the pains of all the animals. And each of these pains is strictly private. There's no way of passing the experience from one centre of pain to another centre of pain. No communication except indirectly through S. He pointed to the square at the left of the board, then to the circles at the centre. Private pains here in 1, 2, 3, 4 and N. News about private pains out here at S, where you can say pinch, which is a public word listed in a dictionary. And notice this, there's only one public word, pain, for 3,000 million private experiences, each of which is probably about as different from all the others as my nose is different from your noses, and your noses are different from one another. A word only stands for the ways in which things or happenings of the same general kind are like one another. That's why the word is public, and being public, it can't possibly stand for the ways in which happenings of the same general kind are unlike one another. There was a silence. Then the teacher looked up and asked a question. Does anyone here know about Mahakasyapa? Several hands were raised. He pointed his finger at a little girl in a blue skirt and a necklace of shells sitting in the front row. You tell us, Amiya. Breathlessly and with a lisp, Amiya began. Mahakathyapa, she said, was the only one of the disciples that understood what the Buddha was talking about. And what was he talking about? He wasn't talking. That's why they didn't understand. But Mahakasyapa understood what he was talking about, even though he wasn't talking. Is that it? The little girl nodded. That was it exactly. They thought he was going to preach a sermon, she said. But he didn't. He just picked a flower and held it up for everybody to look at. And that was the sermon, shouted a small boy in a yellow loincloth, who had been wriggling in his seat, hardly able to contain his desire to impart what he knew. But nobody could understand that kind of a sermon. Nobody but Mahakasyapa. So what did Mahakasyapa say when the Buddha held up that flower? Nothing, the yellow loincloth shouted triumphantly. He just smiled, Amya elaborated, and that showed the Buddha that he understood what it was all about. So he smiled back, and they just sat there, smiling and smiling. Very good, said the teacher. And now? He turned to the yellow loincloth. Let's hear what you think it was that Mahakasyapa understood. There was a silence. Then, crestfallen, the child shook his head. I don't know, he mumbled. Does anyone else know? There were several conjectures. Perhaps he'd understood that people get bored with sermons, even the Buddha's sermons. Perhaps he liked flowers as much as the compassionate one did. Perhaps it was a white flower, and that made him think of the clear light. Or perhaps it was blue, and that was Shiva's colour. Good answers, said the teacher, especially the first one. Sermons are pretty boring, especially for the preacher. But here's a question. If any of your answers had been what Mahakasyapa understood when Buddha held up the flower, why didn't he come out with it in so many words? Perhaps he wasn't a good speaker. He was an excellent speaker. Maybe he had a sore throat. If he'd had a sore throat, he wouldn't have smiled so happily. You tell us called a shrill voice from the back of the room. Yes, you tell us, a dozen other voices chimed in. The teacher shook his head. If Mahakasyapa and the compassionate one couldn't put it into words, how can I? Meanwhile, let's take another look at these diagrams on the blackboard. Public words, 
more or less public events, and then people, completely private centres of pain and pleasure. Completely private? he questioned. But perhaps that isn't quite true. Perhaps, after all, there is some kind of communication between the circles, not in the way I'm communicating with you now, through words, but directly. And maybe that was what the Buddha was talking about when his wordless flower sermon was over. I have the treasure of the unmistakable teachings, he said to his disciples, the wonderful mind of Nirvana, the true form without form, beyond all words, the teaching to be given and received outside of all doctrines. This I have now handed to Mahakasyapa. Picking out the chalk again, he traced a rough ellipse that enclosed within its boundaries all the other diagrams on the board the little circles representing human beings, the square that stood for events, and the other square that stood for words and symbols. All separate, he said, and yet all one. People, events, words. They're all manifestations of mind, of suchness, of the void. What Buddha was implying and what Mahakasyapa understood was that one can't speak these teachings, one can only be them, which is something you'll all discover when the moment comes for your initiation. Time to move on, the principal whispered, and when the door had closed behind them and they were standing again in the corridor, we use this same kind of approach, she said to Will, in our science teaching, beginning with botany. Why with botany? Because it can be related so easily to what was being talked about just now, the Mahakasyapa story. Is that your starting point? No, we start prosaically with the textbook. The children are given all the obvious elementary facts, tidily arranged in the standard pigeonholes. Undiluted botany, that's the first stage, six or seven weeks of it, after which they get a whole morning of what we call bridge-building, two and a half hours during which we try to make them relate everything they've learned in the previous lessons to art, language, religion, self-knowledge. Botany and self-knowledge. How do you build that bridge? It's really quite simple, Mrs. Narian assured him, each of the children is given a common flower, a hibiscus, for example, or better still, because the hibiscus has no scent, a gardenia. Scientifically speaking, what is a gardenia? What does it consist of? Petals, stamens, pistil, ovary, and all the rest of it. The children are asked to write a full analytical description of the flower illustrated by an accurate drawing. When that's done, there's a short rest period, at the close of which the Mahakasyapa story is read to them, and they're asked to think about it. Was Buddha giving a lesson in botany, or was he teaching his disciples something else? And if so, what? What indeed? And of course, as the story makes clear, there's no answer that can be put into words. So we tell the boys and girls to stop thinking and just look. But don't look analytically, we tell them. Don't look as scientists, even as gardeners. Liberate yourselves from everything you know, and look with complete innocence at this infinitely improbable thing before you. Look at it as though you'd never seen anything of the kind before, as though it had no name and belonged to no recognisable class. Look at it alertly but passively, receptively, without labelling or judging or comparing. And as you look at it, inhale its mystery. Breathe in the spirit of sense, the smell of the wisdom of the other shore. All this, Will commented, sounds very like what Dr Robert was saying at the initiation ceremony. Of course it does, said Mrs Narian. Learning to take the Maha Kasyapa's eye view of things is the best preparation for the moksha medicine experience. Every child who comes to initiation comes to it after a long education in the art of being receptive. First the gardenia as a botanical specimen. Then the same gardenia in its uniqueness, the gardenia as the artist sees it, the even more miraculous gardenia seen by the Buddha and Maha Kasyapa. And it goes without saying, she added, that we don't confine ourselves to flowers. Every course the children take is punctuated by periodical bridge-building sessions, everything from dissected frogs to the spiral nebulae. It all gets looked at receptively as well as conceptually, as a fact of aesthetic or spiritual experience, as well as in terms of science or history or economics. Training in receptivity is the complement and antidote to training in analysis and symbol manipulation. Both kinds of training are absolutely indispensable. If you neglect either of them, you'll never grow into a fully human being. There was a silence. How should one look at other people? Will asked at last. 
Should one take the Freud's eye view or the Cezanne's eye view? The Proust's eye view or the Buddha's eye view? Mrs. Narian laughed. Which view are you taking of me? she asked. Primarily, I suppose, the sociologist's eye view, he answered. I'm looking at you as the representative of an unfamiliar culture, but I'm also being aware of you receptively, thinking, if you don't mind my saying so, that you seem to have aged remarkably well, well aesthetically, well intellectually and psychologically, and well spiritually, whatever that word means. And if I make myself receptive, it means something important. Whereas if I choose to project instead of taking in, I can conceptualise it into pure nonsense. He uttered a mildly hyena-like laugh. If one chooses to, said Mrs. Narian, one can always substitute a bad ready-made notion for the best insights of receptivity. The question is, why should one want to make that kind of choice? Why shouldn't one choose to listen to both parties and harmonise their views? The analysing tradition-bound concept-maker and the alertly passive insight-receiver neither is infallible, but both together can do a reasonably good job. Just how effective is your training in the art of being receptive? Will now inquired. There are degrees of receptivity, she answered. Very little of it in a science lesson, for example. Science starts with observation, but the observation is always selective. You have to look at the world through a lattice of projected concepts. Then you take the moksha medicine and suddenly there are hardly any concepts. You don't select and immediately classify what you experience, you just take it in. It's like that poem of Wordsworth's, Bring with you a heart that watches and receives. In these bridge-building sessions I've been describing there's still quite a lot of busy selecting and projecting, but not nearly so much as in the preceding science lessons. The children don't suddenly turn into little tatagatas. They don't achieve the pure receptivity that comes with the moksha medicine. Far from it. All one can say is that they learn to go easy on names and notions. For a little while they're taking in a lot more than they give out. What do you make them do with what they've taken in? We merely ask them, Mrs. Narayan answered with a smile, to attempt the impossible. The children are told to translate their experience into words. As a piece of pure, unconceptualized giveness, what is this flower, this dissected frog, this planet at the other end of the telescope? What does it mean? What does it make you think, feel, imagine, remember? Try to put it down on paper. You won't succeed, of course, but try all the same. It'll help you to understand the difference between words and events, between knowing about things and being acquainted with them. And when you've finished writing, we tell them, look at the flower again, and after you've looked, shut your eyes for a minute or two, then draw what came to you when your eyes were closed. Draw whatever it may have been, something vague or vivid, something like the flower itself or something entirely different. Draw what you saw or even what you didn't see. Draw it and colour it with your pens or crayons. Then take another rest, and after that, compare your first drawing with the second. Compare the scientific description of the flower with what you wrote about it when you weren't analysing what you saw, when you behaved as though you didn't know anything about the flower and just permitted the mystery of its existence to come to you, like that, out of the blue. Then compare your drawings and writings with the drawings and writings of the other boys and girls in the class. You'll notice that the analytical descriptions and illustrations are very similar, whereas the drawings and writings of the other kind are very different from one another. How is all this connected with what you have learned in school, at home, in the jungle, in the temple? Dozens of questions, and all of them insistent. The bridges have to be built in all directions. One starts with botany, or any other subject in the school curriculum, and one finds oneself, at the end of a bridge-building session, thinking about the nature of language, about different kinds of experience, about metaphysics and the conduct of life, about analytical knowledge and the wisdom of the other shore. How on earth, Will asked, did you ever manage to teach the teachers who now teach the children to build these bridges? We began teaching teachers a hundred and seven years ago, said Mrs. Narayan. Classes of young men and women who had been educated in the traditional Balinese way. You know, good manners, good agriculture, good arts and crafts, tempered by folk medicine, old wives' physics and biology, and a belief in the power of magic and the truth of fairy tales. No science, no history no knowledge of anything going on in the outside world. But these future teachers were pious Buddhists. 
Most of them practised meditation, and all of them had read or listened to quite a lot of Mahayana philosophy. That meant that in the fields of applied metaphysics and psychology, they had been educated far more thoroughly and far more realistically than any group of future teachers in your part of the world. Dr. Andrew was a scientifically trained, anti-dogmatic humanist who had discovered the value of pure and applied Mahayana. His friend the Raja was a tantric Buddhist who had discovered the value of pure and applied science. Both, consequently, saw very clearly that to be capable of teaching children to become fully human in a society fit for fully human beings to live in, a teacher would first have to be taught how to make the best of both worlds. And how did those early teachers feel about it? Didn't they resist the process? Mrs. Narayan shook her head. They didn't resist, for the good reason that nothing precious had been attacked. Their Buddhism was respected. All they were asked to give up was the old wives' science and the fairy tales, and in exchange for those, they got all kinds of much more interesting facts and much more useful theories. And these exciting things from your Western world of knowledge and power and progress were now to be combined with, and in a sense subordinated to, the theories of Buddhism and the psychological facts of applied metaphysics. There was really nothing in that best-of-both-worlds program to offend the susceptibilities of even the touchiest and most ardent of religious patriots. "'I'm wondering about our future teachers,' said Will, after a silence. "'At this late stage, would they be teachable? Could they possibly learn to make the best of both worlds? Why not?' They wouldn't have to give up on any of the things that are really important to them. The non-Christian could go on thinking about man, and the Christian could go on worshipping God. No change, except that God would have to be thought of as imminent, and man would have to be thought of as potentially self-transcendent. And do you think they'd make those changes without any fuss? Will laughed. You're an optimist. An optimist, said Mrs. Narayan, for the simple reason that if one tackles a problem intelligently and realistically, the results are apt to be fairly good. This island justifies a certain optimism. And now let's go and have a look at the dancing class. They crossed a tree-shaded courtyard and, pushing through a swing door, passed out of silence into the rhythmic beat of a drum and the screech of fifes, repeating over and over again a short pentatonic tune that to Will's ears sounded vaguely scotch. Live music or canned? he asked. Japanese tape. Mrs. Narayan answered laconically. She opened a second door that gave access to a large gymnasium where two bearded young men and an amazingly agile little old lady in black satin slacks were teaching some twenty or thirty little boys and girls the steps of a lively dance. What's this? Will asked. Fun or education? Both, said the principal, and it's also applied ethics. Like those breathing exercises we were talking about just now, only more effective because so much more violent. So stamp it out, the children were chanting in unison, and they stamped their small, sandaled feet with all their might. So stamp it out! A final furious stamp, and they were off again, jigging and turning into another movement of the dance. This is called the Rakshasi hornpipe, said Mrs. Narayan. Rakshasi? Will questioned. What's that? A Rakshasi is a species of demon, very large and exceedingly unpleasant, all the ugliest passions personified. The Rakshasi hornpipe is a device for letting off those dangerous heads of steam raised by anger and frustration. So stamp it out, the music had come round again to the choral refrain. So stamp it out. Stamp again, cried the little old lady, setting a furious example. Harder, harder. Which did more, Will speculated, for morality and rational behaviour. The Bacchic orgies or the Republic? the Nicomachean ethics or Corybantic dancing. The Greeks, said Mrs. Narayan, were much too sensible to think in terms of either or. For them it was always not only but also, not only Plato and Aristotle, but also the Maenads. Without those tension-reducing hornpipes, the moral philosophy would have been impotent. And without the moral philosophy, the hornpipers wouldn't have known where to go next. All we've done is to take a leaf out of the old Greek book. Very good, said Will approvingly, then remembering, as sooner or later, however keen his pleasure and however genuine his enthusiasm, he always did remember, that he was the man who wouldn't take yes for an answer, he suddenly broke into laughter. Not that it makes any difference in the long run, he said. Corybantism couldn't stop the Greeks from cutting one another's throats. 
And when Colonel Deeper decides to move, what will your Rakshasi hornpipes do for you? Help you to reconcile yourselves to your fate, perhaps? That's all. Yes, that's all, said Mrs. Narian. But being reconciled to one's fate, that's already a great achievement. You seem to take it all very calmly. What would be the point of taking it hysterically? It wouldn't make our political situation any better. It would merely make our personal situation a good deal worse. So stamp it out, the children shouted again in unison, and the boards trembled under their pounding feet. So stamp it out! Don't imagine, Mrs. Narayan resumed, that this is the only kind of dancing we teach. Redirecting the power generated by bad feelings is important, but equally important is directing good feelings and right knowledge into expression. Expressive movements in this case, expressive gesture. If you had come yesterday, when our visiting master was here, I could have shown you how we teach that kind of dancing. Not today, unfortunately. He won't be here again before Tuesday. What sort of dancing does he teach? Mrs. Narian tried to describe it. No leaps, no high kicks, no running. The feet always firmly on the ground, just bending and sideways motion of the knees and hips. All expression confined to the arms, wrists and hands, to the neck and head, the face, and above all, the eyes. Movement from the shoulders upwards and outwards. Movement intrinsically beautiful and at the same time charged with symbolic meaning. Thought taking shape in ritual and stylized gesture. The whole body transformed into a hieroglyph, a succession of hieroglyphs or attitudes modulating from significance to significance like a poem or a piece of music. Movements of the muscles representing movements of consciousness, the passage of suchness into the many, of the many into the imminent and ever-present one. It's meditation in action, she concluded. It's the metaphysics of the Mahayana expressed not in words, but through symbolic movements and gestures. They left the gymnasium by different door from that through which they had entered and turned left along a short corridor. What's the next item? Will asked. The lower fourth. Mrs. Narayan answered, and they're working on elementary practical psychology. She opened a green door. Well, now you know, Will heard a familiar voice saying, nobody has to feel pain. You told yourselves that the pin wouldn't hurt, and it didn't hurt. They stepped into the room, and there, very tall in the midst of a score of plump or skinny little brown bodies, was Susila MacPhail. She smiled at them, pointed to a couple of chairs in the corner of the room, and turned back to the children. Nobody has to feel pain, she repeated, but never forget. Pain always means that something is wrong. You've learned to shut pain off, but don't do it thoughtlessly. Don't do it without asking yourselves the question, what's the reason for this pain? And if it's bad, or if there's no obvious reason for it, tell your mother about it, or your teacher, or any grown-up in your mutual adoption club. Then shut off the pain. Shut it off knowing that if anything needs to be done, it will be done. Do you understand? And now, she went on, after all the questions had been asked and answered, now let's play some pretending games. Shut your eyes and pretend you're looking at that poor old minor bird with one leg that comes to school every day to be fed. Can you see him? Of course they could see him. The one-legged minor was evidently an old friend. See him just as clearly as you saw him today at lunchtime. And don't stare at him. Don't make any effort. Just see what comes to you and let your eyes shift from his beak to his tail, from his bright little round eye to his one orange leg. I can hear him too, a little girl volunteered. He's saying, Karuna, Karuna. That's not true, another child said indignantly. He's saying, attention. He's saying both those things, Susila assured them, and probably a lot of other words besides. But now we're going to do some real pretending. Pretend that there are two one-legged minor birds, three one-legged minor birds, four one-legged minor birds. Can you see all four of them? They could. Four one-legged minor birds at the four corners of a square and a fifth one in the middle. And now let's make them change their colour. They're white now. Five white minor birds with yellow heads and one orange leg. And now their heads are blue, bright blue. And the rest of the bird is pink. Five pink birds with blue heads, and they keep changing. They're purple now. Five purple birds with white heads, and each of them has one pale green leg. Goodness, what's happening? There aren't five of them. There are ten. No, twenty. Fifty. 
A hundred, hundreds and hundreds. Can you see them? Some of them could, without the slightest difficulty. And for those who couldn't go the whole hog, Susila proposed more modest goals. Just make twelve of them, she said, or if twelve is too many, make ten, make eight. That's still an awful lot of miners. And now, she went on, when all the children had conjured up all the purple birds that each was capable of creating, now they're gone. She clapped her hands. Gone, every single one of them. There's nothing there. And now you're not going to see miners. You're going to see me. One me in yellow. Two me's in green. Three me's in blue with pink spots. Four me's in the brightest red you ever saw. She clapped her hands again. All gone. And this time it's Mrs. Narian and that funny-looking man with a stiff leg who came in with her. Four of each of them, standing in a big circle in the gymnasium, and now they're dancing the Rakshasi hornpipe. So stamp it out, so stamp it out. There was a general giggle. The dancing withles and principles must have looked richly comical. Susila so snapped her fingers. Away with them, vanish. And now each of you sees three of your mothers and three of your fathers running round the playground. Faster, faster, faster. And suddenly they're not there any more. And then they are there. But next moment they aren't. They are there. They aren't. They are. They aren't. The giggles swelled into squeals of laughter, and at the height of the laughter, a bell rang. The lesson in elementary practical psychology was over. What's the point of it all? Will asked when the children had run off to play and Mrs. Narian had returned to her office. The point, Susila answered, is to get people to understand that we're not completely at the mercy of our memory and our fantasies. If we're disturbed by what's going on inside our heads, we can do something about it. It's all a question of being shown what to do and then practising, the way one learns to write or play the flute. What those children you saw here were being taught is a very simple technique, a technique that we'll develop later on into a method of liberation. Not complete liberation, of course, but half a loaf is a great deal better than no bread. This technique won't lead you to the discovery of your Buddha nature, but it may help you to prepare for that discovery, help you by liberating you from the hauntings of your own painful memories, your remorses, your causeless anxieties about the future. Hauntings, Will agreed, is the word. But one doesn't have to be haunted. Some of the ghosts can be laid quite easily. Whenever one of them appears, just give it the imagination treatment. Deal with it as we dealt with those miners, as we dealt with you and Mrs. Narian. Change its clothes, give it another nose, multiply it, tell it to go away, call it back again, and make it do something ridiculous. Then abolish it. Just think what you could have done about your father if someone had taught you a few of these simple little tricks when you were a child. You thought of him as a terrifying ogre, but that wasn't necessary. In your fancy, you could have turned the ogre into a grotesque, into a whole chorus of grotesques, twenty of them doing a tap dance and singing, I dreamt I dwelt in marble halls. A short course in elementary practical psychology, and your whole life might have been different. How would he have dealt with Molly's death? Will wondered, as they walked out towards the parked jeep. What rites of imaginative exorcism could he have practised on that white, musk-scented succubus who was the incarnation of his frantic and abhorred desires? But here was the jeep. Will handed Susila the keys and laboriously hoisted himself into his seat, very noisily as though it were under some neurotic compulsion to overcompensate for its diminutive stature, a small and aged car approached from the direction of the village, turned into the driveway and, still clattering and shuddering, came to a halt beside the jeep. They turned. There, leaning out of the window of the royal baby Austin, was Murugan, and beyond him, vast in white muslin and billowy like a cumulus cloud, sat the Rani. Will bowed in her direction and evoked the most gracious of smiles, which was switched off as soon as she turned to Susila, whose greeting was acknowledged only with the most distant of nods. "'Going for a drive?' Will asked politely. "'Only as far as Shivapuram,' said the Rani. "'If this wretched little crate will hold together that long,' Morgan added bitterly. He turned the ignition key. The motor gave a last obscene hiccup and died. "'There are some people we have to see,' the Rani went on. "'Or rather, one person.' she added in a tone charged with conspiratorial significance. She smiled at Will and very nearly winked. Pretending not to understand that she was talking about Bahu, Will uttered a non-committal, Quite, 
and commiserated with her on all the work and worry that the preparations for next week's coming-of-age party must entail. Murugan interrupted him. What are you doing out here? he asked. I spend the afternoon taking an intelligent interest in Polony's education. Polony's education, the Rani echoed, and again, sorrowfully, Polony's... Pause. Education. She shook her head. Personally, said Will, I liked everything I saw and heard of it, from Mr. Menon and the principal to elementary practical psychology as taught, he added, trying to bring Susila into the conversation, by Mrs. MacPhail here. Still studiedly ignoring Susila, the Rani pointed a thick accusing finger at the scarecrows in the field below. Have you seen those, Mr. Farnaby? He had indeed. And where but in parlour, he asked, can one find scarecrows which are simultaneously beautiful, efficient, and metaphysically significant? And which, said the Rani, in a voice that was vibrant with a kind of sepulchral indignation, not only scare the birds away from the rice, they also scare little children away from the very idea of God and his avatars. She raised her hand. Listen, Tom Krishna and Mary Sarajini had been joined by five or six small companions and were making a game of tugging at the strings that worked the supernatural marionettes. From the group came a sound of shrill voices piping in unison. At their second repetition, Will made out the words of the shanty, Pully hawly, tug with a will, the gods wiggle waggle, but the sky stands still. Bravo, he said, and laughed. I'm afraid I can't be amused, said the Rani severely. It isn't funny. It's tragic. Tragic. Will stuck to his guns. I understand, he said that these charming scarecrows were an invention of Morrigan's grandfather. Morrigan's grandfather, said the Rani, was a very remarkable man, remarkably intelligent, but no less remarkably perverse. Great gifts, but alas, how maleficently used, and what made it so much worse, he was full of false spirituality. False spirituality? Will eyed the enormous specimen of true spirituality, and through the reek of hot petroleum products, inhaled the incense-like, otherworldly smell of sandalwood. False spirituality? And suddenly he found himself wondering, wondering, and then, with a shudder, imagining what the Rani would look like if suddenly divested of her mystic's uniform and exposed exuberantly and steatopigiously naked to the light, and now multiply her into a trinity of undressed obesities, into two trinities, ten trinities, Applied practical psychology with a vengeance. Yes, false spirituality, the Rani was repeating, talking about liberation, but always because of his obstinate refusal to follow the true path, always working for greater bondage, acting the part of humility. But in his heart he was so full of pride, Mr. Farnaby, that he refused to recognise any spiritual authority higher than his own. The masters, the avatars, the great tradition, they meant nothing to him, nothing at all. Hence those dreadful scarecrows, hence that blasphemous rhyme that the children have been taught to sing. When I think of those poor innocent little ones being deliberately perverted, I find it hard to contain myself, Mr. Farnaby. I find it— Listen, mother, said Murugan, who had been glancing impatiently and ever more openly at his wristwatch. If we want to be back by dinner time, we'd better get going. His tone was rudely authoritative. Being at the wheel of a car, even of this senile baby Austin, made him feel, it was evident, considerably larger than life. Without waiting for the Rani's answer, he started the motor, shifted into low, and, with a wave of the hand, drove off. "'Good riddance,' said Susila. "'Don't you love your dear queen? She makes my blood boil.' "'So stamp it out,' Will chanted teasingly. You're quite right, she agreed with a laugh, but unfortunately this was an occasion when it just wasn't feasible to do a rakshasi hornpipe. Her face brightened with a sudden flash of mischief, and without warning she punched him, surprisingly hard, in the ribs. There, she said, now I feel much better. 14. She started the motor, and they drove off, down to the bypass, up again to the high road beyond the other end of the village and on into the compound of the experimental station. 
Susila pulled up at a small, thatched bungalow like all the others. They climbed the six steps that led up to the veranda and entered a whitewashed living room. To the left was a wide window with a hammock slung between the two wooden pillars at either side of the projecting bay. For you, she said, pointing to the hammock, you can put your leg up. And when Will had lowered himself into the net, what shall we talk about? she asked as she pulled up a wicker chair and sat down beside him. What about the good, the true, and the beautiful? Or maybe, he grinned, the ugly, the bad, and the even truer. I thought, she said, ignoring his attempt at a witticism, that we might go on where we left off last time. Go on talking about you. That was precisely what I was suggesting. The ugly, the bad, and the truer than all official truth. Is this just an exhibition of your conversational style? she asked. Or do you really want to talk about yourself? Really, he assured her. Desperately. Just as desperately as I don't want to talk about myself. Hence, as you may have noticed, my unflagging interest in art, science, philosophy, politics, literature, any damn thing rather than the only thing that ultimately has any importance. There was a long silence. Then, in a tone of casual reminiscence, Susila began to talk about Wells Cathedral, about the calling of the jackdaws, about the white swans floating between the reflections of the floating clouds. In a few minutes he too was floating. I was very happy all the time I was at Wells, she said, wonderfully happy. And so were you, weren't you? Will made no answer. He was remembering those days in the Green Valley, years ago, before he and Molly were married, before they were lovers. What peace! What a solid, living, maggotless world of springing grass and flowers, and between them had flowed the kind of natural, undistorted feeling that he hadn't experienced since those far-off days when Aunt Mary was alive. The only person he had ever really loved, and here, in Molly, was her successor. What blessedness! Love transposed into another key, but the melody, the rich and subtle harmonies, were the same. And then, on the fourth night of their stay, Molly had knocked on the wall that separated their rooms, and he had found her door ajar, had groped his way in darkness to the bed where, conscientiously naked, the Sister of Mercy was doing her best to play the part of the wife of love, doing her best and, how disastrously, failing. Suddenly, as happened almost every afternoon, there was a loud rushing of wind and, muffled by distance, a hollow roaring of rain on thick foliage, a roaring that grew louder and louder as the shower approached. A few seconds passed, and then the raindrops were hammering insistently on the window panes, hammering as they had hammered on the windows of his study that day of their last interview. Do you really mean it, Will? The pain and shame of it made him want to cry aloud. He bit his lip. What are you thinking of? Cecile asked. It wasn't a matter of thinking. He was actually seeing her, actually hearing her voice. Do you really mean it, Will? And through the sound of the rain he heard himself answering, I really mean it. On the window pane. Was it here, or was it there? Was it then? The roar had diminished as the gust spent itself to a pattering whisper. What are you thinking of? Susila insisted. I was thinking of what I did to Molly. What was it that you did to Molly? He didn't want to answer, but Susila was inexorable. Tell me what it was that you did. Another violent gust made the windows rattle. It was raining harder now. Raining, it seemed, to Will Farnaby on purpose. Raining in such a way that he would have to go on remembering what he didn't want to remember would be compelled to say out loud the shameful things he must at all costs keep to himself. Tell me. Reluctantly, and in spite of himself, he told her. Do you really mean it, Will? And because of Babs. Babs, God help him. Babs, believe it or not, he really did mean it, and she had walked out into the rain. The next time I saw her was in the hospital. Was it still raining? Susila asked. Still raining? As hard as it's raining now? Very nearly. And what Will heard was no longer this afternoon shower in the tropics, but the steady drumming on the window of the little room where Molly lay dying. 
It's me, he was saying through the sound of the rain. It's Will. Nothing happened. And then suddenly he felt the almost imperceptible movement of Molly's hand within his own. The voluntary pressure, and then, after a few seconds, the involuntary release, the total limpness. Tell me again, Will. He shook his head. It was too painful, too humiliating. Tell me again, she insisted. It's the only way. Making an enormous effort, he started to tell the odious story yet once more. Did he really mean it? Yes, he really meant it. Meant to hurt. Meant, perhaps, did one ever know what one really intended? To kill. All for Babs or the world well lost. Not his world, of course. Molly's world. And at the centre of that world, the life that had created it. Snuffed out for the sake of that delicious smell in the darkness. Of those muscular reflexes, that enormity of enjoyment, those consummate and intoxicatingly shameless skills. Goodbye, Will. And the door had closed behind her, with a faint, dry click. He wanted to call her back. But Bab's lover remembered the skills, the reflexes, and within its aura of musk, a body agonising in the extremity of pleasure. Remembered these things and, standing at the window, watched the car move away through the rain. Watched and was filled, as it turned the corner, with a shameful exultation. Free at last. Even freer, as he discovered three hours later in the hospital, than he had supposed. For now he was feeling the last faint pressure of her fingers, feeling the final message of her love. And then the message was interrupted. The hand went limp, and now, suddenly, appallingly, there was no sound of breathing. Dead, he whispered, and felt himself choking. Dead. Suppose it hadn't been your fault, said Susila, breaking a long silence. Suppose that she'd suddenly died without your having had anything to do with it. Wouldn't that have been almost as bad? What do you mean? he asked. I mean, it's more than just feeling guilty about Molly's death. It's death itself, death as such that you find so terrible. She was thinking of Dugald now. So senselessly evil. Senselessly evil, he repeated. Yes, perhaps that's why I had to be a professional execution watcher, just because it was all so senseless, so utterly bestial, following the smell of death from one end of the earth to the other, like a vulture. Nice, comfortable people just don't have any idea what the world is like, not exceptionally as it was during the war, but all the time, all the time. And as he spoke, he was seeing, in a vision as brief and comprehensive and intensely circumstantial as a drowning man's, all the hateful scenes he had witnessed in the course of those well-paid pilgrimages to every hellhole and abattoir revolting enough to qualify as news. Negroes in South Africa, the men in the San Quentin gas chamber, mangled bodies in an Algerian farmhouse, and everywhere mobs. Everywhere policemen and paratroopers, everywhere those dark-skinned children, stick-legged, pot-bellied with flies on their raw eyelids, everywhere the nauseating smells of hunger and disease, the awful stench of death. And then suddenly, through the stench of death, mingled and impregnated with the stench of death, he was breathing the musky essence of Babs, breathing the essence of Babs and remembering his little joke about the chemistry of purgatory and paradise. Purgatory is tetraethylene diamine and sulfurated hydrogen. Paradise, very definitely, is centrinitropsibutyl toluene, with an assortment of organic impurities. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, the delights of social life. And then, quite suddenly, the odours of love and death gave place to a rank animal smell, a smell of dog. The wind swelled up again into violence, and the driving raindrops hammered and splashed against the panes. Are you still thinking of Molly? Susila asked. I was thinking of something I'd completely forgotten, he answered. I can't have been more than four years old when it happened, and now it's all come back to me. Poor Tiger. Who was poor Tiger? she questioned. Tiger, his beautiful red setter. Tiger, the only source of light in that dismal house where he had spent his childhood. Tiger, dear, dear Tiger. 
in the midst of all that fear and misery, between the two poles of his father's sneering hate of everything and everybody, and his mother's self-conscious self-sacrifice, what effortless goodwill, what spontaneous friendliness, what a bounding, barking, irrepressible joy. His mother used to take him on her knee and tell him about God and Jesus, but there was more God in Tiger than in all her Bible stories. Tiger, so far as he was concerned, was the Incarnation. And then one day the Incarnation came down with distemper. What happened then? Susila asked. His basket's in the kitchen, and I'm there, kneeling beside it. And I'm stroking him, but his fur feels quite different from what it felt like before he was sick. Kind of sticky. And there's a bad smell. If I didn't love him so much, I'd run away. I couldn't bear to be near him. But I do love him. I love him more than anything or anybody. And while I stroke him, I keep telling him that he'll soon be well again. Very soon, tomorrow morning. And then all of a sudden he starts to shudder, and I try to stop the shuddering by holding his head between my hands. But it doesn't do any good. The trembling turns into a horrible convulsion. It makes me feel sick to look at it, and I'm frightened. I'm dreadfully frightened. Then the shuddering and the twitching die down, and in a little while he's absolutely still. And when I lift his head and then let go, the head falls back. Thump, like a piece of meat with a bone inside. Will's voice broke. The tears were streaming down his cheeks. He was shaken by the sobs of a four-year-old, grieving for his dog and confronted by the awful, inexplicable fact of death. With the mental equivalent of a click and a little jerk, his consciousness seemed to change gear. He was an adult again, and he had ceased to float. I'm sorry, he wiped his eyes and blew his nose. Well, that was my first introduction to the essential horror. Tiger was my friend. Tiger was my only consolation. That was something, obviously, that the essential horror couldn't tolerate. And it was the same with my Aunt Mary, the only person I ever really loved and admired and completely trusted and... Christ, what the essential horror did to her. Tell me, said Susila. Will hesitated, then, shrugging his shoulders. Why not, he said. Mary Frances Farnaby, my father's younger sister. Married at eighteen, just a year before the outbreak of the First World War, to a professional soldier. Frank and Mary. Mary and Frank. What harmony. What happiness. He laughed. Even outside of Palo, there one can find occasional islands of decency, tiny little atolls, or even, every now and then, a full-blown Tahiti, but always totally surrounded by the essential horror. Two young people on their private parlour. Then, one fine morning, it was August 4th, 1914, Frank went overseas with the expeditionary force, and on Christmas Eve Mary gave birth to a deformed child that survived long enough for her to see for herself— what the E.H. can do when it really tries. Only God can make a microcephalous idiot. Three months later, needless to say, Frank was hit by a piece of shrapnel and died in due course of gangrene. All that, Will went on after a little silence, was before my time. When I first knew her in the twenties, Aunt Mary was devoting herself to the aged. Old people in institutions. Old people cooped up in their own homes old people living on and on as a burden to their children and grandchildren. Strolbrugs, tetanuses, and the more hopeless the decrepitude, the more crotchety and querulous the character, the better. As a child, how I hated Aunt Mary's old people. They smelt bad, they were frighteningly ugly, they were always boring and generally cross. But Aunt Mary really loved them. Loved them through thick and thin. Loved them in spite of everything. My mother used to talk a lot about Christian charity, but somehow one never believed what she said, just as one never felt any love in all the self-sacrificing things she was always forcing herself to do. No love, only duty. Whereas with Aunt Mary one was never in the slightest doubt. Her love was like a kind of physical radiation, something one could almost sense as heat or light. When she took me to stay with her in the country, and later, when she came to town, and I used to go and see her almost every day. It was like escaping from a refrigerator into the sunshine. I could feel myself coming alive in that light of hers, that radiating warmth. Then the essential horror got busy again. 
At the beginning she made a joke of it. Now I'm an Amazon, she said after the first operation. Why an Amazon? Susila asked. The Amazons had their right breast amputated. They were warriors and the breast got in the way when they were shooting with the longbow. Now I'm an Amazon, he repeated. And with his mind's eye he could see the smile on that strong aquiline face, could hear with his mind's ear the tone of amusement in that clear, ringing voice. But a few months later the other breast had to be cut off. After that there were the X-rays, the radiation sickness, and then, little by little, the degradation. Will's face took on its look of flayed ferocity. If it weren't so unspeakably hideous, it would be really funny. What a masterpiece of irony. He was a soul that radiated goodness and love and heroic charity. Then, for no known reason, something went wrong. Instead of flouting it, a little piece of her body started to obey the second law of thermodynamics. And as the body broke down, the soul began to lose its virtue, its very identity. The heroism went out of her, the love and the goodness evaporated. For the last months of her life she was no more the Aunt Mary I had loved and admired. She was somebody else, somebody, and this was the ironist's final and most exquisite touch, almost indistinguishable from the worst and weakest of the old people she had once befriended and been a tower of strength to. She had to be humiliated and degraded, and when the degradation was complete she was slowly, and with a great deal of pain, put to death in solitude. In solitude? he insisted, for of course nobody can help, nobody can ever be present. People may stand by while you're suffering and dying, but they're standing by in another world. In your world you're absolutely alone. Alone in your suffering and your dying, just as you're alone in love, alone even in the most completely shared pleasure. The essences of Babs and of Tiger, and when the cancer had gnawed a hole in the liver and her wasted body was impregnated with that strange aromatic smell of contaminated blood, the essence of Aunt Mary dying. And in the midst of those essences, sickeningly or intoxicatedly aware of them, was an isolated consciousness, a child's, a boy's, a man's, forever isolated, irremediably alone. And on top of everything else, he went on, this woman was only forty-two. She didn't want to die. She refused to accept what was being done to her, the essential horror had to drag her down by main force. I was there. I saw it happening. And that's why you're the man who won't take yes for an answer? How can anyone take yes for an answer? He countered. Yes is just pretending, just positive thinking. The facts, the basic and ultimate facts, are always no. Spirit? No. Love? No. Sense? Meaning? Achievement? No. Tiger exuberantly alive and joyful and full of God, and then Tiger transformed by the essential horror into a packet of garbage, which the vet had to come and be paid for removing, and after Tiger, Aunt Mary, maimed and tortured, dragged in the mud, degraded and finally, like Tiger, transformed into a packet of garbage, only this time it was the undertaker who had removed it, and a clergyman was hired to make believe that it was all in some sublime and pickwickian sense perfectly okay. Twenty years later, another clergyman had been hired to repeat the same strange rigmarole over Molly's coffin. If, after the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Will uttered another of his hyena laughs. What impeccable logic! What sensibility! What ethical refinement! But you're the man who won't take yes for an answer, so why raise any objections? I oughtn't to, he agreed, but one remains an aesthete, and one likes to have the no said with style. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. He screwed up his face in an expression of disgust. And yet, said Susila, in a certain sense the advice is excellent. Eating, drinking, dying. Three primary manifestations of the universal and impersonal life. Animals live that impersonal and universal life without knowing its nature. Ordinary people know its nature but don't live it, and, if ever they think seriously about it, refuse to accept it. An enlightened person knows it, lives it, and accepts it completely. He eats, he drinks, and in due course he dies. But he eats with a difference, drinks with a difference, dies with a difference. 
And rises again from the dead? he asked sarcastically. That's one of the questions the Buddha always refused to discuss. Believing in eternal life never helped anybody to live in eternity. Nor, of course, did disbelieving. So stop all your proing and conning. That's the Buddha's advice. And get on with the job. Which job? Everybody's job. Enlightenment. Which means here and now the preliminary job of practicing all the yogas of increased awareness. But I don't want to be more aware, said Will. I want to be less aware. Less aware of horrors like Aunt Mary's death and the slums of Rendang Lobo. Less aware of hideous sights and loathsome smells, even of some delicious smells, he added, as he caught through the remembered essences of dog and cancer of the liver a civet-like whiff of the pink alcove. Less aware of my fat income and other people's subhuman poverty. Less aware of my own excellent health in an ocean of malaria and hookworm, of my own safely sterilised sex fun in the ocean of starving babies. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. What a blessed state of affairs. But unfortunately I do know what I'm doing, only too well. And here you go, asking me to be even more aware than I am already. I'm not asking anything, she said. I'm merely passing on the advice of a succession of shrewd old birds, beginning with Gautama and ending with the old Raja. Start by being fully aware of what you think you are. It'll help you to become aware of what you are in fact. He shrugged his shoulders. One thinks one's something unique and wonderful at the centre of the universe, but in fact one's merely a slight delay in the ongoing march of entropy. And that precisely is the first half of the Buddha's message. Transience, no permanent soul, inevitable sorrow. But he didn't stop there, the message had a second half. This temporary slowdown of entropy is also pure undiluted suchness. This absence of a permanent soul is also the Buddha nature. Absence of a soul. That's easy to cope with. But what about the presence of cancer? The presence of slow degradation? What about hunger and overbreeding and Colonel Deepa? Are they pure suchness? Of course. But, needless to say, it's desperately difficult for the people who are deeply involved in any of those evils to discover their Buddha nature. Public health and social reform are the indispensable preconditions of any kind of general enlightenment. But in spite of public health and social reform, people still die. Even in Pala, he added ironically, which is why the corollary of welfare has to be Dhyana, all the yogas of living and dying so that you can be aware, even in the final agony, of who in fact, and in spite of everything, you really are. And there was a sound of footsteps on the planking of the veranda, and a childish voice called, Mother! Here I am, darling, Susilla called back. The front door was flung open, and Mary Saragini came hurrying into the room. Mother, she said breathlessly, they want you to come at once. It's Granny Lakshmi. She's... Catching sight for the first time of the figure in the hammock, she started and broke off. Oh, I didn't know you were here. Will waved his hand to her without speaking. She gave him a perfunctory smile, then turned back to her mother. Granny Lakshmi suddenly got much worse, she said, and Grandpa Robert is still up at the high altitude station, and they can't get through to him on the telephone. Did you run all the way, except where it's really too steep? Susilla put her arm round the child and kissed her, then very brisk and businesslike, rose to his feet. It's Dougal's mother, she said. Is she... He glanced at Mary Saragini, then back at Susila. Was death taboo? Could one mention it before children? You mean, is she dying? He nodded. We've been expecting it, of course, Susila went on. But not today. Today she seemed a little better. She shook her head. Well, I have to go and stand by, even if it is another world. And actually, she added, it isn't quite so completely other as you think. I'm sorry we had to leave our business unfinished, but there'll be other opportunities. Meanwhile, what do you want to do? You can stay here, or I'll drop you at Dr. Roberts. Or you can come with me and Mary Saragini. As a professional execution watcher? Not as a professional execution watcher, she answered emphatically. As a human being, as someone who needs to know how to live and then how to die. Needs it as urgently as we all do. Needs it, he said, a lot more urgently than most. But shan't I be in the way? If you can get out of your own way, you won't be in anyone else's. She took his hand and helped him out of the hammock. Two minutes later they were driving past the lotus pool and the huge Buddha meditating under the cobra's hood. 
past the white bull out through the main gate of the compound. The rain was over. In a green sky, enormous clouds glowed like archangels. Low in the west, the sun was shining with a brightness that seemed almost supernatural. Soles oxidere et redire possunt. Nobis cum semel oxidit brevis lux. Nox est perpetua una dormienda. Damibas mile. Sunsets and death. Death and therefore kisses. Kisses and consequently birth, and then death for yet another generation of sunset watchers. What do you say to people who are dying? he asked. Do you tell them not to bother their heads about immortality and get on with the job? If you like to put it that way, yes, that's precisely what we do. Going on being aware, it's the whole art of dying. And you teach the art? I'd put it another way. We help them to go on practicing the art of living even while they're dying, knowing who in fact one is, being conscious of the universal and impersonal life that lives itself through each of us. That's the art of living, and that's what one can help the dying to go on practicing, to the very end. Maybe beyond the end. Beyond? he questioned. But you said that was something that the dying aren't supposed to think about. They're not being asked to think about it. They're being helped. If there is such a thing, to experience it. If there is such a thing, she repeated, if the universal life goes on, when the separate me life is over. Do you personally think it does go on? Susila smiled. What I personally think is beside the point. All that matters is what I may impersonally experience while I'm living, when I'm dying, maybe when I'm dead. She swung the car into a parking space and turned off the engine. On foot they entered the village. Work was over for the day and the main street was so densely thronged that it was hard for them to pass. I'm going ahead by myself, Susila announced. Then to Mary Saragini, be at the hospital in about an hour, she said, not before. She turned and threading her way between the slowly promenading groups was soon lost to view. You're in charge now, said Will, smiling down at the child by his side. Mary Saragini nodded gravely and took his hand. Let's go and see what's happening in the square she said. How old is your granny Lakshmi? Will asked as they started to make their way along the crowded street. I don't really know, Mary Saragini answered. She looks terribly old, but maybe that's because she's got cancer. Do you know what cancer is? he asked. Mary Saragini knew perfectly well. It's what happens when part of you forgets all about the rest of you and carries on the way people do when they're crazy just goes on blowing itself up and blowing itself up as if there was nobody else in the whole world. Sometimes you can do something about it, but generally it just goes on blowing itself up until the person dies. And that's what has happened, I gather, to your granny Lakshmi. And now she needs someone to help her die. Does your mother often help people die? The child nodded. She's awfully good at it. Have you ever seen anyone die? Of course, Mary Saragini answered evidently surprised that such a question should be asked. Let me see. She made a mental calculation. I've seen five people die. Six, if you count babies. I hadn't seen anyone die when I was your age. You hadn't? Only a dog. Dogs die easier than people. They don't talk about it beforehand. How do you feel about... about people dying? Well, it isn't nearly so bad as having babies. That's awful. Or at least it looks awful but then you remind yourself that it doesn't hurt at all. They've turned off the pain. Believe it or not, said Will, I've never seen a baby being born. Never, Mary Saragini was astonished. Not even when you were at school. Will had a vision of his headmaster in full canonicals conducting three hundred black-coated boys on a tour of the lying-in hospital. Not even at school, he said aloud. You never saw anybody dying? and you never saw anybody having a baby. How did you get to know things? In the school I went to, he said, we never got to know things. We only got to know words. The child looked up at him, shook her head, and, lifting a small brown hand, significantly tapped her forehead. Crazy, she said. Or were your teachers just stupid? Will laughed. They were high-minded educators dedicated to mens sana in corpore sano and the maintenance of our sublime Western tradition. But meanwhile, tell me something. Weren't you ever frightened? By people having babies? 
No, by people dying. Didn't that scare you? Well, yes, it did, she said after a moment of silence. So what did you do about it? I did what they teach you to do. Tried to find out which of me was frightened and why she was frightened. And which of you was it? This one. Mary Saragini pointed a forefinger into her open mouth. The one that does all the talking. Little Miss Gibber. That's what Vijaya calls her. She's always talking about all the nasty things I remember, all the huge, wonderful, impossible things I imagine I can do. She's the one that gets frightened. Why is she so frightened? I suppose it's because she gets talking about all the awful things that might happen to her, talking out loud or talking to herself. But there's another one who doesn't get frightened. Which one is that? The one that doesn't talk, just looks and listens and feels what's going on inside. And sometimes, Mary Saragini added, sometimes she suddenly sees how beautiful everything is. No, that's wrong. She sees it all the time, but I don't, not unless she makes me notice it. That's when it suddenly happens. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Even dogs' messes. She pointed at a formidable specimen almost at their feet. From the narrow street they had emerged into the marketplace. The last of the sunlight still touched the sculptured spire of the temple, the little pink gazebos on the roof of the town hall, but here in the square there was premonition of twilight, and under the great banyan tree it was already night. On the stalls between its pillars and hanging ropes, the market women had turned on their lights. In the leafy darkness there were islands of form and colour, and from hardly visible non-entity, brown-skinned figures stepped for a moment into brilliant existence, then back again into nothingness. The spaces between the tall buildings echoed with a confusion of English and Polynesian, of talk and laughter, of street cries and whistled tunes, of dogs barking, parrots screaming. Perched on one of the pink gazebos, a pair of minor birds called indefatigably for attention and compassion. From an open-air kitchen at the centre of the square rose the appetising smell of food on the fire. Onions, peppers, turmeric, fish frying, cakes baking, rice on the boil, and through these good, gross odours, like a reminder from the other shore, drifted the perfume, thin and sweet and ethereally pure, of the many-coloured garlands on sale beside the fountain. Twilight deepened, and suddenly from high overhead, the arc lamps were turned on. Bright and burnished against the rosy copper of oiled skin, the women's necklines and rings and bracelets came alive with glittering reflections. Seen in the downward striking light, every contour became more dramatic, every form seemed to be more substantial, more solidly there. In eye sockets, under nose and chin, the shadows deepened. Modelled by light and darkness, young breasts grew fuller, and the faces of the old were more emphatically lined and hollowed. Hand in hand, they made their way through the crowd. A middle-aged woman greeted Mary Saragini, then turned to Will. Are you that man from the outside? she asked. Almost infinitely from the outside, he assured her. She looked at him for a moment in silence, then smiled encouragingly and patted his cheek. We are all very sorry for you, she said. They moved on, and now they were standing on the fringes of a group assembled at the foot of the temple steps to listen to a young man who was playing a long-necked, lute-like instrument and singing in Polynesian. Rapid declamation alternated with long-drawn, almost bird-like melismata on a single vowel sound, and then a cheerful and more strongly accented tune that ended in a shout. A roar of laughter went up from the crowd. A few more bars, another line or two of recitative, and the singer struck his final chord. There was applause and more laughter, and a chorus of incomprehensible commentary. "'What's it all about?' Will asked. "'It's about girls and boys sleeping together.' Mary Saragini answered. Oh, I see. He felt a pang of guilty embarrassment, but looking down into the child's untroubled face, he could see that his concern was uncalled for. It was evident that boys and girls sleeping together were as completely to be taken for granted as going to school or eating three meals a day. Or dying. And the part that made me laugh, Mary Saragini went on, was where he said the future Buddha won't have to leave home and sit under the Bodhi tree. He'll have his enlightenment while he's in bed with the princess. Do you think that's a good idea? Will asked. She nodded emphatically. It would mean that the princess would be enlightened too. You're perfectly right, said Will. Being a man, I hadn't thought of the princess. The lute player plucked a queer, unfamiliar progression of chords. 
followed them with a ripple of arpeggios and began to sing, this time in English. Everyone talks of sex. Take none of them seriously. Not whore, nor hermit, neither Paul, nor Freud. Love and your lips, her breasts will change mysteriously into themselves, the suchness and the void. The door of the temple swung open, a smell of incense mingled with the ambient onions and fried fish. An old woman emerged and very cautiously lowered her unsteady weight from stair to stair. Who were Paul and Freud? Mary Saragini asked as they moved away. Will began with a brief account of original sin and the scheme of redemption. The child heard him out with concentrated attention. No wonder the song says, don't take them seriously, she concluded. After which, said Will, we come to Dr. Freud and the Oedipus complex. Oedipus? Mary Saragini repeated. But that's the name of a marionette show. I saw it last week, and they're giving it again tonight. Would you like to see it? It's nice. Nice, he repeated. Nice. Even when the old lady turns out to be his mother and hangs herself. Even when Oedipus puts out his eyes. But he doesn't put out his eyes, said Mary Saragini. He does where I hail from. Not here. He only says he's going to put out his eyes, and she only tries to hang herself. They're talked out of it. Who by? The boy and girl from Parla. How do they get into the act? Will asked. I don't know. They're just there. Oedipus in Parla. That's what the play is called. So why shouldn't they be there? And you say they talk Jocasta out of suicide and Oedipus out of blinding himself? Just in the nick of time. She's slipped the rope round her neck and he's got hold of two huge pins. But the boy and girl from Pala tell them not to be silly. After all, it was an accident. He didn't know that the old man was his father. And anyhow, the old man began it, hit him over the head, and that made Oedipus lose his temper. And nobody had ever taught him to dance the Rakshasi hornpipe. And when they made him a king, he had to marry the old queen. She was really his mother, but neither of them knew it. And, of course, all they had to do when they did find out was just to stop being married. That stuff about marrying his mother being the reason why everybody had to die of a virus. All that was just nonsense, just made up by a lot of poor, stupid people who didn't know any better. Dr. Freud thought that all little boys really want to marry their mothers and kill their fathers. And the other way round for little girls, they want to marry their fathers. Which fathers and mothers? Mary Saragini asked. We have such a lot of them. You mean in your mutual adoption club? There's twenty-two of them in our MAC. Safety in numbers. But of course poor old Oedipus never had an MAC. And besides, they taught him all that horrible stuff about God getting furious with people every time they made a mistake. They had pushed their way through the crowd and now found themselves at the entrance to a small, roped-off enclosure in which a hundred or more spectators had already taken their seats. At the further end of the enclosure, the gaily painted proscenium of a puppet theatre glowed red and gold in the light of powerful flood lamps. Pulling out a handful of the small change with which Dr. Robert had provided him, Will paid for two tickets. They entered and sat down on a bench. A gong sounded. The curtain of the little proscenium noiselessly rose, and there, white pillars on a pea-green ground, was the façade of the royal palace of Thebes, with a much-whiskered divinity sitting in a cloud above the pediment. A priest, exactly like the god except that he was somewhat smaller and less exuberantly draped, entered from the right, bowed to the audience, then turned towards the palace and shouted, Oedipus! in piping tones, that seemed comically incongruous with his prophetic beard. To a flourish of trumpets, the door swung open, and crowned and heroically buskined, the king appeared. The priest made obeisance, the royal puppet gave him leave to speak. Give ear to our afflictions, the old man piped. The king cocked his head and listened. I hear the groans of dying men, he said. I hear the shriek of widows, the sobbing of the motherless, the mutterings of prayer and supplication. Supplication, said the deity in the clouds. That's the spirit, he patted himself on the chest. They have some kind of a virus, Mary Saragini explained in a whisper, like Asian flu, only a lot worse. We repeat the appropriate litanies, the old priest querulously piped. We offer the most expensive sacrifices. We have the whole population living in chastity and flagellating itself every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. But the flood of death spreads ever more widely, rises higher and ever higher. So help us, King Oedipus, help us. Only a god can help. Hear, hear, shouted the presiding deity. 
but by what means? Only a god can say. Correct, said the god in his basso profundo. Absolutely correct. Creon, my wife's brother, has gone to consult the oracle. When he returns, as very soon he must, we shall know what heaven advises. What heaven bloody well commands, the basso profundo amended. Were people really so silly? Mary Sargini asked, as the audience laughed. Really and truly, Will assured her. A phonograph started to play the death march in Saul. From left to right, a black-robed procession of mourners carrying sheeted beers passed slowly across the front of the stage. Puppet after puppet, and as soon as the group had disappeared on the right, it would be brought in again from the left. The presentation seemed endless, the corpses innumerable. Dead, said Oedipus as he watched them pass, and another dead, and yet another, another. That'll teach them, the basso profondo broke in. I'll learn you to be a toad. Oedipus continued, The soldiers bear the whores, the baby stone-clad, pressed to the ache of unsucked breasts, the youth in horror, turning away from the black swollen face that from his moonlit pillar once looked up, eager for kisses, dead, all dead, mourned by the soon to die and by the doomed, born with reluctant footing to the abhorred garden of cypresses where one huge pit yawns to receive them, stinking to the moon. While he was speaking, two new puppets, a boy and a girl in the gayest of Polynesian finery, entered from the right and moved in the opposite direction to the black-robed mourners, took their stand, arm in arm, downstage, and a little left of centre. "'But we, meanwhile,' said the boy when Oedipus had finished, "'are bound for rosier gardens and the absurd, apocalyptic rite that in the mind calls forth from the touched skin and melting flesh the imminent infinite.' What about me? the basso profundo rumbled from the welkin. You seem to forget that I'm wholly other. Endlessly the black procession to the cemetery still shuffled on, but now the dead march was interrupted in mid-phrase. Music gave place to a single deep note, tuba and double bass, prolonged interminably. The boy in the foreground held up his hand. Listen! The drone! The everlasting burden! In unison with the unseen instruments, the mourners began to chant, Death! 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 But life knows more than one note, said the boy. Life, the girl chimed in, can sing both high and low. And your unceasing drone of death serves only to make a richer music. A richer music, the girl repeated. And with that, tenor and treble, they started to vocalise a wandering arabesque of sound, wreathed, as it were, about the long, rigid shaft of the ground bass. The drone and the singing diminished gradually into silence. The last of the mourners disappeared, and the boy and girl in the foreground retired to a corner, where they could go on with their kissing undisturbed. There was another flourish of trumpets, and, obese in a purple tunic, in came Creon, fresh from Delphi and primed with oracles. For the next few minutes the dialogue was all in Polynese, and Mary Saragini had to act as interpreter. Oedipus asks him what God said, and the other one says that what God said was that it was all because of some man having killed the old king, the one before Oedipus. Nobody had ever caught him, and the man was still living in Thebes, and this virus that was killing everybody had been sent by God, that's what Creon says he was told, as a punishment. I don't know why all these people who hadn't done anything to anybody had to be punished, but that's what he says God said. And the virus won't stop till they catch the man that killed the old king and send him away from Thebes. And of course Oedipus says he's going to do everything he can to find the man and get rid of him. From his downstage corner, the boy began to declaim, this time in English. God, most himself when most sublimely vague, talks when his plan is plain the ungodliest bosh. Repent, he roars, for sin has caused the plague, but we say dirt, so wash. While the audience was still laughing, another group of mourners emerged from the wings and slowly crossed the stage. Karuna, said the girl in the foreground, compassion. The suffering of the stupid is as real as any other suffering. Feeling a touch on his arm, Will turned and found himself looking into the beautiful, sulky face of young Murugan. I've been hunting for you everywhere, he said angrily, as though Will had concealed himself on purpose just to annoy him. 
He spoke so loudly that many heads were turned, and there were calls for quiet. You went at Dr. Roberts, you went at Susila's, the boy nagged on, regardless of the protests. Quiet, quiet. Quiet, came a tremendous shout from Basso Profundo in the clouds. Things have come to a pretty pass, the voice added grumblingly, when God simply can't hear himself speak. Hear, hear, said Will, joining in the general laughter. He rose and, followed by Morgan and Mary Sargini, hobbled towards the exit. Didn't you want to see the end? Mary Sargini asked, and turning to Morgan, You really might have waited, she said in a tone of reproof. Mind your own business, Morgan snapped. Will laid a hand on the child's shoulder. Luckily, he said, your account of the end was so vivid that I don't have to see it with my own eyes. And of course, he added ironically, his highness must always come first. Morgan pulled an envelope out of the pocket of those white silk pyjamas which had so bedazzled the little nurse and handed it to Will. From my mother, and he added, it's urgent. How good it smells, Mary Saragini commented, sniffing at the rich aura of sandalwood that surrounded the Rani's missive. Will unfolded three sheets of heaven-blue notepaper embossed with five golden lotuses under a princely crown. How many underlings! What a profusion of capital letters! He started to read. Ma petite voix, cher Farnaby, avez raison. As usual, I had been told again and again what our mutual friend was predestined to do for poor little Pala, and, through the financial support which Pala will permit him to contribute to the crusade of the spirit for the whole world. So when I read his cable which arrived a few minutes ago by way of the faithful Bahu and his diplomatic colleague in London, it came as no surprise to learn that Lord A has given you full powers, and it goes without saying, the wherewithal, to negotiate on his behalf, on our behalf, for his advantage is also yours, mine, and, since in our different ways we are all crusaders, the spirits. But the arrival of Lord A's cable is not the only piece of news I have to report. Events, as we learned this afternoon from Bahu, are rushing towards the great turning point of Balinese history, rushing far more rapidly than I had previously thought to be possible. For reasons which are partly political, the need to offset a recent decline in Colonel D's popularity, partly economic, the burdens of defence are too onerous to be borne by Rendang alone, and partly astrological, these days say the experts are uniquely favourable for a joint venture by Rams, myself and Morgan, and that typical scorpion Colonel D, it has been decided to precipitate an action originally planned for the night of the lunar eclipse next November. This being so, it is essential that the three of us here should meet without delay to decide what must be done in these new and swiftly changing circumstances, to promote our special interests, material and spiritual. The so-called accident, which brought you to our shores at this most critical moment of time, was, as you must recognize, manifestly providential. It remains for us to collaborate as dedicated crusaders with that divine power which has so unequivocally espoused our cause. So come at once, Murugan has the motor car and will bring you to our modest bungalow, where, I assure you, my dear Farnaby, you will receive a very warm welcome from bien sincèrement votre Fatima R. Will folded up the three odorous sheets of scrawled blue paper and replaced them in their envelope. His face was expressionless, but behind this mask of indifference he was violently angry. Angry with this ill-mannered boy before him, so ravishing in his white silk pyjamas, so odious in his spoiled silliness. Angry as he caught another whiff of the letter with that grotesque monster of a woman who had begun by ruining her son in the name of mother love and chastity and was now egging him on in the name of God and an assortment of ascended masters to become a bomb-dropping spiritual crusader under the oily banner of Joe Alderhyde. Angry above all with himself for having so wantonly become involved with this ludicrously sinister couple, in heaven only knew what kind of a vile plot against all the human decencies that his refusal to take yes for an answer had never prevented him from secretly believing in, and how passionately longing for. Well, shall we go? said Murugan, in a tone of airy confidence. He was evidently assuming as axiomatic that when Fatima R issued a command, Obedience must necessarily be complete and unhesitating. 
Feeling the need to give himself a little more time to cool off, Will made no immediate answer. Instead, he turned away to look at the now distant puppets. Jocasta, Oedipus, and Creon were sitting on the palace steps, waiting, presumably, for the arrival of Tiresias. Overhead, Basso Profondo was momentarily napping. A party of black-robed mourners was crossing the stage. Near the footlights, the boy from Pala had begun to declaim in blank verse, Light and compassion, he was saying. Light and compassion, how unutterably simple our substance, but the simple waited, age after age, for intricacies sufficient to know their one in multitude, their everything. Here now their fact in fiction, waited and still waits on the absurd, on incommensurables seamlessly interwoven, estrin with charity, truth with kidney function, beauty with chyle, bile, sperm, and God with dinner, God with dinner's absence, or the sound of bells, suddenly one, two, three, in sleepless ears. There was a ripple of plucked strings, then the long-drawn notes of a flute. Shall we go? Morrigan repeated. But Will held up his hand for silence. The girl puppet had moved to the centre of the stage and was singing. Thought is the brain's three milliards of cells from the inside out, Billions of games of billiards, marked up as faith and doubt. My faith, but their collisions, my logic, their enzymes. Their pink epinephrine, my visions, their white epinephrine, my crimes. Since I am the felt arrangement of ten to the ninth times three, each atom in its estrangement must yet be prophetic of me. Losing all patience, Murugan caught hold of Will's arm and gave him a savage pinch. Are you coming? he shouted. Will turned on him angrily. What the devil do you think you're doing, you little fool? He jerked his arm out of the boy's grasp. Intimidated, Murugan changed his tone. I just wanted to know if you were ready to come to my mother's. I'm not ready, Will answered, because I'm not going. Not going? Murugan cried in a tone of incredulous amazement. But she expects you. She tell your mother I'm very sorry, but I have a prior engagement with someone who's dying, Will added. But this is frightfully important, so is dying. Morgan lowered his voice. Something's happening, he whispered. I can't hear you, Will shouted through the confused noises of the crowd. Morgan glanced about him apprehensively, then risked a somewhat louder whisper. Something's happening. Something tremendous. Something even more tremendous is happening at the hospital. We just heard, Morgan began. He looked around again, then shook his head. No, I can't tell you. Not here. That's why you must come to the bungalow now. There's no time to lose. Will glanced at his watch. No time to lose, he echoed, and turning to Mary Sargini, we must get going, he said. Which way? I'll show you, she said, and they set off hand in hand. Wait, Morgan implored. Wait. Then, as Will and Mary Sargini held on their course, he came dodging through the crowd in pursuit. What shall I tell her? he wailed at their heels. The boy's terror was comically abject. In Will's mind, anger gave place to amusement. He laughed aloud, then halting. What would you tell her, Mary Sargini? he asked. I'd tell her exactly what happened, said the child. I mean, if it was my mother. But then, she added on second thought, my mother isn't the Rani. She looked up at Murugan. Do you belong to an M.A.C.? she inquired. Of course he didn't. For the Rani, the very idea of a mutual adoption club was a blasphemy. Only God could make a mother. The spiritual crusader wanted to be alone with her God-given victim. No M.A.C.? Mary Saragini shook her head. That's awful. You might have gone and stayed for a few days with one of your other mothers. Still terrified by the prospect of having to tell his only mother about the failure of his mission, Murugan began to harp almost hysterically on a new variant of the old theme. I don't know what she'll say, he kept repeating. I don't know what she'll say. There's only one way to find out what she'll say, Will told him. Go home and listen. Come with me, Murugan begged. Please, he clutched at Will's arm. I told you not to touch me. The clutching hand was hastily withdrawn. Will smiled again. That's better. He raised his staff in a farewell gesture. Bon nuit, Altesse. Then to Mary Saragini, lead on, MacPhail, he said in high good humour. Were you putting it on? 
Mary Saragini asked, or were you really angry? Really and truly, he assured her. Then he remembered what he had seen in the school gymnasium. He hummed the opening notes of the Rakshasi hornpipe and banged the pavement with his iron-shod staff. Ought I to have stamped it out? Maybe it would have been better. You think so? He's going to hate you as soon as he's stopped being frightened. Will shrugged his shoulders. He couldn't care less. But as the past receded and the future approached, as they left the arc lamps of the marketplace and climbed the steep dark street that wound uphill to the hospital, his mood began to change. Lead on, MacPhail. But towards what? And away from what? Towards yet another manifestation of the essential horror and away from all hope of that blessed year of freedom which Joe Alderhyde had promised and that it would be so easy and, since Parla was doomed in any event, not so immoral or treacherous to earn. And not only away from the hope of freedom, away quite possibly if the Rani complained to Joe and if Joe became sufficiently indignant from any further prospects of well-paid slavery as a professional execution watcher. Should he turn back? Should he try to find Murugan, offer apologies, do whatever that dreadful woman ordered him to do? A hundred yards up the road, the lights of the hospital could be seen shining between the trees. Let's rest for a moment, he said. Are you tired? Mary Saragini inquired solicitously. A little. He turned and, leaning on his staff, looked down at the marketplace. In the light of the arc lamps, the town hall glowed pink like a monumental serving of raspberry sherbet. On the temple spire he could see, frieze above frieze, the exuberant chaos of Indic sculpture, elephants and bodhisattvas, demons, supernatural girls with breasts and enormous bottoms, capering shivas, rows of past and future Buddhas in quiet ecstasy. Below, in the space between sherbet and mythology, seethed the crowd, and somewhere in that crowd was a sulky face and a pair of white satin pyjamas. Should he go back? It would be the sensible, the safe, the prudent thing to do. But an inner voice, not little like the Rani's, but stentorian, shouted, Squalid! Squalid! Conscience? No. Morality? Heaven forbid. But supererogatory squalor, ugliness and vulgarity beyond the call of duty, these were things which, as a man of taste, one simply couldn't be a party to. Well, shall we go on? he said to Mary Saragini. They entered the lobby of the hospital. The nurse at the desk had a message for them from Susila. Mary Saragini was to go directly to Mrs. Rao's, where she and Tom Krishna would spend the night. Mr. Farnaby was to be asked to come at once to room 34. This way, said the nurse and held open a swing door. Will stepped forward. The conditioned reflex of politeness clicked automatically into action. Thank you, he said, and smiled. But it was with a dull, sick feeling in the pit of the stomach that he went hobbling towards the apprehended future. The last door on the left, said the nurse. But now she had to get back to her desk in the lobby. So I leave you to go on alone, she added, as the door closed behind her. Alone he repeated to himself, alone. And the apprehended future was identical with the haunting past. The essential horror was timeless and ubiquitous. This long corridor with its green-painted walls was the very same corridor along which, a year ago, he had walked to the little room where Molly lay dying. The nightmare was recurrent. Foredoomed and conscious, he moved on towards its horrible consummation. Death. Yet another vision of death. Thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four. He knocked and waited, listening to the beating of his heart. The door opened and he found himself face to face with little Radha. Susila was expecting you, she whispered. Will followed her into the room. Rounding a screen, he caught a glimpse of Susila's profile silhouetted against a lamp, of a high bed, of a dark, emaciated face on the pillow, of arms that were no more than parchment-covered bones, of claw-like hands. Once again, the essential horror. With a shudder, he turned away. Radha motioned him to a chair near the open window. He sat down and closed his eyes, closed them physically against the present, but by that very act, opened them inwardly upon that hateful past of which the present had reminded him. He was there in that other room, with Aunt Mary, or rather with a person who had once been Aunt Mary, 
but was now this hardly recognisable somebody else, somebody who had never so much as heard of the charity and courage which had been the very essence of Aunt Mary's being, somebody who was filled with an indiscriminate hatred for all who came near her, loathing them, whoever they might be, simply because they didn't have cancer, because they weren't in pain, had not been sentenced to die before their time, and along with this malignant envy of other people's health and happiness had gone a bitterly querulous self-pity, an abject despair. Why to me? Why should this thing have happened to me? He could hear the shrill complaining voice, could see that tear-stained and distorted face, the only person he had ever really loved or wholeheartedly admired, and yet in her degradation he had caught himself despising her. Despising, positively hating. To escape from the past he reopened his eyes. Radha he saw was sitting on the floor, cross-legged and upright in the posture of meditation. In her chair beside the bed, Susila seemed to be holding the same kind of focused stillness. He looked at the face on the pillow. That too was still, still with a serenity that might almost have been the frozen calm of death. Outside, in the leafy darkness, a peacock suddenly screamed. Deepened by contrast, the ensuing silence seemed to grow pregnant with mysterious and appalling meanings. Lakshmi? Susila laid a hand on the old woman's wasted arm. Lakshmi, she said again more loudly. The death-calm face remained impassive. You mustn't go to sleep. Not go to sleep? But for Aunt Mary, sleep, the artificial sleep that followed the injections, had been the only respite from the self-lacerations of self-pity and brooding fear. Lakshmi, the face came to life. I wasn't really asleep, the old woman whispered. It's just my being so weak. I seem to float away. But you've got to be here, said Susila. You've got to know you're here all the time. She slipped an additional pillow under the sick woman's shoulders and reached for a bottle of smelling salts that stood on the bed table. Lakshmi sniffed, opened her eyes, and looked up into Susila's face. I'd forgotten how beautiful you were, she said. But then Dugald always did have good taste. The ghost of a mischievous smile appeared for a moment on the fleshless face. What do you think, Susila? she added after a moment, and in another tone. Shall we see him again? I mean, over there? In silence, Susila stroked the old woman's hand. Then, suddenly smiling. How would the old Raja have asked that question? she said. Do you think we, quote unquote, shall see him, quote unquote, over there, quote unquote? But what do you think? I think we've all come out of the same light, and we're all going back into the same light. Words, Will was thinking. Words, words, words. With an effort, Lakshmi lifted a hand and pointed accusingly at the lamp on the bed table. It glares in my eyes, she whispered. Susila untied the red silk handkerchief knotted around her throat and draped it over the lamp's parchment shade. From white and mercilessly revealing, the light became as dimly, warmly rosy as the flush, Will found himself thinking, on Babs's rumpled bed, whenever Porter's gin proclaimed itself in crimson. That's much better, said Lakshmi. She shut her eyes. Then, after a long silence, The light, she broke out. The light! It's here again! Then, after another pause, Oh, how wonderful! she whispered at last. How wonderful! Suddenly she winced and bit her lip. Susila took the old woman's hand in hers. Is the pain bad? she asked. It would be bad, Lakshmi explained, if it were really my pain. But somehow it isn't. The pain's here, but I'm somewhere else. It's like what you discover with the moksha medicine. Nothing really belongs to you, not even your pain. Is the light still there? Lakshmi shook her head. And looking back, I can tell you exactly when it went away. It went away when I started talking about the pain not being really mine. And yet what you were saying was good, I know, but I was saying it. The ghost of an old habit of irreverent mischief flitted once again across Lakshmi's face. What are you thinking of? Sosila asked. Socrates. 
Socrates? Gibber, 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 even when he'd actually swallowed the stuff. Don't let me talk, Susila. Help me to get out of my own light. Do you remember that time last year, Susila began after a silence, when we all went up to the old Shiva temple, above the high altitude station? You and Robert and Dugald and me and the two children? Do you remember? Lakshmi smiled with pleasure at the recollection. I'm thinking specially of that view from the west side of the temple, the view out over the sea, blue, green, purple, and the shadows of the clouds were like ink, and the shadows themselves, snow, lead, charcoal, satin. And while we were looking, you asked the question, Do you remember, Lakshmi? You mean about the clear light? About the clear light, Susila confirmed. Why do people speak of mind in terms of light? Is it because they've seen the sunshine and found it so beautiful that it seems only natural to identify the Buddha nature with the clearest of all possible clear lights? Or do they find the sunshine beautiful because, consciously or unconsciously, they've been having revelations of mind in the form of light ever since they were born? I was the first to answer, said Susila, smiling to herself, and as I'd just been reading something by some American behaviorist, I didn't stop to think. I just gave you the quote-unquote, scientific point of view. People equate mind, whatever that may be, with hallucinations of light because they've looked at a lot of sunsets and found them very impressive. But Robert and Dougald would have none of it. The clear light, they insisted, comes first. You go mad about sunsets because sunsets remind you of what's always been going on, whether you knew it or not, inside your skull and outside space and time. You agreed with them, Lakshmi, do you remember? You said... I'd like to be on your side, Susila, if only because it isn't good for these men of ours to be right all the time. But in this case, surely it's pretty obvious, in this case they are right. Of course they were right, and of course I was hopelessly wrong, and needless to say, you had known the right answer before you asked the question. I never knew anything, Lakshmi whispered. I could only see. I remember your telling me about seeing the clear light, said Susila. Would you like me to remind you of it? The sick woman nodded her head. When you were eight years old, said Susila, that was the first time, an orange butterfly on a leaf opening and shutting its wings in the sunshine, and suddenly there was the clear light of pure suchness blazing through it like another sun. Much brighter than the sun, Lakshmi whispered. But much gentler. You can look into the clear light and not be blinded, and now remember it. A butterfly on a green leaf, opening and shutting its wings. And it's the Buddha nature totally present. It's the clear light outshining the sun. And you were only eight years old. What had I done to deserve it? Will found himself remembering that evening, a week or so before her death, when Aunt Mary had talked about the wonderful times they had had together in her little Regency house near Arundel, where he had spent the better part of all his holidays smoking out the wasps' nests with fire and brimstone, having picnics on the downs or under the beaches, and then the sausage rolls at Bogner, the gypsy fortune-teller who had prophesied that he would end up as Chancellor of the Exchequer, the black-robed, red-nosed verger who had chased them out of Chichester Cathedral because they had laughed too much. Laughed too much, Aunt Mary had repeated bitterly. Laughed too much. And now, Susila was saying, think of that view from the Shiva temple. Think of those lights and shadows on the sea, those blue spaces between the clouds. Think of them and then let go of your thinking. Let go of it so that the not-thought can come through. Things into emptiness, emptiness into suchness, suchness into things again, into your own mind. Remember what it says in the Sutra? Your own consciousness shining, void, inseparable from the great body of radiance? is subject neither to birth nor death, but is the same as the immutable light, Buddha Amitabha. The same as the light, Lakshmi repeated, and yet it's all dark again. It's dark because you're trying too hard, said Susila, dark because you want it to be light. Remember what you used to tell me when I was a little girl? Lightly, child, lightly. You've got to learn to do everything lightly. Think lightly, act lightly, feel lightly. Yes, feel lightly, even though you're feeling deeply. 
just lightly let things happen and lightly cope with them. I was so preposterously serious in those days, such a humorless little prig. Lightly, lightly, it was the best advice ever given me. Well, now I'm going to say the same thing to you, Lakshmi. Lightly, my darling, lightly, even when it comes to dying. Nothing ponderous or portentous or emphatic, no rhetoric, no tremolos, no self-conscious persona putting on its celebrated imitation of Christ or Goethe or Little Nell. And, of course, no theology, no metaphysics, just the fact of dying and the fact of the clear light. So throw away all your baggage and go forward. There are quicksands all about you, sucking at your feet, trying to suck you down into fear and self-pity and despair. That's why you must walk so lightly. Lightly, my darling, on tiptoes, and no luggage, not even a sponge bag, completely unencumbered. Completely unencumbered. Will thought of poor Aunt Mary sinking deeper and deeper with every step into the quicksands. Deeper and deeper until struggling and protesting to the last, she had gone down completely and forever into the essential horror. He looked again at the fleshless face on the pillow and saw that it was smiling. The light, came the hoarse whisper. The clear light. It's here, along with the pain. In spite of the pain. And where are you? Susilla asked. Over there, in the corner. Lakshmi tried to point, but the raised hand faltered and fell back, inert, on the coverlet. I can see myself there, and she can see my body on the bed. Can she see the light? No. The light's here, where my body is. The door of the sick room was quietly opened. Will turned his head and was in time to see Dr. Roberts' small, spare figure emerging from behind the screen into the rosy twilight. Susilla rose and motioned him to her place beside the bed. Dr. Roberts sat down and, leaning forward, took his wife's hand in one of his and laid the other on her forehead. It's me, he whispered. At last. A tree, he explained, had fallen across the telephone line. No communication with a high-altitude station except by road. They had sent a messenger in a car, and the car had broken down. More than two hours had been lost. But thank goodness, Dr. Robert concluded, here I finally am. The dying woman sighed profoundly, opened her eyes for a moment and looked up at him with a smile, then closed them again. I knew you'd come. Lakshmi, he said very softly. Lakshmi. He drew the tips of his fingers across the wrinkled forehead again and again. My little love. There were tears on his cheeks, but his voice was firm and he spoke with a tenderness not of weakness, but of power. I'm not over there any more, Lakshmi whispered. She was over there in the corner, Cecilia explained to her father-in-law, looking at her body here on the bed. But now I've come back. Me and the pain, me and the light, me and you all together. The peacock screamed again, and through the insect noises that in this tropical night were the equivalent of silence, far off but clear came the sound of gay music, flutes and plucked strings, and the steady throbbing of drums. Listen, said Dr. Robert, can you hear it? They're dancing. Dancing, Lakshmi repeated, dancing. Dancing so lightly, Susila whispered, as though they had wings. The music swelled up again into audibility. It's the courting dance, Susila went on. The courting dance? Robert, do you remember? Could I ever forget? Yes, Will said to himself. Could one ever forget? Could one ever forget that other distant music and... Nearby, unnaturally quick and shallow, the sound of dying breath in a boy's ears. In the house across the street, somebody was practising one of those Brahms waltzes that Aunt Mary had loved to play. One, two, and three, and one, two, and three, and one, two, three, one, and one, and two, three, and one, and... The odious stranger who had once been Aunt Mary stirred out of her artificial stupor and opened her eyes. An expression of the most intense malignity had appeared on the yellow, wasted face. Go and tell them to stop, the harsh, unrecognisable voice had almost screamed. 
and then the lines of malignity had changed into the lines of despair, and the stranger, the pitiable, odious stranger, started to sob uncontrollably. Those Brahms waltzes. They were the pieces, out of all her repertory, that Frank had loved best. Another gust of cool air brought with it a louder strain of the gay, bright music. All those young people dancing together, said Dr. Robert, all that laughter and desire, all that uncomplicated happiness. It's all here, like an atmosphere, like a field of force. Their joy and our love, Susila's love, my love, all working together, all reinforcing one another. Love and joy enveloping you, my darling. Love and joy carrying you up into the peace of the clear light. Listen to the music. Can you still hear it, Lakshmi? She's drifted away again, said Susila. Try to bring her back. Dr. Robert slipped an arm under the emaciated body and lifted it into a sitting posture. The head drooped sideways onto his shoulder. My little love, he kept whispering. My little love. Her eyelids fluttered open for a moment. Brighter, came the barely audible whisper. Brighter. And a smile of happiness, intense almost to the point of elation, transfigured her face. Through his tears, Dr. Robert smiled back at her. So now you can let go, my darling, he stroked her grey hair. Now you can let go. Let go, he insisted. Let go of this poor old body. You don't need it any more. Let it fall away from you. Leave it lying here like a pile of worn-out clothes. In the fleshless face, the mouth had fallen cavernously open, and suddenly the breathing became stertorous. My love, my little love, Dr. Robert held her more closely. Let go now, let go. Leave it here, your old worn-out body, and go on. Go on, my darling, go on into the light, into the peace into the living peace of the clear light. Susila picked up one of the limp hands and kissed it, then turned to little Rata. Time to go, she whispered, touching the girl's shoulder. Interrupted in her meditation, Rada opened her eyes, nodded, and scrambling to her feet, tiptoed silently towards the door. Susila beckoned to Will, and together they followed her. In silence the three of them walked along the corridor. At the swing door, Radha took her leave. Thank you for letting me be with you, she whispered. Susila kissed her. Thank you for helping to make it easier for Lakshmi. Will followed Susila across the lobby and out into the warm, odorous darkness. In silence, they started to walk downhill towards the marketplace. And now, he said at last, speaking under a strange compulsion to deny his emotion in a display of the cheapest kind of cynicism, I suppose she's trotting off to do a little Maithuna with her boyfriend. As a matter of fact, said Susila calmly, she's on night duty. But if she weren't, what would be the objection to her going on from the yoga of death to the yoga of love? Will did not answer immediately. He was thinking of what had happened between himself and Babs on the evening of Molly's funeral. The yoga of anti-love. The yoga of resented addiction, of lust, and the self-loathing that reinforces the self and makes it yet more loathsome. I'm sorry I tried to be unpleasant, he said at last. It's your father's ghost. We'll have to see if we can exorcise it. They had crossed the marketplace, and now, at the end of the short street that led out of the village, they had come to the open space where the jeep was parked. As Susila turned the car onto the highway, the beam of their headlamps swept across a small green car that was turning downhill into the bypass. Don't I recognize the royal baby Austin? You do, said Susila, and wondered whether Rani and Murugan could be going at this time of night. They're up to no good, Will guessed, and on a sudden impulse he told Susila of his roving commission from Joe Alderhyde, his dealings with the Queen Mother and Mr. Bahu. You'll be justified in deporting me tomorrow, he concluded. Not now that you've changed your mind, she assured him. And anyhow, nothing you did could have affected the real issue. Our enemy is oil in general. Whether we're exploited by Southeast Asia Petroleum or Standard of California makes no difference. Did you know that Murugan and the Rani were conspiring against you? They make no secret of it. Then why don't you get rid of them? Because they would be brought back immediately 
by Colonel Deepa. The Rani is a princess of Rendang. If we expelled her, it would be a casus belli. So what can you do? Try to keep them in order, try to change their minds, hope for a happy outcome, and be prepared for the worst. And what will you do if the worst happens? Try to make the best of it, I suppose. Even in the worst society, an individual retains a little freedom. One perceives in private, one remembers and imagines in private, one loves in private, and one dies in private, even under Colonel Deeper. Then, after a silence, Did Dr. Roberts say you could have the moksha medicine? she asked. And when Will nodded, Would you like to try it? Now? Now? That is, if you don't mind being up all night with it. I'd like nothing better. You may find that you never liked anything worse, Susila warned him. The moksha medicine can take you to heaven, but it can also take you to hell, or else to both, together, or alternately. Or else, if you're lucky, or if you've made yourself ready, beyond either of them, and then beyond the beyond, back to where you started from, back to here, back to New Rothamsted, back to business as usual. Only now, of course, business as usual is completely different. 15. One, two, three, four. The clock in the kitchen struck twelve. How irrelevantly, seeing that time had ceased to exist. The absurd, importunate bell had sounded at the heart of a timelessly present event, of a now that changed incessantly in a dimension not of seconds and minutes, but of beauty, of significance, of intensity, of deepening mystery. Luminous bliss. From the shallows of his mind the words rose like bubbles, came to the surface and vanished into the infinite spaces of living light that now pulsed and breathed behind his closed eyelids. Luminous bliss. That was as near as one could come to it. But it, this timeless and yet ever-changing event, was something that words could only caricature and diminish, never convey. It was not only bliss, it was also understanding. Understanding of everything, but without knowledge of anything. Knowledge involved a knower, and all the infinite diversity of known and knowable things. But here, behind his closed lids, there was neither spectacle nor spectator. There was only this experienced fact of being blissfully one with oneness. In a succession of revelations, the light grew brighter, the understanding deepened, the bliss became more impossibly, more unbearably intense. Dear God, he said to himself, oh, my dear God. Then, out of another world, he heard the sound of Susila's voice. Do you feel like telling me what's happening? It was a long time before Will answered her. Speaking was difficult, not because there was any physical impediment. It was just that speech seemed so fatuous, so totally pointless. Light, he whispered at last. And you're there, looking at the light? Not looking at it, he answered after a long reflective pause. Being it. Being it, he repeated emphatically. Its presence was his absence. William Asquith Farnaby, ultimately and essentially there was no such person. Ultimately and essentially there was only a luminous bliss, only a knowledgeless understanding, only union with unity and a limitless, undifferentiated awareness. This, self-evidently, was the mind's natural state, but no less certainly there had also been that professional execution watcher, that self-loathing Babs addict. There were also three thousand millions of insulated consciousnesses, each at the centre of a nightmare world in which it was impossible for anyone with eyes in his head or a grain of honesty to take yes for an answer. By what sinister miracle had the mind's natural state been transformed into all these devil's islands of wretchedness and delinquency? In the firmament of bliss and understanding, like bats against the sunset, there was a wild criss-crossing of remembered notions and the hangovers of past feelings. Bat thoughts of Plotinus and the Gnostics, of the One and its emanations, down, down into thickening horror 
and then bat feelings of anger and disgust as the thickening horrors became specific memories of what the essentially non-existent William Asquith Farnaby had seen and done, inflicted and suffered. But behind and around, and somehow even within those flickering memories, was the firmament of bliss and peace and understanding. There might be a few bats in the sunset sky, but the fact remained that the dreadful miracle of creation had been reversed. From a preternaturally wretched and delinquent self, he had been unmade into pure mind, mind in its natural state, limitless, undifferentiated, luminously blissful, knowledgelessly understanding. Light here, light now, and because it was infinitely here and timelessly now, there was nobody outside the light to look at the light. The fact was the awareness, the awareness the fact. From that other world, somewhere out there to the right, came the sound once more of Susila's voice. "'Are you feeling happy?' she asked. A surge of brighter radiance swept away all those flickering thoughts and memories. There was nothing now except a crystalline transparency of bliss. Without speaking, without opening his eyes, he smiled and nodded. "'Eckhart called it God,' she went on. "'Felicity so ravishing.' so inconceivably intense that no one can describe it, and in the midst of it God glows and flames without ceasing. God glows and flames. It was so startlingly, so comically right that Will found himself laughing aloud. God like a house on fire, he gasped. God the 14th of July, and he exploded once more in cosmic laughter. Behind his closed eyelids an ocean of luminous bliss poured upwards like an inverted cataract, poured upwards from union into completer union, from impersonality into a yet more absolute transcendence of selfhood. God the 14th of July, he repeated, and from the heart of the cataract gave vent to a final chuckle of recognition and understanding. What about the 15th of July? Sosila questioned. What about the morning after? There isn't any morning after. She shook her head. It sounds suspiciously like Nirvana. What's wrong with that? Pure spirit. One hundred percent proof. That's a drink that only the most hardened contemplation guzzlers indulge in. Bodhisattvas dilute their Nirvana with equal parts of love and work. This is better, Will insisted. You mean it's more delicious. That's why it's such an enormous temptation. The only temptation that God could succumb to. The fruit of the ignorance of good and evil. What heavenly lusciousness! What a super mango! God had been stuffing himself with it for billions of years, then all of a sudden up comes Homo sapiens, out pops the knowledge of good and evil. God had to switch to a much less palatable brand of fruit. You've just eaten a slice of the original super mango, so you can sympathize with him. A chair creaked. There was a rustle of skirts, then a series of small, busy sounds that he was unable to interpret. What was she doing? He could have answered that question by simply opening his eyes. But who cared, after all, what she might be doing? Nothing was of any importance except this blazing uprush of bliss and understanding. Super mango to fruit of knowledge. I'm going to wean you, she said, by easy stages. There was a whirring sound. From the shallows a bubble of recognition reached the surface of consciousness. Susila had been putting a record on the turntable of a phonograph, and now the machine was in motion. Johann Sebastian Bach, he heard her saying, the music that's closest to silence, closest in spite of its being so highly organized, to pure, hundred percent proof spirit. The whirring gave place to musical sounds. Another bubble of recognition came shooting up, he was listening to the fourth Brandenburg concerto. It was the same, of course, as the fourth Brandenburg he had listened to so often in the past, the same and yet completely different. This is Allegro. He knew it by heart, which meant that he was in the best possible position to realize that he had never really heard it before. To begin with, it was no longer he, William Asquith Farnaby, who was hearing it. The Allegro was revealing itself as an element in the great present event, a manifestation at one remove of the luminous bliss. Or perhaps that was putting it too mildly. In another modality, this allegro was the luminous bliss. It was the knowledgeless understanding of everything apprehended through a particular piece of knowledge, 
It was undifferentiated awareness broken up into notes and phrases, and yet still all comprehendingly itself. And, of course, all this belonged to nobody. It was at once in here, out there, and nowhere. The music which, as William Asquith Farnaby, he had heard a hundred times before, he had been reborn as an unowned awareness. Which was why he was now hearing it for the first time. Unowned, the fourth Brandenburg had an intensity of beauty, a depth of intrinsic meaning, incomparably greater than anything he had ever found in the same music when it was his private property. Poor idiot, came up in a bubble of ironic comment. The poor idiot hadn't wanted to take yes for an answer in any field but the aesthetic, and all the time he had been denying by the mere fact of being himself all the beauty and meaning he so passionately longed to say yes to. William Asquith Farnaby was nothing but a muddy filter on the hither side of which human beings, nature, and even his beloved art had emerged bedimmed and bemired, less other and uglier than themselves. Tonight, for the first time, his awareness of a piece of music was completely unobstructed. Between mind and sound, mind and pattern, mind and significance, there was no longer any babble of biographical irrelevances to drown the music or make a senseless discord. Tonight's fourth Brandenburg was a pure datum. No, a blessed donum uncorrupted by the personal history, the second-hand notions, the ingrained stupidities with which, like every self, the poor idiot, who wouldn't, and in art plainly couldn't, take yes for an answer, had overlaid the gifts of immediate experience. And tonight's fourth Brandenburg was not merely an unowned thing in itself, it was also, in some impossible way, a present event with an infinite duration. Or rather, and still more impossibly, seeing that it had three movements and was being played at its usual speed, it was without duration. The metronome presided over each of its phrases, but the sum of its phrases was not a span of seconds and minutes. There was tempo, but no time. So what was there? Eternity, Will was forced to answer. It was one of those metaphysical dirty words which no decent-minded man would dream of pronouncing even to himself, much less in public. Eternity, my brethren, he said aloud. Eternity, blah, blah. The sarcasm, as he might have known it would, fell completely flat. Tonight those four syllables were no less concretely significant than the four letters of the other class of tabooed words. He began to laugh. What's so funny? she asked. Eternity, he answered. Believe it or not, it's as real as shit. Excellent, she said approvingly. He sat there motionlessly attentive, following with ear and inward eye the interwoven streams of sound, the interwoven streams of congruous and equivalent lights that flowed on timelessly from one sequence to another. And every phrase of this well-worn familiar music was an unprecedented revelation of beauty that went pouring upwards, like a multitudinous fountain, into another revelation as novel and amazing as itself. Stream within stream, the stream of the solo violin, the streams of the two recorders, the manifold streams of the harpsichord and the little orchestra of assorted strings, separate, distinct, individual. And yet each of the streams was a function of all the rest. Each was itself in virtue of its relationship to the whole of which it was a component. Dear God, he heard himself whispering. In the timeless sequence of change, the recorders were holding a single long-drawn note, a note without upper partials, clear, pellucid, divinely empty. A note, the word came bubbling up, of pure contemplation. And here was another inspirational obscenity that had now acquired a concrete meaning and might be uttered without a sense of same. Pure contemplation, unconcerned, beyond contingency, outside the context of moral judgments. Through the uprushing lights he caught a glimpse in memory of Radha's shining face as she talked of love as contemplation, of Radha once again sitting cross-legged in a focused intensity of stillness at the foot of the bed where Lakshmi lay dying. This long, pure note was the meaning of her words, the audible expression of her silence. But always, flowing through and along with the heavenly emptiness of that contemplative fluting, was the rich sound, vibration within passionate vibration, of the violin, and surrounding them both 
the notes of contemplative detachment and the notes of passionate involvement, was this network of sharp, dry tones plucked from the wires of the harpsichord. Spirit and instinct, action and vision, and around them the web of intellect. They were comprehended by discursive thought, but comprehended, it was obvious, only from the outside, in terms of an order of experience radically different from that which discursive thinking professes to explain. It's like a logical positivist, he said. What is it? That harpsichord. Like a logical positivist, he was thinking in the shallows of his mind, while in the depths the great event of light and sound timelessly unfolded like a logical positivist talking about Plotinus and Julie de Lespinasse. The music changed again, and now it was the violin that sustained, how passionately, the long-drawn note of contemplation, while the two recorders took up the theme of active involvement and repeated it, the identical form imposed upon another substance, in the mode of detachment. And here, dancing in and out between them, was the logical positivist, absurd but indispensable, trying to explain in a language incommensurable with the facts what it was all about. In the eternity that was real as shit, he went on listening to these interwoven streams of sound, went on looking at these interwoven streams of light, went on actually being, out there, in here and nowhere, all that he saw and heard. And now, abruptly, the character of the light underwent a change. These interwoven streams, which were the first fluid differentiations of an understanding on the further side of all particular knowledge, had ceased to be a continuum. Instead, there was, all of a sudden, this endless succession of separate forms, forms still manifestly charged with the luminous bliss of undifferentiated being, but limited now, isolated, individualized. Silver and rose yellow and pale green and gentian blue, an endless succession of luminous spheres came swimming up from some hidden source of forms and, in time with the music, purposefully constellated themselves into arrays of unbelievable complexity and beauty. An inexhaustible fountain that sprayed out into conscious patternings, into lattices of living stars, and as he looked at them, as he lived their life and the life of this music that was their equivalent, they went on growing into other lattices that filled the three dimensions of an inner space and changed incessantly in another timeless dimension of quality and significance. What are you hearing? Susila asked. Hearing what I see, he answered, and seeing what I hear. And how would you describe it? What it looks like, Will answered after a long silence. What it sounds like is the creation, only it's not a one-shot affair. It's non-stop, perpetual creation. Perpetual creation out of no what, nowhere, into something somewhere. Is that it? That's it. You're making progress. If words had come more easily, and when spoken had been a little less pointless, Will would have explained to her that knowledgeless understanding and luminous bliss were a damn sight better than even Johann Sebastian Bach. Making progress, Susila repeated, but you've still got a long way to go. What about opening your eyes? Will shook his head emphatically. It's time you gave yourself a chance of discovering what's what. What's what is this? he muttered. It isn't, she assured him. All you've been seeing and hearing and being is only the first what. Now you must look at the second one. Look and then bring the two together into a single inclusive what's what. So open your eyes, Will. Open them wide. All right, he said at last, and reluctantly, with an apprehensive sense of impending misfortune, he opened his eyes. The inner illumination was swallowed up in another kind of light, the fountain of forms, the coloured orbs in their conscious arrays and purposefully changing lattices, gave place to a static composition of uprights and diagonals, of flat planes and curving cylinders, all carved out of some material that looked like living agate, and all emerging from a matrix of living and pulsating mother of pearl. Like a blind man, newly healed and confronted for the first time by the mystery of light and colour, he stared in uncomprehending astonishment. And then, at the end of another twenty timeless bars of the fourth Brandenburg, a bubble of explanation rose into consciousness. He was looking, Will suddenly perceived, at a small square table, and beyond the table at a rocking chair, and beyond the rocking chair at a blank wall of white-washed plaster. The explanation was reassuring. 
for in the eternity that he had experienced between the opening of his eyes and the emergent knowledge of what he was looking at, the mystery confronting him had deepened from inexplicable beauty to a consummation of shining alienness that filled him as he looked with a kind of metaphysical terror. Well, this terrifying mystery consisted of nothing but two pieces of furniture and an expanse of wall. The fear was allayed, but the wonder only increased. How was it possible that things so familiar and commonplace could be this? Obviously it wasn't possible, and yet there it was. There it was. His attention shifted from the geometrical constructions in brown agate to their pearly background. Its name, he knew, was Wall. But in experienced fact, it was a living process, a continuing series of transubstantiations from plaster and whitewash into the stuff of a supernatural body, into a god-flesh that kept modulating as he looked at it from glory to glory. Out of what the word bubbles had tried to explain away as mere calcimine, some shaping spirit was evoking an endless succession of the most delicately discriminated hues, at once faint and intense, that emerged out of latency and went flushing across the god-body's divinely radiant skin. Wonderful! Wonderful! And there must be other miracles, new worlds to conquer and be conquered by. He turned his head to the left, and there, appropriate words had bubbled up almost immediately, was the large marble-topped table at which they had eaten their supper. And now, thick and fast, more bubbles began to rise. This breathing apocalypse called table might be thought of as a picture by some mystical cubist, some inspired Juan Gris, with the soul of Traherne and a gift for painting miracles with conscious gems and the changing moods of water-lily petals. Turning his head a little further to the left, he was startled by a blaze of jewellery. And what strange jewellery! Narrow slabs of emerald and topaz, of ruby and sapphire and lapis lazuli, blazing away, row above row, like so many bricks in a wall of the new Jerusalem. Then, at the end, not in the beginning, came the word. In the beginning were the jewels, the stained glass windows, the walls of paradise. It was only now, at long last, that the word bookcase presented itself for consideration. Will raised his eyes from the book, jewels, and found himself at the heart of a tropical landscape. Why? Where? Then he remembered that when, in another life, he first entered the room, he had noticed over the bookcase a large, bad watercolour. Between sand dunes and clumps of palms, a widening estuary receding towards the open sea, and above the horizon, enormous mountains of cloud towered into a pale sky. Feeble came bubbling up from the shallows, the work only too obviously of a not very gifted amateur. But that was now beside the point, for the landscape had ceased to be a painting and was now the subject of the painting. A real river, real sea, real sand glaring in the sunshine, real trees against a real sky, real to the nth, real to the point of absoluteness. And this real river mingling with a real sea was his own being engulfed in God. God? between quotation marks, inquired an ironical bubble, or God, exclamation point, in a modernist Pickwickian sense. Will shook his head. The answer was just plain God, the God one couldn't possibly believe in, but who was self-evidently the fact confronting him. And yet this river was still a river, the sea, the Indian Ocean, not something else in fancy dress, unequivocally themselves, but at the same time unequivocally God. Where are you now? Susila asked. Without turning his head in her direction, Will answered, In heaven, I suppose, and pointed at the landscape. In heaven still? When are you going to make a landing down here? Another bubble of memory came up from the silted shallows. Something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of something or other. But Wordsworth also talked about the still sad music of humanity. Luckily, said Will, there are no humans in this landscape. Not even any animals, she added with a little laugh, only clouds and the most deceptively innocent-looking vegetables. That's why you'd better look at what's on the floor. Will dropped his eyes. The grain on the floorboards was a brown river, and the brown river was an eddying, ongoing diagram of the world's divine life. At the centre of that diagram was his own right foot, bare under the straps of its sandal and startlingly three-dimensional, like the marble foot revealed by a searchlight of some heroic statue. Boards, grain, foot, 
Through the glib, explanatory words the mystery stared back at him, impenetrable and yet paradoxically understood. Understood with that knowledgeless understanding to which, in spite of sensed objects and remembered names, he was still open. Suddenly, out of the tail of his eye, he caught a glimpse of quick, darting movement. Openness to bliss and understanding was also, he realised, an openness to terror, to total incomprehension. Like some alien creature lodged within his chest and struggling in anguish, his heart started to beat with a violence that made him tremble. In the hideous certainty that he was about to meet the essential horror, Will turned his head and looked. It's one of Tom Krishna's pet lizards, she said reassuringly. The light was as bright as ever, but the brightness had changed its sign. A glow of sheer evil radiated from every grey-green scale of the creature's back, from its obsidian eyes and the pulsing of its crimson throat, from the armoured edges of its nostrils and its slit-like mouth. He turned away. In vain, the essential horror glared out of everything he looked at. Those compositions by the mystical cubist, they had turned into intricate machines for doing nothing malevolently that tropical landscape in which he had experienced the union of his own being with the being of God, it was now simultaneously the most nauseating of Victorian oleographs and the actuality of hell. On their shelves, the rows of book jewels beamed with a thousand watts of darkness visible. And how cheap these gems of the abyss had become, how indescribably vulgar. Where there had been gold and pearl and precious stones, there were only Christmas tree decorations, only the shallow glare of plastic and varnished tin. Everything still pulsed with life, but with the life of an infinitely sinister bargain basement. And that, the music now affirmed, was what omnipotence was perpetually creating, a cosmic Woolworth stocked with mass-produced horrors, horrors of vulgarity and horrors of pain, of cruelty and tastelessness, of imbecility and deliberate malice. Not a gecko, he heard Susila saying, not one of our nice little house lizards. A hulking stranger from outdoors, one of the bloodsuckers. Not that they suck blood, of course. They merely have red throats and go purple in the face when they get excited, hence that stupid name. Look, there he goes. Will looked down again. Preternaturally real, the scaly horror with its black, blank eyes, its murderous mouth, its blood-red throat pumping away while the rest of the body lay stretched along the floor as still as death, was now within six inches of his foot. He sees his dinner said Susila. Look over there to your left, on the edge of the matting. He turned his head. Gongylus gongyloides, she went on. Do you remember? Yes, he remembered. The praying mantis that had settled on his bed. But that was in another existence. What he had seen then was merely a rather odd-looking insect. What he saw now was a pair of inch-long monsters, exquisitely grisly, in the act of coupling. Their bluish pallor was barred and veined with pink, and the wings that fluttered continuously like petals in a breeze were shaded at the edges with deepening violet. A mimicry of flowers. But the insect forms were undisguisable, and now even the flowery colours had undergone a change. Those quivering wings were the appendages of two brightly enamelled gadgets in the bargain basement, two little working models of a nightmare, two miniaturised machines for copulation. And now one of the nightmare machines, the female, had turned the small, flat head, all mouth and bulging eyes, at the end of its long neck, had turned it and, dear God, had begun to devour the head of the male machine. First a purple eye was chewed out, then half the bluish face. What was left of the head fell to the ground. Unrestrained by the weight of the eyes and jaw, the severed neck wavered wildly. The female machine snapped at the oozing stump, caught it, and, while the headless male uninterruptedly kept up his parody of Ares in the arms of Aphrodite, methodically chewed. Out of the corner of his eye, Will glimpsed another spurt of movement, turned his head sharply, and was in time to see the lizard crawling towards his foot. Nearer. Nearer. He averted his eyes in terror. Something touched his toes and went tickling across his instep. The tickling ceased, but he could sense a little weight on his foot, a dry, scaly contact. He wanted to scream, but his voice was gone, and when he tried to move, his muscles refused to obey him. Timelessly, the music had turned into the final presto. Horror briskly on the march, horror in Rococo fancy dress leading the dance. Utterly still, except for the pulse in its red throat, the scaly horror on his instep lay staring with expressionless eyes at its predestined prey. 
Interlocked, the two little working models of a nightmare quivered like wind-blown petals and were shaken spasmodically by the simultaneous agonies of death and copulation. A timeless century passed. Bar after bar, the gay little dance of death went on. Suddenly there was a scrabbling against his skin of tiny claws. The bloodsucker had crawled down from his instep to the floor. For a long lifespan it lay there absolutely still. Then, with incredible speed, it darted across the boards and onto the matting. The slit-light mouth opened and closed again, protruding from between the champing jaws the edge of a violet-tinted wing still fluttered like an orchid petal in the breeze. A pair of legs waved wildly for a moment, then disappeared from view. Will shuddered and closed his eyes. But across the frontier between things sensed and things remembered, things imagined, the horror pursued him. In the fluorescent glare of the inner light, an endless column of tin bright insects and gleaming reptiles marched up diagonally, from left to right, out of some hidden source of nightmare towards an unknown and monstrous consummation, Gongylus Gongyloides, by millions, and in the midst of them innumerable bloodsuckers, eating and being eaten forever. And all the while, fiddle, flute, and harpsichord, the final presto of the fourth Brandenburg, kept trotting timelessly forward. What a jolly little Rococo death march. Left, right, left, right. But what was the word of command for hexapods? And suddenly they weren't hexapods any longer, they were bipeds. The endless column of insects had turned abruptly into an endless column of soldiers, marching as he had seen the brown shirts marching through Berlin a year before the war, thousands upon thousands of them, their banners fluttering, their uniforms glowing in the infernal brightness like flood-lit excrement. Numberless as insects, and each of them moving with the precision of a machine, the perfect docility of a performing dog. And the faces, the faces! He had seen the close-ups on the German newsreel, and here they were again, preternaturally real and three-dimensional and alive. The monstrous face of Hitler with his mouth open, yelling, and then the faces of assorted listeners, huge idiot faces, blankly receptive, faces of wide-eyed sleepwalkers, faces of young Nordic angels wrapped in the beatific vision, faces of Baroque saints going into ecstasy, faces of lovers on the brink of orgasm, one folk, one realm, one leader, union with the unity of an insect swarm, knowledgeless understanding of nonsense and diabolism, and then the newsreel camera had cut back to the serried ranks, the swastikas, the brass bands, the yelling hypnotist on the rostrum, and here once again, in the glare of his inner light, was the brown insect-like column marching endlessly to the tunes of this Rococo horror music. Onward, Nazi soldiers, onward Marxists, onward Christian soldiers and Muslims, onward every chosen people, every crusader and holy war-maker, onward into misery, into all wickedness, into death, and suddenly Will found himself looking at what the marching column would become when it had reached its destination. Thousands of corpses in the Korean mud, innumerable packets of garbage littering the African desert. And here, for the scene kept changing with bewildering rapidity and suddenness, here were the five fly-blown bodies he had seen only a few months ago, faces upwards and their throats gashed in the courtyard of an Algerian farm. Here, out of a past almost twenty years earlier, was that old woman, dead and stark naked in the rubble of a stucco house in St. John's Wood. And here, without transition, was his own grey and yellow bedroom, with a reflection in the mirror on the wardrobe door of two pale bodies, his and Babs, frantically coupling to the accompaniment of his memories of Molly's funeral and the strains from Radio Stuttgart of the Good Friday music out of Parsifal. The scene changed again, and... Festooned with tin stars and fairy lamps, Aunt Mary's face smiled at him gaily and then was transformed before his eyes into the face of the whining, malignant stranger who had taken her place during those last dreadful weeks before the final transformation into garbage. A radiance of love and goodness, and then a blind had been drawn, a shutter closed, a key turned in the lock, and there they were, she in her cemetery and he in his private prison sentenced to solitary confinement, and one unspecified fine morning, to death. The agony in the bargain basement. The crucifixion among the Christmas tree decorations. Outside or in, with the eyes open or with the eyes closed. There was no escape. No escape, he whispered, 
and the words confirmed the fact, transformed it into a hideous certitude that kept opening out, opening down, into depth below depth of malignant vulgarity, hell beyond hell of utterly pointless suffering. And this suffering, it came to him with the force of a revelation, this suffering was not merely pointless, it was also cumulative, it was also self-perpetuating. Surely enough, frightfully enough, as it had come to Molly and Aunt Mary and all the others, death would come also to him, would come to him, but never to this fear, this sickening disgust, these lacerations of remorse and self-loathing. Immortal in its pointlessness, suffering would go on forever. In all other respects, one was grotesquely, despicably finite. Not in respect to suffering. This dark little inspissated clot that one called I was capable of suffering to infinity, and, in spite of death, the suffering would go on forever. The pains of living and the pains of dying, the routine of successive agonies in the bargain basement or the final crucifixion in a blaze of tin and plaster vulgarity, reverberating, continuously amplified, they would always be there, and the pains were incommunicable, the isolation complete. The awareness that one existed was an awareness that one was always alone, just as much alone in Bab's musky alcove as one had been alone with one's earache or one's broken arm, as one would be alone with one's final cancer, alone when one thought it was all over with the immortality of suffering. He was aware all of a sudden that something was happening to the music. The tempo had changed. Ralatando. It was the end. The end of everything for everyone. The jaunty little death dance had piped the marches on and on to the edge of the cliff, and now here it was, and they were tottering on the brink. Ralatando, Ralatando, the dying fall, the fall into dying. And punctually, inevitably, here were the two anticipated chords, the consummation, the expectant dominant, and then fini, the loud unequivocal tonic. There was a scratching, a sharp click, and then silence. Through the open window he could hear the distant frogs and the shrill monotonous rasp of insect noises, and yet in some mysterious way the silence remained unbroken. Like flies in a block of amber, the sounds were embedded in a transparent soundlessness which they were powerless to destroy or even modify, and to which they remained completely irrelevant. Timelessly, from intensity to intensity, the silence deepened. Silence in ambush, a watching, conspiratorial silence incomparably more sinister than the grisly little Rococo death march which had preceded it. This was the abyss to whose brink the music had piped him, to the brink, and now over the brink, into this everlasting silence. Infinite suffering, he whispered, and you can't speak. You can't even cry out. A chair creaked. Silk rustled. He felt the wind of movement against his face, the nearness of a human presence. Behind his closed lids he was somehow aware that Susila was kneeling there in front of him. An instant later he felt her hands touching his face, the palms against his cheeks, the fingers on his temples. The clock in the kitchen made a little whirring noise, then started to strike the hour. One, two, three, four... Outside in the garden, a gusty breeze whispered intermittently among the leaves. A cock crowed, and a moment later from a long way off came an answering call, and almost simultaneously another and another. Then an answer to the answers, and more answers in return. A counterpoint of challenges challenged, of defiances defied, and now a different kind of voice joined in the chorus, articulate but inhuman. Attention, it called through the crowing and the insect noises. Attention, attention. Attention, attention, Susila repeated, and as she spoke he felt her fingers starting to move over his forehead. Lightly, lightly, from the brows up to the hair, from either temple to the midpoint between the eyes, up and down, back and forth, soothing away the mind's contractions, soothing out the furrows of bewilderment and pain. Attention to this, and she increased the pressure of her palms against his cheekbones, of her fingertips above his ears. To this, she repeated, to now, your face between my two hands. The pressure was relaxed. The fingers started to move again across his forehead. Attention! Through a ragged counterpoint of crowing, the injunction was insistently repeated. Attention! Attention! Atten! 
the inhuman voice broke off in mid-word. Attention to her hands on his face? Or attention to this dreadful glare of the inner light, to this uprush of tin and plastic stars, and, through the barrage of vulgarity, to this packet of garbage that had once been Molly, to the whorehouse looking-glass, to all those countless corpses in the mud, the dust, the rubble, and here were the lizards again, and Gongylus Gongyloides by the million, here were the marching columns, the rapt, devoutly listening faces of Nordic angels. Attention! The minor bird began to call again from the other side of the house. Attention! Will shook his head. Attention to what? To this! And she dug her nails into the skin of his forehead. This! Here and now! And it isn't anything so romantic as suffering and pain. It's just the feel of fingernails. And even if it were much worse, it couldn't possibly be forever. Or to infinity. Nothing is forever. Nothing is to infinity. Except, maybe the Buddha nature. She moved her hands, and the contact now was no longer with nails, but with skin. The fingertips slid down over his brows and very lightly came to rest on his closed eyelids. For the first wincing moment he was mortally afraid. Was she preparing to put out his eyes? He sat there, ready at her first move to throw back his head and jump to his feet, but nothing happened. Little by little his fears died away. The awareness of this intimate, unexpected, potentially dangerous contact remained. An awareness so acute, and because the eyes were supremely vulnerable, so absorbing that he had nothing to spare for the inner light or the horrors and vulgarities revealed by it. Pay attention, she whispered. But it was impossible not to pay attention. However, gently and delicately, her fingers had probed to the very quick of his consciousness. And how intensely alive he now noticed those fingers were. What a strange tingling warmth flowed out of them. It's like an electric current, he marvelled. But luckily, she said, the wire carries no messages. One touches and, in the act of touching, one's touched. Complete communication, but nothing communicated. Just an exchange of life, that's all. Then, after a pause, Do you realise, Will, she went on, that in all these hours we've been sitting here, all these centuries in your case, all these eternities, you haven't looked at me once? Not once. Are you afraid of what you might see? He thought over the question and finally nodded his head. Maybe that's what it was, he said. Afraid of seeing something I'd have to be involved with, something I might have to do something about. So you stuck to Bach and landscapes and the clear light of the void, which you wouldn't let me go on looking at, he complained, because the void won't do you much good unless you can see its light in Gongylus Gongyloides, and in people, she said, which is sometimes considerably more difficult. Difficult? He thought of the marching columns, of the bodies in the mirror, of all those other bodies faced downwards in the mud and shook his head. It's impossible. No, not impossible, she insisted. Sonyata implies karuna. The void is light, but it's also compassion. Greedy contemplatives want to possess themselves of the light without bothering about compassion. Merely good people try to be compassionate and refuse to bother about the light. As usual, it's a question of making the best of both worlds. And now, she added, it's time for you to open your eyes and see what a human being really looks like. The fingertips moved up from his eyelids to his forehead, moved out to the temples, moved down to the cheeks, to the corners of the jaw. An instant later he felt their touch on his own fingers, and she was holding his two hands in hers. Will opened his eyes and, for the first time since he had taken the moksha medicine, found himself looking her squarely in the face. Dear God, he whispered at last. Susila laughed. Is it as bad as the bloodsucker? she asked. But this was not a joking matter. Will shook his head impatiently and went on looking. The eye sockets were mysterious with shadow, and except for a little crescent of illumination on the cheekbone, so was all the right side of her face. The left side glowed with a living, golden radiance, preternaturally bright, but with a brightness that was neither the vulgar and sinister glare of darkness visible, nor yet that blissful incandescence revealed in the far-off dawn of his eternity behind his closed lids, and when he had opened his eyes in the book jewels, the compositions of the mystical cubists, the transfigured landscape, 
What he was seeing now was the paradox of opposites, indissolubly wedded, of light shining out of darkness, of darkness at the very heart of light. It isn't the sun, he said at last, and it isn't Chartres, nor the infernal bargain basement, thank God. It's all of them together, and you're recognisably you and I'm recognisably me, though, needless to say, we're both completely different. You and me, by Rembrandt, but Rembrandt about five thousand times more so. He was silent for a moment, then nodding his head in confirmation of what he had just said. Yes, that's it, he went on. Sun into Chartres, and then stained glass windows into bargain basement. And the bargain basement is also the torture chamber, the concentration camp, the charnel house with Christmas tree decorations. And now the bargain basement goes into reverse, picks up Chartres and a slice of the sun, and backs out into this, into you and me by Rembrandt. Does that make any sense to you? All the sense in the world, she assured him. But Will was too busy looking at her to be able to pay much attention to what she was saying. You're so incredibly beautiful, he said at last. But it wouldn't matter if you were incredibly ugly. You'd still be a Rembrandt but five thousand times more so. Beautiful. Beautiful, he repeated. And yet I don't want to sleep with you. No, that isn't true. I would like to sleep with you very much indeed. But it won't make any difference if I never do. I shall go on loving you, loving you in the way one's supposed to love people if one's a Christian. Love, he repeated. Love! It's another of those dirty words. In love. Make love. Those are all right. But plain love! That's an obscenity I couldn't pronounce. But now, now, he smiled and shook his head. Believe it or not, now I can understand what it means when they say, God is love. What manifest nonsense! And yet it happens to be true. Meanwhile, there's this extraordinary face of yours. He leaned forward to look into it more closely, as though one were looking into a crystal ball, he added incredulously. Something new all the time. You can't imagine. But she could imagine. Don't forget, she said. I've been there myself. Did you look at people's faces? She nodded. At my own in the glass. And, of course, at Dugald's. Goodness, that last time we took the Moksha medicine together. He started by looking like a hero out of some impossible mythology, of Indians in Iceland, of Vikings in Tibet. And then, without warning, he was Maitreya Buddha. Obviously, self-evidently, Maitreya Buddha. Such a radiance! I can still see... She broke off, and suddenly Will found himself looking at incarnate bereavement with seven swords in her heart. Reading the signs of pain in the dark eyes, about the corners of the full-lipped mouth, he knew that the wound had been very nearly mortal, and, with a pang in his own heart, that it was still open, still bleeding. He pressed her hands. There was nothing, of course, that one could say, no words, no consolations of philosophy, only this shared mystery of touch, only this communication from skin to skin of a flowing infinity. One slips back so easily, she said at last, much too easily, and much too often. She drew a deep breath and squared her shoulders. Before his eyes, the face, the whole body underwent another change, and there was strength enough, he could see, in that small frame to make head against any suffering, a will that would be more than a match for all the swords that fate might stab her with. Almost menacing in her determined serenity, a dark Circean goddess had taken the place of the Mata Dolorosa. Memories of that quiet voice talking so irresistibly about the swans and the cathedral, about the clouds and the smooth water came rushing up, and as he remembered, the face before him seemed to glow with a consciousness of triumph. Power, intrinsic power, he saw the expression of it, he sensed its formidable presence and shrank away from it. Who are you? he whispered. She looked at him for a moment without speaking, then, gaily smiling, don't be so scared, she said. I'm not the female mantis. He smiled back at her, smiled back at a laughing girl with a weakness for kisses and the frankness to invite them. Thank the Lord, he said, and the love which had shrunk away in fear came flowing back in a tide of happiness. Thank him for what? For having given you the grace of sensuality. She smiled again. So that cat's out of the bag. All that power, he said, all that admirable, terrible will. You might have been Lucifer, but fortunately, providentially, 
He disengaged his right hand and with the tip of its stretched forefinger touched her lips. The blessed gift of sensuality. It's been your salvation. Half your salvation, he qualified, remembering the gruesomely loveless frenzies in the pink alcove. One of your salvations. Because, of course, there's this other thing, this knowing who in fact you are. He was silent for a moment. Mary with swords in her heart, he went on, and Circe, and Ninon de Longlos, and now, who? Somebody like Juliana of Norwich, or Catherine of Genoa. Are you really all these people? Plus an idiot, she assured him, plus a rather worried and not very efficient mother, plus a bit of the little prig and daydreamer I was as a child, plus potentially the old dying woman who looked out at me from the mirror the last time we took the Moksha medicine together. And then Dougal looked and saw what he would be like in another forty years. Less than a month later, she added, he was dead. One slips back too easily. One slips back too often. Half in mysterious darkness, half mysteriously glowing with golden light, her face had turned once again into a mask of suffering. Within their shadowy orbits, the eyes he could see were closed. She had retreated into another time and was alone somewhere else, with the swords and her open wound. Outside, the cocks were crowing again, and a second minor bird had begun to call half a tone higher than the first for compassion. Karuna! Attention! Attention! Karuna! Will raised his hand once more and touched her lips. Do you hear what they're saying? It was a long time before she answered. Then, raising her hand, she took hold of his extended finger and pressed it hard against her lower lip. Thank you she said, and opened her eyes again. Why thank me? You taught me what to do. And now it's you who have to teach your teacher. Like a pair of rival gurus, each touting his own brand of spirituality. Karuna, attention, shouted the minor birds. Then, as they drowned out one another's wisdom in overlapping competition, run attention, Karun, attention. Proclaiming that he was the never-impotent owner of all females, the invincible challenger of every spurious pretender to maleness, a cockerel in the next garden, shrilly announced his divinity. A smile broke through the mask of suffering. From her private world of swords and memory, Susila had returned to the present. cock a doodle doo she said. How I love him. Just like Tom Krishna when he goes around asking people to feel his muscles. And those preposterous minor birds, so faithfully repeating the good advice they can't understand. They're just as adorable as my little bantam. And what about the other kind of biped? he asked. The less adorable variety. For all answer, she leaned forward, caught him by the forelock and, pulling his head down, kissed him on the tip of his nose. And now it's time you moved your legs, she said. Climbing to her feet, she held out her hand to him. He took it and she pulled him up from his chair. Negative crowing and parroted anti-wisdom, she said. That's what some of the other kind of bipeds go for. What's to guarantee that I shan't return to my vomit? He asked. You probably will, she cheerfully assured him, but you'll also probably come back again to this. There was a spurt of movement at their feet. Will laughed. There goes my poor little scrabbling incarnation of evil. She took his arm, and together they walked over to the open window. Announcing the near approach of dawn, a little wind fitfully rattled the palm fronds. Below them, rooted invisibly in the moist, acrid-smelling earth, was a hibiscus bush, a wild profusion of bright, glossy leaves and vermilion trumpets, evoked from the double darkness of night and overarching trees by a shaft of lamplight from within the room. It isn't possible, he said incredulously. He was back again with God the 14th of July. It isn't possible, she agreed, but like everything else in the universe, it happens to be a fact. And now that you've finally recognized my existence, I'll give you leave to look to your heart's content. He stood there motionless, gazing, gazing through a timeless succession of mounting intensities and ever profounder significances. Tears filled his eyes and overflowed at last onto his cheeks. He pulled out his handkerchief and wiped them away. I can't help it, he apologized. He couldn't help it because there was no other way in which he could express his thankfulness. Thankfulness for the privilege of being alive and a witness to this miracle, of being indeed more than a witness, a partner in it, an aspect of it. Thankfulness for these gifts of luminous bliss and knowledgeless understanding, 
thankfulness for being at once this union with the divine unity and yet this finite creature among other finite creatures. Why should one cry when one's grateful, he said as he put his handkerchief away. Goodness knows, but one does. A memory bubble popped up from the sludge of past reading. Gratitude is heaven itself, he quoted. Pure gibberish, but now I see that Blake was just recording a simple fact. It is heaven itself. And all the more heavenly, she said, for being heaven on earth and not heaven in heaven. Startlingly, through the crowing and the croaking, through the insect noises and the duet of the rival gurus, came the sound of distant musketry. What on earth is that? she wondered. Just the boys playing with fireworks, he answered gaily. Susila shook her head. We don't encourage those kinds of fireworks. We don't even possess them. From the highway beyond the walls of the compound, a roar of heavy vehicles climbing in low gear swelled up louder and louder. Over the noise, a voice at once stentorian and squeaky bellowed incomprehensibly through a loudspeaker. In their setting of velvet shadow, the leaves were like thin shavings of jade and emerald, and from the heart of their gem-bright chaos, fantastically sculptured rubies flared out into five-pointed stars. Gratitude! Gratitude! His eyes filled again with tears. Snatches of the shrill bellowing resolved themselves into recognisable words. Against his will he found himself listening. People of Pala, he heard. Then the voice blasted into amplified inarticulateness. Squeak, roar, squeak, and then, Your Raja speaking. Remain calm. Welcome your friends from across the strait, recognition dawned. It's Morrigan. And he's with Deeper's soldiers. Progress, the uncertain, excited voice was saying. Modern life! And then, moving on from Sears, Roebuck to the Rani and Kut Humi. Truth, it squeaked. Values! Genuine spirituality! Oil! Look, said Susila. Look, they're turning into the compound. Visible in a gap between two clumps of bamboos, the beams of a procession of headlamps shone for a moment on the left cheek of the great stone Buddha by the lotus pool, and passed by, hinted again at the blessed possibility of liberation, and again passed by. The throne of my father, bawled the gigantically amplified squeak, joined to the throne of my mother's ancestors. Two sister nations marching forward, hand in hand, into the future, to be known henceforth as the United Kingdom of Rendang and Pala. The United Kingdom's first prime minister, that great political and spiritual leader, Colonel Deeper. The procession of headlamps disappeared behind a long range of buildings, and the shrill bellowing died down into incoherence. Then the lights re-emerged, and once again the voice became articulate. Reactionaries, it was furiously yelling, traitors to the principles of the permanent revolution, in a tone of horror. They're stopping at Dr. Robert's bungalow, Susila whispered. The voice had said its last word. The headlamps and the roaring motors had been turned off. In the dark, expectant silence, the frogs and the insects kept up their mindless soliloquies. The minor birds reiterated their good advice. Attention, Karuna! Will looked down at his burning bush and saw the suchness of the world and his own being blazing away with a clear light that was also, how obviously now, compassion. The clear light that, like everyone else, he had always chosen to be blind to the compassion to which he had always preferred his tortures, endured or inflicted in a bargain basement, his squalid solitudes with the living Babs or the dying Molly in the foreground, with Joe Alderhyde in the middle distance, and in the remoter background the great world of impersonal forces and proliferating numbers, of collective paranoias and organised diabolism. And always, everywhere, there would be the yelling or quietly authoritative hypnotists, and in the train of the ruling suggestion givers always and everywhere the tribes of buffoons and hucksters, the professional liars, the purveyors of entertaining irrelevances, conditioned from the cradle, unceasingly distracted, mesmerised systematically, their uniformed victims would go on obediently marching and counter-marching, go on, always and everywhere, killing and dying with a perfect docility of trained poodles. 
and yet in spite of the entirely justified refusal to take yes for an answer, the fact remained and would remain always, remain everywhere, the fact that there was this capacity even in a paranoiac for intelligence, even in a devil worshipper for love, the fact that the ground of all being could be totally manifest in a flowering shrub, a human face, the fact that there was a light and that this light was also compassion. There was the sound of a single shot, then a burst of shots from an automatic rifle. Susila covered her face with her hands. She was trembling uncontrollably. He put an arm round her shoulders and held her close. The work of a hundred years, destroyed in a single night. And yet the fact remained. The fact of the ending of sorrow, as well as the fact of sorrow. The starters screeched. Engine after engine roared into action. The headlamps were turned on, and after a minute of noisy manoeuvring, the cars started to move slowly back along the road by which they had come. The loudspeaker brayed out the opening bars of a martial and at the same time lascivious hymn tune, which we'll recognise as the national anthem of Rendang. Then the Wurlitzer was switched off, and here once again was Murugan. This is your Raja speaking, the excited voice proclaimed. After which, da capo. There was a repetition of the speech about progress, values, oil, true spirituality. Abruptly, as before, the procession disappeared from sight and hearing. A minute later it was in view again, with its wobbly counter-tenor bellowing the praises of the newly united kingdom's first prime minister. The procession crawled on, and now, from the right this time, the headlamps of the first armoured car lit up the serenely smiling face of enlightenment. For an instant only, and then the beam moved on, and here was the Tathagata for the second time, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the last of the cars passed by. Disregarded in the darkness, the fact of enlightenment remained. The roaring of the engines diminished, the squeaking rhetoric lapsed into an inarticulate murmur, and as the intruding voices died away, out came the frogs again, out came the uninterruptible insects, out came the minor birds. Karuna, Karuna, and a semitone lower, attention. This concludes Ireland by Aldous Huxley. Narrated by Simon Vance. Copyright 1962 by Aldous Huxley. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with the Aldous and Laura Huxley Literary Trust, care of Georges Borchardt, Incorporated, and was produced in the year 2016 by Tantor Media, Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers.